P-O-S-T! P-O-S-T, Post, the serials you like the most, brings you the Roy Rogers Show, starring the king of the cowboys himself, Roy Rogers. It's roundup time on the double R bar. So saddle your horse, cause we're gonna ride far. The double R bar ranch transcribes stories and songs of the real West with the Whippoorwills. The wisest trail scout of them all, Jonah Wilde, played by Forrest Lewis. The Queen of the West, Dale Evans. And in person, the King of the Cowboys, Roy Rogers. Well, howdy, folks. This is Roy Rogers. Say, what makes breakfast the best meal of the day? You buckaroos can answer that one. It's post-cereals. You know you can count on anything bearing the brand name Post. So have Mom put Post cereals on the shelf where they'll be handy all the time. Well, sir, the Paradise Valley ranchers have been bothered by rustlers again the past few weeks, and everybody is watching mighty close to see some sign that will lead to the rustler's trail. Howdy, Dick. Well, howdy, Sheriff. Here you ain't had much luck catching the rustling gang yet. Not much, but we'll get them sooner or later. Hey, Dick, I'm thinking about buying a new saddle. How much will it cost me? Well, I'll show you what we got, Sheriff. Uh, have them at three or four prices, depending on how good a saddle you want. Uh, who's... Why, good morning, Mr. Platt. Morning, Lappin. Good to see you, Sheriff. How's things out your way, Sheriff? Uh, I'm worried about rustlers, same as anybody else. What's new on them? Well, we're ready for them this time if they strike again. Uh, you can wait on him first, Dick. I'll be having a look at the saddles. Uh-huh. Lappin, you got any 30-30 rifle cartridges? Oh, lots of them. You going hunting? Hmm. Might call it that. I'd be careful about game, Mr. Platt. You shoot anything there's a closed season on. And there's you... no closed season on two-legged game in this country. Two-legged? Game that walks on You two... mean Bob Noble, don't you, Shell? Now, look here. That feud between you and Noble is liable to lead to killing. I want to stop. You understand? Where's my box of shells, Lappin? All right, here, Mr. Platt. I'll get hold of Bob and bring you two together. We'll work out your difficulties if we have I to. wouldn't be seen on the same side of the street with that hombre, Sheriff. Not even if he was dead. Put these on my bill, Lappin. Sheriff! Rustlers are at it again! Uh, uh, what's that? Rustlers. Here, rustlers. They're taking my cat off. If we can put a posse on our trail, we can grab them this time. A posse standing by, ready to go. Now, you put them on the trail, then. I saw Roy Rogers heading for the cafe as I went by. I'll see if he can help us. This looks like the chance we've been waiting for. You bet I'll ride with you, Tom. That goes for me, too. Oh, convolutions. Another ten minutes and I could have finished a chapter of the book I'm writing. I found the hoof prints leading toward sick points. All right. We'll let the sheriff and his posse follow him. We'll take the shortcut over the mountain. Maybe we'll be able to put them in a pocket. Hey, look down there, across the valley. It's a herd of cattle, all right. Are they yours, Tom? I can't see from this distance. They may be. Well, don't forget now, Roy. The pen is mightier than the sword. You can throw your pen at them, Jonah. I'm going to use a gun. Oh, fudge. Tom, we'll ride down on them from this side. You go back and tell the posse to close in fast. You bet, Roy. Dale, Jonah, make all the noise you can when we're coming up to the herd. We'll have a better chance of taking the rustlers if we stampede the cattle. All right, go after Dale and Jonah spur their horses. Trigger leaps out in front toward the escaping rustlers. In seconds, he is pulled abreast of one. Roy leaps at the man, pulling him from his horse. The two men fall to the ground heavily. They struggle. Roy gets the upper hand, begins to subdue the outlaw. 
At the same time, Jonah rides alongside the other rustler, bulldogs him. They hit the ground together. Dale is there, dismounting. She puts a gun on the rustler. I'll bring this hombre over there. And we'll wait for the posse. It'll be coming along soon. Well, we got two of them anyway, Sheriff. That makes a good start. All right. Head for town. You're on the way to the lockup. Yeah, sure. The way I twisted my hand when I took that feller off his horse, I bet you I won't be able to do no writing for a week. Another week of grace for the world. Pooh. Now, you two quit kidding, Jonah. We wouldn't have had both of these rustlers if it hadn't been for him. Oh, he knows we were just kidding, don't you, Jonah? My apologies, General's boy. Uh, Pooh. What's the matter? Don't you feel well, Jonah? Yes, I feel fine. I say just fine. Then where's that well-known temper of yours? Don't let him get your goat, Jonah. Save your breath. As soon as we get these armors to jail, we'll pick up Bullet and have him trail the rest of the gang. Uh-huh. We'll have to do it alone, too. The posse's busy rounding up the cattle we stampeded. Listen, what was that? Oh, maybe we won't have to go for Bullet after all. Sheriff, can you get these armors back to town alone? Wait, Roy. The sound came from the direction of Bob Noble's ranch. Yeah, it did sound like it. I met Sheldon Platt in the hardware store early this morning, buying 30-30 ammunition. He said he was going after two-legged game. The feud, his family and Bob Noble's. Convolutions. You attend to these two, Sheriff. Dale and Joan and I will see where that shot came from. We'll see you later. Oh, oh. Well, everything looks calm enough here. We'll walk up to the house and find out. I mean, I got to figure out a title. Boy, I'd a whole lot rather fight a gang of rustlers than have a feud break out between two of our friends. Gee, now, people I have known, and what about them? What are you talking about, Jonah? Did you... Huh? Oh, uh, the title for my book. I got almost a whole chapter wrote, Roy, and I ain't selected the title yet. Well, you may not live to select the title if you don't keep your mind on your business. M. C. the friends and enemies of Jonah Wilde during the first 61 years of his career. Yeah, yeah, a lot of good you're talking, did, Roy. Yeah, I know. Well, it'd be all right for a set of books. It's too long for one, though. She's like... Come on here, yeah. Jonah. Wake up. Uh-huh. Oh. oh, say, Roy and Dale, too. There's something I've been wanting to ask you about. A delicate matter. Uh, this is a fine time to think about it. Just how delicate, Jonah? Well, you see, Dale... Howdy. Oh, interruptions. Always interruptions. This is an unexpected pleasure. Hi, Hello, Bob. Mr. Noble. Yeah, come in, won't you? Well, thanks. We can't stay. We're out after the gang that tried to rustle Tom Hill's cattle. And we heard a shot fired off in this direction. Ah, uh, yes. I heard it too, Roy. You don't know what it was? No, I haven't given it much thought. I just naturally supposed my boy, young Bob, had spotted a coyote. He's riding the North Range somewhere. Mm, that's a relief. See now, stories nobody would listen to. That's a good time. Oh, we were no, a little no. worried about you. Otherwise, we wouldn't have bothered coming to your house. About me? Why? On account of the feud between you and Shell Platt. <laughs> well, well, it's nice of you to think about me, Roy, but I don't reckon our feud would ever reach a shooting stage. Shell might fence off a water hole. It could or... reach the shooting stage, though, Bob. Oh, no, no. The no. sheriff ran into Platt this morning buying 30-30 ammunition. Said he was after two-legged game. You're just fooling, aren't you, Roy? No, he isn't. I wish I was. Well, I... Uh, well, you folks, excuse me. I, I'll get my horse. I don't believe Platt would kill anybody, but all the same, I'd like to check and see that young Bob's all right. Well, we'll go with you. If anything has happened to your boy, you may need help. Oh, I'm just wasting your folks' time. I know I am. Shell Platt isn't mean enough to take a spite out on a man's family. Well, it won't hurt to make sure. And then we'd all feel better. Some poor cats and friends I have no now. Well, that ain't bad. <laughs> Easy trigger. Listen, he sees something. Poor cats and friends I have no. Mm, that's pretty good. Whoa, whoa. Steady, boy. <laughs> hey, look there. The others look in the direction Roy indicates. At first, they see nothing but the great silent rocks that are common to the country. The air is still. I don't see anything, Roy. Wait. It's gone now. They look again. Still nothing. Now, a slight movement behind the rocks. 
Someone is hiding there. Roy's hand goes to his gun. Come out from there. Make it snappy. Again, silence. The hidden person is out of sight again. Come on or we'll ride after you. A slight movement. A man, a very young man, appears. His body sways. He takes a step out into the open, staggering. It's young Bob. He's hurt. Son! Let's get over there to him. What is it? What's the matter, son? Nothing's the matter. Let me alone. He's been wounded. I'm all right. Well, you don't look all right to me. Why, he can hardly stand. Oh, no, I never will get a title with all this to do going on. I don't need you. Well, what are you doing here? I can take care of my own affairs. He's passed out. The wound, Roy. Hey, you folks look after Bob. I got something else to do. Stay right where you are. Now, you better take it easy, Mr. I'll Noble. I'll take it easy after I see Shell Platt laying dead. None of that now, Noble. I'll hunt Platt down just like any other coyote. Come back here. Now, use your hand. Let me loose, Roy. Here, here, now. Calm down. The first thing you know, you spend five or ten years behind bars making license plates for automobiles. I'm leaving now. Hey, cut it out. I'm trying to help you, Bob. No, no. I'm going to kill the man who shot my son. Don't let him just keep hitting you, Roy. Bob, I hate to do this. And I know you'll be sorry later. Oh, well, he had it coming. Oh, I don't blame him much. When his son has been shot. All right. Let's see what we can do for the boy. Say, do you like to raid the kitchen much as folks around Double R Bar Ranch do? Well, you know what the cook out there discovered? Folks love to nibble on post-sugar crisp right out of the package. Just like candy. That's right, it's that good. And, of course, post-sugar crisp was just made to brighten up breakfast. Mmm, just poured into a big bowl with milk or cream. You don't need sugar. That delicious candy-coated puffed wheat is just sweet enough. You'll love it served the same way between meals, too, as a special snack or just before bedtime. Yes, post-sugar crisp is fun to eat all day long. There's lots of wholesome goodness in post-sugar crisp, too. It gives you wheat for nourishment... The sugar and honey coating for quick energy. So, how about it? Have you tried Post Sugar Crisp yet? Look for it at your grocer's in the giant or regular size red, white, and blue package with the three little bears on the front. Young Bob Noble lies on the ground while Roy, with Dale's and Jonah's assistance, attends his wound. A boy's father gets unsteadily to his feet and tries to piece together all that has happened. How Roy, Dale, and Jonah were trailing rustlers and came to the ranch on hearing a gunshot. How they found young Bob wounded, probably by Shell Platt. Noble remembers now. Roy knocked him out when he wanted to kill Shell. His anger mounts. His determination to kill Shell is renewed. But the others are paying no attention to him. I'm all right, I tell you. I don't want to go to any doctor. Well, what you want makes no difference. We're going to take you to the doctor. My life among idiots and wise men. Yes. Uh, no, I won't do it. Mr. Noble. Hey. What? We're going to take your boy into the doctor now. We want you to come along. All right. Uh, look here, Bob. I'm mighty sorry I had to hit you. Roy had to do it, Mr. Noble. If he'd let you go, you'd have ridden out of here and tried to kill Shell Platt. Yeah, I know. I, I would have killed him. But you can't hold me back forever, Rogers. Well, this is your boy who's hurt, Bob. It seems to me you'd want to help us with him. Yeah. All right. Sure. That's the stuff. You'll feel a lot better when you have time to think things out. Lift his shoulders here. We'll get him up on the horse. Noble does as Roy asks, and on the ride to Mineral City seems resigned, though sullen. At the doctor's office, he waits until the doctor says his son is out of danger, then disappears. Roy, Deal, and Jonah stay on, however, because the doctor is called away, and young Bob is in no condition to be left alone. I'm getting out of here. Not yet, I'm afraid. The doc said you were to rest here for a couple of hours. Curious, folks, and what they've done. Yeah, no, no kicking that. This is no good. This is no good. Oh, you don't want to leave without your dad, Bob. 
He'll be back soon. He's over the sheriff's office making a report on the shooting. What's he interfering in my affairs for? I can attend to my own business. I don't need help. Oh, Dad Raddit, stop this noise, will you? How can I think of a title for my book with your big bazoon going all the time? Well, Jonah, you didn't exactly whisper. Oh. People don't understand an artist at work, do they, Jonah? No, sir, Roy, they don't. Sixty-one years of trying to deal with human beings. A little long, but it's good thinking. What's he jabbering about? Uh, who knows? Well, my book. I say my book. I'm writing a book. Because nobody ever listens to me when they try to say something. It's a book Look, all about... I'm not fooling. Uh, i got to get out of here. Yeah, you see there? Proves my point right there. Dad, you stay where you are, Bob. Dad has no right to interfere in my affairs. Roy. Roy, I need help. What's the matter, Sheriff? Now, Bob Noble has a crowd around him. He's organizing a gang of his friends to ride out and get Shell Platt. Oh, I knew something like that would happen, Roy. Shell Platt? Yes, for wounding you. But why go after him? He's no good, but he's never been... Look a... here, fella. Shell Platt's the man who shot you, isn't he? I'm not saying who did it. That's my business, and mine alone. Now, Roy, we'd better hurry. We don't want any angry mobs in this country. Go ahead, Roy. I'll stay with Bob. All right. Only keep him here. Do whatever you have to, but keep him here until we can get back. <laughs> I didn't kill anybody. There's no reason. You're coming along all the same, Mr. Platt. I won't spend one minute in jail. I haven't done anything that rates trouble with the law. Shell, we're taking you to jail to save your life. You only think you're taking me. He's going to draw, Roy. Hold it, Platt. Jonah, take his gun, will you? Oh, well, sure thing. By doggies, I didn't see your hand move, Roy, but you sure grabbed a gun from Summers. Give me that thing, you poor cat. Don't touch my gun. Boy, you, are you pigeon toe chase cat. You now get it, Brad. You get it, old soldier, will you? You jughead. Uh huh. Yeah. I bet you he'll have more respect for his country now. Say, my uh. old sidekick is really all right. Jonah, I'm proud of you. Uh, uh, tin star. I've been a trying my best to hold my temper, but I just naturally get my hackles up when somebody hits an old soldier, especially if it's me. Come on, get up, Platt. We came here to save your life. We're wasting our time unless we move fast. <laughs> This shark cup will save us a lot of time. We'll need every minute. It'd be rough if we met Noble and his mob on the way to Platt's Ranch. People nobody wants to hear about. Now that's... Oh, no. I hope we do meet them. I'll take Noble on any day of the week. If we figured right, Sheriff, they'll be riding the main trail, not cutting through the mountains. <laughs> What's the matter, boy? There are triggers like me today, Roy. Nervouser than a small boy in a woodshed. Well, maybe he senses something we don't. Better stop, I guess. Hey, somebody's coming up this trail. From beyond the next bend of the mountain trail comes the sound of approaching horsemen, a large group. Roy, Jonah, the sheriff, and their prisoner wait tensely to see if what they dread is true. The riders are coming nearer at a steady clip. Their voices can be heard distinctly. The hoofbeats of their horses are... Suddenly, the leader appears around the bend, then the first of his followers... <laughs> And the gang's with him. Ride for it. Plant, take the lead. We'll hold him off. The only place you'll be safe is in the cell. Ride for all your work if you want to live. Keep throwing left. Hold him off and let Plant have a chance to get to a cell. The law's got to decide whether he's guilty or not and protect him until time for his trial. All right, Platt. You'll be safe in here for the time being. Yeah, that dreaded excitement knocked all them titles right out of my head. Noble and his men are outside, Sheriff. We better not try anything. I've got an arsenal in here. Well, give me a gun. I'll shoot it out with Noble any day in the week. You'll stay right where you are, Platt. These men are neighbors, even if they are overly excited. Overly excited, he says. Sheriff, I'll try to make it across the street to the dock's office. Don't do it, Roy. Those men outside are just looking for an excuse to use guns. We've got to have a statement from young Noble to know for sure that Shell tried to kill him. Roy, you're risking your life. Well, I'll have to chance it. Things can't go on this way. 
Outside, Roy faces the sullen men. He starts across the street. His eyes look directly into the eyes of the men standing in his path. He walks toward them. His steps firm, unwavering. The men step aside. No word is spoken. A low murmur from the sidelines now and then, but no word said aloud. Roy reaches the sidewalk. His back is toward the crowd now, but he does not turn. He goes straight ahead. He reaches the doctor's office, opens the door, and steps inside. Oh, Roy, what do you mean by taking a chance like that? Where's young Bob? The inner office. He gave me trouble for quite a while, but he's calmed down now. Yeah, but only for now. There's trouble, Bob. I want a straight answer. Was it Shell Platt who shot you? I told you before I can fight my own battles. I can't take time to argue. I... Wait, look out this window, Bob. See those men? Your dad's leading them. They're here to wreck the jail and get Shell Platt. What am I supposed to do, cry? Shell's no friend of ours. They're going to take the law into their own hands unless we stop them. So what? Ah, uh, he's no good, Roy. He's just no good. Your dad's leading them. If Platt's killed, the law will hold your dad for murder. I want the truth, Bob. Is Platt the man who shot you? Come on, answer me, Bob. I'm in a spot, Roy. You bet you're in a spot. Well, not like that. What I mean is, if I talk, I'm in trouble. Is the trouble bad enough so you'd let your dad be found guilty of murder? No. No, I, I guess not. Well, then talk. Platt didn't shoot me. That's what I thought. Here, let's open this window. Now, you're going to tell your dad what you just told me. I, I, I... Go on. Noble! Noble! Look up here! Your boy wants to tell you something. Hey, hold it! Hold it a minute! Wait a minute! All right. Let's hear what Bob wants. Go on, Bob. Platt didn't shoot me! It wasn't Platt at all! Who did I, I can't tell you when you're out there, Dad! Come in here, Noble. Come in here and he'll tell you in private. Partner, nobody's going to have to ride herd on you to eat breakfast. No siree. Once you try new, improved post-toasties, the heap good cornflakes, you'll get up and go for them, because you're heading for the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Mmm, flakes of sweet kernel flavor, crackling fresh. They won't mush up in milk. Post-toasties, heap good cornflakes... The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heap good corn flakes. Post toasties, heap good corn flakes. Say, big Indians, little Indians, everybody's wild about those fresh tasting post toasties. And with sugar and cream, they're heap good nourishment, too. Tomorrow, head straight as an arrow for your favorite grocers and ask for new, improved post toasties. Post toasties, heap good corn flakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heap good corn flakes. Post toasties, heap good corn flakes. All right, Bob. Let's hear it, boy. He seems to be afraid, Roy. Oh. We're waiting, Bob. Let me see now. Jonah Wilde's life among people. Hmm? Very. In fact, he's very, very We're sad. waiting, son. This is going to be tough on you, Dad. Might be even tougher on the man who pulled the trigger. It wasn't Platt. It wasn't anybody you know. Dad, I... Well, I guess I'm a pretty bad son. I'm a member of the rustling gang. Go on. I double-crossed them, and they've got it in for me. Oh, boy, this is terrible. You see, a couple of weeks ago, I needed some extra money. I took some that belonged to the gang. They found out about it and, well, I, I guess I signed my own death warrant. I don't believe you, Bob. You wouldn't sign up with rustlers. I did, though. Roy, I, I guess I'd like to go to jail. I'll have the sheriff put you in a separate cell from the two rustlers we caught this morning. Yeah, I wouldn't live long in with them. Well, so long, Dad. Bob. Bob, before we go over, let's talk a minute. You can't escape paying for what wrong you've done, but you can show that you're sorry and want to be on the right side of the law again. Do you want to tell us where the rustling gang has its headquarters? I don't know, Roy. Let me think a minute. 
civilized and uncivilized acquaintances. Yes. No, no, Zing. Well, Bob, I'll... The headquarters is at halfway point, the cave there. If you got two of them, besides me, there are eight men left. Thanks, Bob. This will probably help you get a lighter sentence when your case comes up in court. Roy, if the men outside believe you, maybe you could put their energy to good use. Help take the rustling gang, you mean? That's just what I aim to do, Dale. Jonah, aren't you going with Roy and the men? Yes, I Huh? Oh, 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 yeah. Yes, What's I What's the matter am. with you, pacing up and down and giggling and smirking that way? Oh, well, Dale, I, I got something on my mind. I say, real delicate. Oh, yes, I think you mentioned something about that. Yes, mm-hmm. Yes, I'd been in training for it all day. <clears throat> I kept my temper when the sheriff was a-goading me. Did you notice that? I noticed. Uh-huh. But you said you wanted help with this, uh, delicate matter. Yes, mm. Well, I can't very well help unless I know what to do. No, you can't. Well, it, uh, it, <laughs> oh, mm. uh, well, <clears throat> well uh, saying what I have to is, it's kind of, <clears throat> it's kind of embarrassing, Dale. <laughs> like as if I was walking around with a, with a hole in my sock. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, I, uh, got almost a chapter of my book done. Yes. Yeah, uh, wrote by hand, though. And, uh, if, <laughs> yeah, well, it ought to be wrote by typewriter. Well, sure. Sure. Well, yes, but the only typewriter in town is owned by the... <laughs> he's owned by the school marm. <laughs> well? Uh, well, Dale, uh, would you ask the school marm if she'd please to type my book? Me? Well, you ask her yourself. Yo, oh, sure. <laughs> why, oh. Jonah, why? <laughs> I just can't help it, you know. <laughs> oh, sure. Every time that lady looks at me out from under them long lashes, I just feel all the breath go out of me, and I, I say, well, I sort of will clean away to nothing. Well, Jonah. Hey, oh, mm. oh, get on out here if you're riding with us. Oh, yes, yes sir, Roy. I'm a coming. I say, I'm a coming. Oh. Hey. What's the matter with you? You look like... Jonah, you haven't got your weather eye out for some lady friend, have you? No, you don't. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. My old sidekick, 61 years a soldier, a private all the way, and he's about to lose the war. Looking for a cowboy and a handsome one, of course, with a two-seated saddle and a one-gated horse. And I'm yearning for a blue sky with a great big yellow moon and a slow-riding cowboy who will croon me up to a song of the sagebrush and cattle who will sing me to sleep in a replete seated saddle. Until I find that cowboy, I'll search out every source for a two-seated saddle with a one-gated horse. That's all for now, folks. This is Roy Rogers saying to all of you, from all of us, goodbye, good luck, and may the good Lord take a liking to you. See you next week. 
Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you Keep smiling until then The Roy Rogers Show is brought to you by Post Serials Each week at this same time with the Whippoorwills, Forrest Lewis, Dale Evans, and the king of the cowboys himself, Roy Rogers. An Art Rush production transcribed, directed by Tom Hargis, script by Ray Wilson, music by Milton Charles. Featured in today's cast were Frank Hemingway, Herb Butterfield, Ralph Moody, Sam Edwards, and Bob Griffin. This is Art Ballinger speaking for P.O.S.T. Post Serials. Happy trails to until we meet again, happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. James Stewart as the Six Shooter. The saddle is angular and long legged. His skin is sun dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle unmarked. People call them both the six shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as the six shooter. A transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman who wandered to the Western territories, leaving behind the trail of still remembered legends. I'd known the Harcourt brothers a good many years. First time I passed through Harness Creek, they were just youngsters. Of course, that was before their pa died. But Cash Harcourt, he, he was all of 26 now, and a great big star on his vest, and a Colt 45 stuck in his belt. It seems funny to think of him as a town sheriff. Well, not that he didn't look the part, but I, I couldn't help remembering him when his legs weren't long enough to reach the stirrups of the pony. Lex Harcourt, he wasn't quite so grown up. He must be about 20 or so. Now, he sure tried to appear older, though. His great big mustache sprawling across his upper lip and a kind of a swagger when he walked. In spite of all his trying to be old and everything, he was still Cash Harcourt's kid brother, and everybody knew it. Well, anyway, the reason I came into Harness Creek was I was going to sign up for the Silver Spur cattle drive down in New Mexico. Only trouble was I hit town a week or so early. Silver Spur outfit is still out in the rain, so... While I was waiting, I stopped off with the Harcourt boys and their aunt, Mrs. Petrie. She kept house for them. There now. Oh, more fritters, Fred? Oh, no, no, no. Thanks, Miss Petrie. I've had my share. You cash? I'm full up too, Aunt Bess. No need to ask you, Lex. Ah, there you are. That's the last of them. Ah, well. <laughs> Now, Aunt Bez, you know the only reason I take seconds is so you won't have to throw the food away. Uh -huh. <laughs> seconds? <laughs> Seems to me that's about his fourth helping the fritters, ain't it, Brett? Yeah, well, I don't know, Cash. I'm not for certain. I sort of lost count ever about the, after the third time he stuck that plate out. <laughs> <laughs> Big growing boy like him. I guess he's bound to stow away large rub. Mm, well, now, I wouldn't josh about my growing so much if I was you, Cash. Just give me another inch or so, and I'll be ready to trim you down to size. No, 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 hush, both of you. Brittany will think you two are serious. Oh, don't worry about that, Miss Petrie. They've been talking about fighting each other for the last ten years, but whenever there's a real scrap, somehow the Harcourt brothers usually manage to wind up on the same side. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't count on that, Brit. You know, Lex has been getting pretty feisty late here. I may have to take him down a peg or two. Yeah? <laughs> Well, now, let me tell you that there's just one thing that's kept me from cleaning your plow long before this. Oh? The minute I was to start something, like as not, you'd throw me in jail. No, I guess I'd have to, wouldn't I? For your own safety? Mm -hmm. 
Why, if I was ever to slug you back, you just might not be around afterwards. Tell about it. Well, now, if that's... you me... just stop this foolishness. <laughs> Get out of the kitchen, all three of okay, you. Okay, The idea of brothers talking like that. Well, go along now. Go on, or I'll show you who's the real boss of this family. <laughs> you know, Britt, I wouldn't be surprised if you could. I don't doubt it for a minute, Kat. Not for a minute. And you too, Lex. There ain't another mouthful of food left to eat. All right, Aunt Bish. All right. I'd be real pleased to help you with those dishes, Miss Petrie. Oh, you think I want some man breaking up my fancy china? No, thank you. You just wait there in the sitting room with the boys, and I'll join you just as soon as I give these things a lick and a promise. Your aunt sure is a fine woman, Kay. Yeah. Mm. I don't know what we do that, or Britt. Lex don't even remember our ma. And, well, I just sort of recollect her real faint like. It was Aunt Bess who brought us up to all intents and purposes. Yeah. Well, sit down, Brett. You sit down? Yeah. Well, what are you so fidgety for, Lex? If you're going calling on Hannah Joseph again tonight, no cause to act sheepish about it. I ain't going calling. Uh, Cash? Yeah? Well, Britt and me was talking this afternoon, and he says... Well, he thinks that maybe I can sign up for the Silver Spur Drive. Is that so? Well, it stands to reason. They'll probably be needing all the extra hands they can get. Hey, ain't that how you figured, Britt? Yeah, it usually works out that way. Yeah, well, you ain't going on no cattle drive, Lex, so just get that idea out of your head. I don't see why not. Because I said so, that's why. Look, you may be the sheriff, but you ain't my boss. <laughs> Cash, I'm Mr. not... Lex, my... look, you ain't got the foggiest notion of what a cattle drive means. You wouldn't last more than a week. Maybe I wouldn't. And maybe I would. And it ain't going to do me no harm to try. Well, I said forget it. You're so anxious to get a job. There's work around here in town. Plenty of work, huh? Speak to Mr. Crawford. I ain't interested in the store job. No, you ain't interested in anything you're fit for. I made up my mind, Cash. I'm signing on with the Silver Spur if they'll have me. Yeah, well, you just better start on making that mind of yours. You're staying right here. Where you can keep an eye on me? Yeah, that's right, where I keep an eye on you. You know, someday you and me are really going to tangle. And this might just be the day. All right, Lex, that's how you want it? Oh, now, hold on, hold on now. Wait a minute here. Now, don't worry, Brett. I whipped him before Watch time. He isn't likely to ask for it again. Are you, Lex? Well? <laughs> and a little fresh air doing good. Cool him off. Mm-hmm. Maybe so. Maybe so. I don't see what got into you, Brett, encouraging him in this cattle drive nonsense. Oh, I didn't exactly encourage him. He asked me if the silver spur would take him. I said I thought maybe they would. Well, you should have told him different. Well, I'm not in the habit of lying, Cash. No. I'm, I'm sorry, Brett. I didn't mean that. Well, why, why are you so dead set against him taking out on his own? I ain't set against it, Brett. Not really. It's just that, you know, Lex is young, might wild, never had a paw to keep a tight rein on him. He needs somebody around to see that he don't get into trouble. Uh huh. Another year or two when he's married, maybe he's got somebody else to worry after. Well, things will be different then. He'll be different but right now. You think I'm riding him too hard, Brett? Well, he's your brother. You should be the best judge of that. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, it's getting kind of late, ain't it? You must be Pretty tired of that ride today. Yeah, well, I sure wouldn't object a little sleep, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, come on. I'm going to show you where you bed down. I was tired, too. I started sawing the wood the minute I hit that mattress. I guess I'd have slept through almost anything that night. Leastwise, I didn't completely wake up when somebody started pounding on the door along about 2 a.m. I sort of did remember hearing some talk afterwards, but it wasn't loud enough for me to get the gist of it. I figured there'd been some trouble in town, probably, and Cash would take care of it. So I turned over and shoved my face into the pillow. I would have gone right back to sleep again, except for a couple of minutes later. Where are you? Where are you awake? Why... Why, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Miss Petrie, I'm awake. What's the trouble? It's, it's Lex. He's been shot. It, it's what? It happened at Luke Foster's place. Cash has gone down there already, but I thought maybe you... Well, Britt... Sure, sure. As soon as I get some clothes on. <laughs> As 
I came around the corner, I saw a little crowd in front of Fawcett's gambling hall. Five or six men standing together, not saying anything, just waiting. I started to push through them, but before I could get to the door, Cash Harcourt came outside. His jaw was set and his hats pulled down tight. Eyes were staring straight ahead, but he wasn't looking at anybody. Marched right past me without even noticing where I was. How is he, Cash? Hmm? Oh, Britt. How is he? Lex is dead. Oh. He's dead when I got here. Oh, I... I'm sorry, Cash. Yeah. You know who did it? Adam Roby. That's what the boys say. It was Roby, all right. Sure all right. did. Sure did. Yeah. Well, I ain't got no more time to waste here. So long, Britt. Well, you're going after him, huh? What do you think? Well, I just thought if you wanted some company, I guess I could no. go. I'll handle this alone, Britt. Sure, sure. All right, Cash. Whatever you say. I'll tell you one thing, Britt. I wouldn't like to be in Roby's shoes when they meet up. Oh, sure. Not me. Well, do you, you fellas see the whole thing? Yeah, well, I was standing right there in the gambling hall when it happened. They were playing cards together, and Adam had been winning, and Lex had been drinking. If you ask me, Lex was just plain... Yeah? Nothing, Miss Ponson. Nothing. No, go on, go on. What are, what are you going to say? Uh, I guess Sheriff Harcourt wouldn't appreciate my opinion, and besides, it's late. I bet be getting home. Yeah, I think I'll be going along. Yeah, yeah, so long. Well, I went on into the gambling hall. Old Mr. Hendricks, he was the undertaker at Harnish Creek. He already arrived. He'd taken charge. So, it looked like it was up to me to go back to the house and break the news to Mrs. Petrie. I sure wasn't looking forward to that. But, well, she sort of read it in my face without me even having to tell her. He's... He's gone, and... Yes, ma'am. Oh. Now... If there's anything I can do, Mrs. Petrie... No. No, there's nothing, Britt. Thank you. How... How did Cash take it? Well, he didn't say much. He just went looking for the man who shot like... Roby. Roby, that was his name. Adam Roby? I believe so, yes. You, you know him? No, no, not well. He has a farm out south, and a wife and children. I've seen him at church and places. She, she appeared a real nice woman. Well, I guess she isn't to blame for. I don't blame her, Briz. I don't even blame. Well, the truth is, I've been worried about Lex for a long time. Cash had been holding him down too much, trying to make him toe the line too much. Well, I guess he was doing what he thought best. But it wasn't best. Not for Lex. You see, he resented it. Being bossed by his brother, he resented it a whole lot. I knew he couldn't keep it in much longer, but but I hoped that when the trouble come, it would be between him and Cash. Cash thought the world of Lex. And no matter what happened, he wouldn't have done anything to hurt him. Oh, no, no. Of course not. Oh, that must be somebody coming to offer sympathy. You sure gets around in a small town. I, it ain't even daylight yet. So here, I'll get it. Yes, ma'am? I, I'm Mrs. Roby. Oh. Adam's wife, I am. I come about Adam. Well, uh, the sheriff isn't here right now, Mrs. Roby. He's, he's out looking for my husband, ain't he? Yes, ma'am. That's what I figured. I didn't want to see Sheriff Harcourt. I wanted to talk to you. Hmm? You're Britt Ponsett, ain't you? The six shooter? Yes, I'm Britt Ponsett. May I? Well, I, I just don't know, Mrs. Roby. You see, you see that? Yeah? Let her come in. Mrs. Petrie. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so terrible sorry. Sure. Won't you 
Won't you sit down? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ponsett, I... I don't know how to say this, but... If you'd like to talk to Brittle, I'll... No. No, it's best that you hear it, too. Mr. Ponsett, Adam come home right after the... Kill him to get some things together. Well, he told me it wasn't his fault. He swore that it wasn't. He says... He says Lex was spoiling for a fight that Lex drew first. Adam ain't never been a man for shooting, Mr. Ponsett. I believe what he said. Well, I guess that's natural enough. Oh, he's hiding out now. Sheriff won't be able to find him. Oh, I wouldn't count on that, Mrs. Roby. Sooner or later... Well, that's you... just it. Adam doesn't want to hide out. He, he wants to give himself up. Oh? He says he'll give himself up to you. To me? He... I want you to promise that you'll turn him over to the district marshal at Standish Falls. Well, I, I just don't know what you're driving at, Miss Roby. Adam is... Adam's afraid that if Sheriff Harcourt finds him, the sheriff will... Adam's uh, afraid he won't get a trial. That's all he's asking, a, a fair trial. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Roby. This isn't any of my affair. Oh, Mr. Ponce, it no, I'm, I'm sorry. Well... Thanks, anyway. Brent. Yes, ma'am? I'd like you to see that Adam Roby got to the marshal at Standish Falls. You what? But Cash feeling the way he does now, he might... He might do something he'll regret for the rest of his life. Oh, it's bad enough, Brent, what happened tonight. I wouldn't want anything worse. Now, Miss Petrie, I'm certain that Cash would Lex do anything. was the only person on the face of this earth that Cash cared about. And he'll blame himself for what happened. Blame himself for not being there. And he'll just have to take it out on somebody. I'm not standing up for Adam Roby, Brit. I'm not even thinking about him. I, I'm just thinking about Cash. Well, even so, I'm sure I don't see where my place is Brit, in this thing. A little while ago, you asked me if there was something you could do. Yes, ma'am. Well. Mr. Ponce, just give me your promise that Adam will get to Stanley's Falls and I'll tell you where you can find him. All right, Miss Roby. I'll give you my promise. <laughs> Turn to James Stewart as the sick shooter in just a moment. But first, well, I just want to say thanks to you, our listeners, for the many kind letters you write to us each week. It kind of makes us, all of us, feel that our efforts in bringing you the sick shooter are genuinely appreciated and we're grateful. Thanks. Now, Act Two of the story called Revenge at Harness Creek. Well, it was getting on towards six o'clock in the morning by the time I left Harness Creek. According to his wife, Adam Roby was hiding in a cabin in Moon Canyon about 20 miles east, so I started off in that direction. Well, about 7.30, I passed the north boundary of the Silver Spur, and I swung up a wedge trail that wound through a yellow outcrop of rock... It was more than ten minutes later when I spotted somebody ahead, a man riding down the trail toward me. I pulled up in the shade of some evergreen and waited. Whoa, 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 whoa. The fellow finally came within recognizing distance. Cash Harcourt. Yeah, no doubt about it. From the looks of that bay mare of his, he been riding pretty hard. The horse's flanks were covered with sweat, and her head was down, swinging side to side with every step she took. Cash hadn't seen me yet, but when he did, he gave a start, and his forty-five came out fast. Hey, it's me, Cash. Brett. Huh? Oh. I'll take it easy with that thing. Devil, are you doing out here? <laughs> Told you I didn't want no help. Yeah, yeah, you did. Well. Going back to town, then. 
I can handle Roby alone. Nobody said you couldn't. Then stop following me. Well, from from the looks of the things, I'd say we were moving in opposite directions, I think. He's run, running down some tracks here. They stopped a mile or so up ahead. Couldn't be, Roby. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think I'll turn around just yet. That is, if you haven't got any objections. I got objections. Is that so? Leave them to me, Brett. Now, as long as you're certain he didn't come this way, I don't see what difference it makes if I ride on a little further. I'm the sheriff, Brett. You ain't got no business interfering with the way I carry out the law. That's right. As long as you do carry out the law. What are you talking about? Roby's wife is scared that you won't bring him in for a trial if you find him. Huh? And she asked me to turn him over to the marshal at Standish Falls. Now, I didn't want to get mixed up in this, Cash, and I told her so right straight out. But it's what your aunt wanted, too. And Bess? That's right. I couldn't very well turn her down after what happened last night. And Bess thinks that I'd kill Roby. She thinks you're upset, that's all. Well, ain't I got a right to be upset? Sure you have. So, you want to take Roby over to Marshal Griffiths, eh? Yeah, well, I haven't found him yet. Mm-hmm. Suppose his wife told you where to look. I got a right to ask you, Brett. He's a wanted man. Uh, are you asking, Cash? Guess it don't matter. All I care about is seeing that he's arrested, brought to justice. That's all I'm trying to do. Yeah, well, I guess between us, we stand a pretty good chance of finding him. Yeah. Well, good night. I watched Cash over my shoulder until he was out of sight, and then I started off again. Let's go, boy. Come on. Come on. About six miles later, I passed a waterfall that Mrs. Roby had said was a landmark. I turned Scar into a little box canyon to the left of the falls. A couple of miles further, I came to the shack. Whoa, whoa, Scar. Whoa, whoa. Well, it was easy enough to see how Cash had messed it. Unless you knew there was a cabin in the canyon, it didn't send a chance of finding it. I walked out into the open, but I stopped a good 20 yards before I got in, in rifle range. I... Roby! Roby, it's Ponsett, Roby. Brett Ponsett. You alone? Yeah, I'm alone. I like to tell you where to find me. That's right. And you're taking me to Sandy's Falls? If that's how you want it. Yeah, that's how I want it. Where's Sheriff Harcourt? He's riding toward town, last I saw him. Okay, Poncho. I'll be right out. About a minute later, he came toward me, leading the sorrel pony, and he'd had a tether behind the cabin. A little man, sort of grayish, with deep-set eyes and a kind of tired sag to his mouth. He was holding a Winchester carbine under one arm, Looked around anxious like, as if he wasn't certain I was telling the truth, and then he seemed to satisfy himself, and he shoved the carbine into the saddle scabbard, and he climbed onto the pony. We'll uh take the south trail and cut around Harness Creek. Whatever you say. Let's go. Mr. Ponsett. Yeah. Now I, I want you to know that well the shooting wasn't my fault. Lex was on the prod. He forced me into it. Well, that's for a jury to decide, Roby. Sure, sure. I reckon you believe my story or you wouldn't be doing this. I believe you're entitled to a trial, that's all. As far as I can tell, so is everybody else. Sheriff Harcourt included. You you didn't tell him where I was. I didn't tell him. Come on, let's move along. Yeah. We rode out of the canyon and turned south just beyond the falls. But the next hour or so, we didn't do any more talking. There just didn't seem to be much to talk about. And then we started down from the crest of the ridge, and I saw a flat stretch of land out ahead. We still had about a mile of rough mountain trail before we hit that level ground. Roby was about eight feet behind me, and... 
As I edged Scar on a big boulder, he was out of sight for a couple of seconds. Fred! Right. Get down behind some, Robbie. Hurry up! I slid off Scar and I flattened myself against the ground. I hunched over a couple of feet to my left and I got a glimpse of Roby. He was crouched behind a slice of orange granite and it didn't look like he got hit. I got up on my haunches and I ran over toward him. You all right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I thought you didn't tell Harcourt where I was. I didn't. And how'd he find us? Maybe this isn't Harcourt. Now, who else could it be? I pushed up a couple of inches and I saw him. He was standing on a ledge, right out in the clear, silhouetted against a great big white cloud. The sun was behind him and I... Well, I didn't have to look at his face to know who it was. Cash! Cash, what's the matter with you? Keep out of the way, Brad. We, we can hold him off. Just give me a chance to get my car by. You stay where you are. Huh? What? But you was on my side. I might have known you and him are friends. We're friends. You're going to let him kill me. Huh? Nobody's going to kill you, Robbie. Now you just sit tight. Cash! Cash, I'm coming out! Ain't your affair, Fred. I told you that. It's my affair now. But I'm not using my gun, so if you're set on killing somebody, here's your chance. I ain't got no grudge with you. It's Roby I'm after. That's why I followed you. That's why I've been waiting here. If you're after him, you're after me. I gave my word he'd get the Standish Fall. Fred, you're forcing me to shoot you down. That's right. That's just what I'm doing. Ought to be a pretty easy target, Cash. Fun. What are you waiting for? I think I'm afraid, don't you? You ought to be. Man ought to be afraid to kill another man. Well, I ain't. You're not afraid to kill Roby because you feel you're justified. How about me? How about me? You you ready to kill me? I want to draw. I'm not drawing, Cash. I want you to understand Lex is dead and Roby shot him. Yeah? He's going to make it up for that kid. Roby will get out of it somehow. You say it was Lex's fault. Probably. You're still standing up for him? Give me your gun, Cash. Why can't I kill you, Britt? Give me your gun. I want to pull the trigger, but I can't. Why? I don't know. I don't know, but I was pretty sure you wouldn't. Well, looks like I ain't got much choice. Here, take it. You want to ride along with us? Make sure I get him to the marshal? No, uh, head back to town. All right, suit yourself. Robbie! Robbie! Yeah. Now bring the horses up here. We're going to Standish Paul. Well, by the time I got back from turning Roby over to the marshal, the Silver Spur Ranch was all ready to start driving its herd north. I moved out with them, so I wasn't around for the trial. I haven't heard how it came out, but I hope one of these days the news will catch up with me. The Six Shooter is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is based on a character created by Frank Burke and is written by him. Mr. Stewart may currently be seen in the Universal International picture, The Glenn Miller Story. Others in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Eleanor Audley, Lamont Johnson, Forrest Lewis, and Bert Holland. Special music for this program was by Basil Adler, and the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. 
By the way, you'll be interested in knowing that the sick shooter has been chosen for broadcast to our men overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Services. This is John Wall speaking. Here, Jason and the Golden Fleece tonight on the NBC Radio Network. This is the Adventure Man, a new radio friend of yours. I'm going to be on hand every day at this time to bring you stories jam-packed with adventure, suspense, and mystery. Well, let's take a quick look at what's in store for you this evening in a story called Stampede on the Chisholm Trail. Jim wheeled his horse and drew his forty-five. He shouted, Maxwell, they're here, and fired two shots toward the sound he'd heard, exploding the cattle into a wild, plunging stampede. Well, and the other three men go into action, and leaving the herd to them, he drove toward where the strange horse had been. One of the most famous and fabulous landmarks in the long and colorful history of the West is the Chisholm Trail a route that the ranchers followed as they drove their great herds of cattle from the rich rangeland of the southern section of the plains country to the railroad centers of the north. Today, ancient wheel ruts in the arid soil of Texas and Kansas and the broken banks at the river crossings tell the story of hundreds of rattling chuck wagons and the passing of thousands of cattle. But there's little to tell of the passing of countless men who died along the trail or of the honest fortunes lost and dishonest ones gained by those who matched wits and six-gun skill in the fight of law against lawlessness, the fight around which our story tonight is woven. (laughs) Young Jim Pryor was heading north on the trail one morning in the fall of 1860. A lean, tanned youth of 24, he'd been born and raised on the range, had lived the hard life of a cattleman. And as a result, had grown quickly into manhood, fearless with strong sentiments about right and wrong, and fighting ability to back it up. And Jim was riding straight into the opportunity to use that ability. It was in the middle of the afternoon when Jim caught up with the herd that had been ahead of him. It was spread out in front of him as he approached, a good 450 or 500 head. He noticed first that there were no fringe riders. And then he saw what appeared to be the whole crew gathered in a group, some of them astride their ponies, others standing. Jim reined up, and even at that distance, he could tell that anger was ruling the group. Arms were waved threateningly now and then, and the men moved fretfully. One of them in particular was obviously incensed, a big man. He walked to and fro, taking his sombrero off his bushy head and putting it back on. His arms rose and fell, and suddenly he walked up to another of the standing men, stood there for a second, and abruptly his right fist drew back, snaked out, and landed on the other's chin, dropping him to the dust. Then the group left the fallen man, put spurs to their horses, and threading their way through the herd, rode off to the north. Jim rode up to the figure on the ground after they'd left, dismounted, and pressed a wet bandana to the man's graying temples. He stirred and groaned. And when his eyes opened, Jim grinned at him. Don't appear that you got many friends in that bunch. Least of ways, they ain't very careful of how they treat you. The man got slowly and painfully to his feet, slapped some of the dust from his clothes. He looked at Jim. What do you want? Well, it didn't take young Pryor long to explain that if there were anybody inside who looked like he wanted or needed anything, it was the bedraggled-looking character standing in front of him. It took a little time for the story to come out, but when it did, Jim Pryor found himself with a new job, 
A job that promised nothing but a short future. A very short future. The man's name was Luther Maxwell, and according to his story, even before he had started the drive from his ranch below the Pecos River, he had received a warning that he'd never reach his destination, which was a railroad station that existed under the unhappy name of Desolation Junction. There was a man down there below the Pecos named Todd Malcolm, riding roughshod over the ranchers, rustling beef, stealing horses, and so far, too smart to be caught. He'd warned Maxwell that he'd lose his herd, and there was little doubt that he was the one who was planning to take it over. And now, Maxwell, with only three men left, a cook and two handymen. Ah, it looked like Malcolm's threat would be made good. Maxwell clenched his gnarled fist when he finished the story and stared off into the north. A lowering sun looked into his grizzled face and caught the hard glint in his eyes. My tarnation, I'll fight him alone if I have to. It was at that moment, admiring the fighting determination in the old man, that young Pryor decided to throw good sense over his shoulder and join Maxwell in the one-sided battle. Half a thousand cattle to drive and a band of rustlers to fight. Heavy odds for five men. There was no help for them to call on out here. No law except the law of the six-gun. The law... Of the Chisholm Trail. An uneasy night descended on the little group. The chill light of the stars showed the restless, undulating outline of the herd, moving, grazing, lowing in a kind of pent up nervousness. Jim knew that at night any herd was ripe for stampede. He knew that if anything, man or beast, started this bunch, he and the four with him would have to move fast to keep him from scattering. And that if, if Malcolm decided to jump them, they'd have to fight like a troop of cavalry. Now, yeah, with that unpleasant outlook, he and Maxwell rode out to their lonely vigil with the cattle. They eased their ponies to the edge of the herd, and there they parted. Maxwell to ride around the bunch one way, young Pryor to ride the other way. Well, aside from a few skulking coyotes that vanished at Jim's approach, the first part of the night was uneventful. Humming quietly to the cattle now and then, Jim rode easily around the herd, meeting Maxwell at regular intervals and leaving him again. Too quiet, young Pryor thought. Too quiet. In his uneasiness, he stopped his horse now and then to listen, to feel the air in the darkness. He heard the cattle and the coyotes and heard Maxwell singing a cowboy's lullaby. He felt the wind, smelled the odors of the night. All normal things, but somehow it didn't feel right. Somehow, something was wrong. He stopped. He heard something. Listen again. There it was. Unmistakably, a horse snorted somewhere in the dark. and drew his 45, all reason for quiet, gone. He shouted, Maxwell, they're here. Get behind the herd. Get them moving up the trail. Get them moving. He fired two shots toward the noise he'd heard, floating the cattle into a wild, plunging stampede. He heard Maxwell and the other three men go into action, and leaving the herd to them, he drove toward where he thought the strange horse had been. He caught a glimpse of a fleeting shadow, but lost it in the darkness before he had time for a shot. The night echoed and re-echoed the roar of six guns and the thunder of hooves. Nobody could stop or swerve those cattle now. They were blind, terrified, plunging relentlessly ahead. Jim and Maxwell had stampeded the cattle themselves, but they were headed the right way toward Desolation Junction. The first round had caught Malcolm before he was out of his corner. There was a feeling of victory in Maxwell's small group the next morning. The cattle had run themselves out before dawn and now had settled down to a steady, mile-eating pace. Five men had won out over many times that number. Five men and 500 cattle. But both Jim Pryor and Maxwell knew that only a few hours would pass before they'd have to face Malcolm's men again. That was certain. So, choked with dust kicked up by the thousands of hooves, Weary and saddle sore, young Pryor and Maxwell tried to work out a plan. 
Both of the men knew the country ahead of them. They discussed it now, trying to settle on which place would be a good spot from which Malcolm would attack. It's an old rule with men who fight other men. Put yourself in your enemy's shoes. And doing that, discarding this place and that, they narrowed the possibilities to three. Three places from which Malcolm could attack. With the odds they had stacked against him, their only hope was in being sure. And the only way to be sure was to go to each of these three places and find out if Malcolm were there. Jim, the cook, and one of the handymen volunteered for the job. Each man to look into one of the possibilities. Each man standing a one out of three chance of facing Malcolm's gang alone. To Luther Maxwell waiting for the scouts to return, the hours seemed like days. One passed, 60 long minutes, another. And then the cook came back. He found nothing. Another seemingly endless period of waiting while the sun slanted toward the western edges of the empty land. And then, riding wearily, young Jim Pryor joined them. He had found nothing. More time. And finally, they had to accept it. The handyman had run into Malcolm's men. Was he dead now or captured? He had traded one fate or the other for the information so badly needed. But now... They were sure Malcolm and his men were a few miles ahead in Skull Canyon. Skull Canyon. Both Pryor and Maxwell knew the place. Near a river crossing, a short canyon on their right, dead-ended. In their mind's eye, they could see the gang. There was a pocket on one side, an indentation in the canyon wall. That's where they'd be, out of sight. The river crossing did away with the idea of trying to stampede the cattle by. They had to slow down for the river. And suddenly, Jim had it. There wasn't time to argue the pros and cons of the plan. It had to work, and they had to move fast. As Jim explained his plan to Maxwell, they goaded the weary cattle into a lumbering run. They swung them slowly out to the left. And soon, they could see the mouth of Skull Canyon, looking lonely and peaceful off to the right. They pushed the herd a little harder, a little faster, swinging out away from the canyon. Jim held his position. The other men shifted theirs, moving to the other side of the herd. They were almost abreast of the canyon, and Jim was ready. He raised himself in his stirrups, he waved his hand in a signal, and Maxwell and his two men went off into action. Guns roaring, they pushed their horses into a gallop and started turning the head of the herd. Faster and faster they moved until they were headed directly toward the mouth of Skull Canyon. Young Pryor reached the canyon in time to see Malcolm's men start out of their hiding place. When they saw the stampeding cattle bearing directly down on them, confusion hit their ranks. They scattered, some of them racing to the end of the canyon to attempt escape up the steep sides, others trying to cut in front of the herd only to fall into the avalanche of heavy bodies. Jim saw two of them wheel their horses back into the pocket, and his glimpse was just long enough to let him recognize the man who had hit Maxwell back on the trail. The other man, Jim guessed, was Malcolm himself. He dropped from his horse and going partway up the canyon side started toward the two. He reached down and loosened the six gun in his holster. It took a second or two to wipe the sweat out of his eyes as he reached the edge of the pocket. And then, and then he moved quickly into the open, crouched slightly, his arms bent a little at the elbow. I'm calling this hand, Malcolm. The two men whirled to face him, their gun hands streaking toward their hips. Pryor's coat slid out of the leather in one easy lightning-like movement. And at the same time, he made one quick step to the left and the six-gun roared. In a matter of seconds, it was over. Malcolm jerked forward, took a step, and crumpled. The other man whirled and fell as Jim's slug crashed through his shoulder. Young Pryor walked over to the two men. As a precaution, kicked their guns out of reach. Didn't know five men could put up such a scrap, did you? At least a way is five men and five hundred doggies. And except to tell you that Malcolm and as many of his gang as could be rounded up 
were turned over to the sheriff when Jim and Maxwell and the herd arrived at Desolation Junction, our story is over. Across the rugged Indian territory rides a tall young man on a mission of mercy. His medical bag strapped on one hip, his six-shooter on the other. This is Dr. Six-Gun. First episode in the exciting adventure series, Dr. Six Gun. Ray Matson, MD, was the gun toting frontier doctor who roamed the length and breadth of the old Indian territory. Friend and physician to white men and Indian alike, a symbol of justice and mercy in the lawless West of the 1870s, this legendary figure was known to all as. Dr. Six-Gun. Dr. Six-Gun was my friend. Me? Well, they call me Pablo. It's as good a name as any for a gypsy. (laughs) I am a peddler, and I have many things in my pack. There is not much of which I am proud, but there is one thing... I can call Doc Six-Gun my friend. <laughs> this one, this black raven, is also my friend. Hey, midnight! <laughs> well, a bird that talks is no more strange than a man who sings. But let me tell you of my friend, the doctor. It was in the spring of 1871 that the wagon train came into the territory. Pennsylvania Germans they were, and on the whole, a respectable lot. Except for one man. Well, we wandered into their camp one April morning, midnight and I, to see what we could sell them. And there, our story begins. you got a sick Indian boy in your wagon. That's right. He come stumbling into camp about 20 minutes ago. Half delirious. Said his village was sick. We're going to move north. You don't say. Get him out. Now, wait a minute. I said get him out. Well, I happen to own this wagon, Mr. Gord. And I happen to be leader of this wagon thing. We've been starving in these rocks for six months now. We can't afford sickness. Where is he? Inside. Okay, Indian, on your feet. On your feet, I said, understand? Well, he's one of them Spanish talking mescalero Apaches. He don't savvy. Well, he'll savvy this. Oh, don't hit him, Cole. I'll hit him if it makes a move. Come on, now. Here, let me, let me help you, young fella. And now, easy, easy. Let me help you, Don. Okay, Membrano. Oh, get. Can't you see he's too weak? A couple of bullets are on his feet and he'll move. Oh, oh, okay, maybe you're caught, please. Out of the way. Pardon me, gentlemen. Who the devil are you? My name is Pablo, sir. I am a peddler. Ah, 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 Get that ah, raven ah, away from me. Ah, midnight, ah, come here. Ah, he will not harm me, sir. He's a pet. Ah, right, midnight? Hey! Ah, 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 I hear him talk? Ah, oh, midnight ah, does many ah, things. Watch. Ah, midnight. Midnight on time, I said. Look at that. I don't care if he's a genius. Keep him away until we take care of this engine. Gentlemen, please, I could not help but overhearing. The boy is sick, is he not? He'll be a lot sicker if he don't get. Or perhaps I could help. I am on my way to see a friend of mine in Frenchman's Fort, a physician. I will take the Indian boy along. Oh, that's mighty nice of you, stranger. Pablo, <laughs> and this is midnight. <laughs> My name's Willie James. This is our leader, Aaron Paul. I'm going to round up the men folks for a meeting. See that this engine is gone before we start. Mr. James, would you help me tie the Indian boy to my mule? He seems very weak. Oh, sure thing, Pablo. All right. Now, 
Thank you. Perhaps I will come back here and sell some trinkets to your people. Not to this wagon train. This is bad luck outfit. Run out of money, had to butcher our oxen for food. We've been stuck here six months. When winter comes, I don't know what'll happen. My wife, little girl. Well, you best be gone. Well, perhaps I will return anyway. Adios. What's the name of this doctor friend of yours? Hey, Doc Sixgun. Oh, you've heard of him? Oh, who hasn't? <laughs> Only doctor I ever know. The pack six shooter on his hip. Oh, he come up a few weeks ago. Treat my missus. Wouldn't take a cent. Yes, that sounds like my friend. Well, sir, adios. Come along, midnight. <laughs> Excuse me, doctor. Do you have any cure for a restless soul? Pablo, you <laughs> old son of a gun. Where you been? Where have I not been? <laughs> How are you, old friend? Just fine. You look well. <laughs> Weep before God, laugh before people. <laughs> However, but come in. Come in. Stay a few weeks. Stay a year. Where's midnight? Well, ah, here. Ah, ah, there you are, you old seagull. Ah, you can see you ah, in the dark. Well, Pablo, you coming? One moment, please. I have a sick Indian outside. A sick Indian? Well, why didn't you say so? Bring him in. You'll have to help me carry him. Sure, right? sure. Oh, right here he is. Now, don't be afraid, boy. This man will help you. Easy now. Let's lift him here. Careful. All right. Put him down here. Ah, uh, I'll hold the lantern. Why, I know this boy. So? His name is Modi Pony. He's the son of an Apache chief. Well, let's see what... Uh-oh. Shiris? Measles. Well, that doesn't sound so bad. Not to a white man. To an Indian, it can be as fatal as bubonic plague. Oh. He seems over the worst of it. Modi Pony. Hola. Can thou hear me? I hear the white eyes. My people. What of thy people? The spot of sickness. How many? Ten warriors have gone to their hunting grounds in so many days. The shaman, Gray Fox, urges us to leave our home and go into the snow country. My father is against it. I went for help to the camp of the white eyes. What does he say? Their uh, medicine man wants them to go north. Why north? The only way they know to fight the measles is with freezing climate. It arrests the disease. Oh. The only trouble is that a sick tribe moving north in winter usually starves to death in route. Something can be done, surely. Paddle, you stay here and take care of the boy. I think he'll be all right. I'll get up there and try to help his people. Maybe I can persuade him to stay. Oh, that's dangerous country. The Apaches don't trust the white man. Well, I'll have to chance it. If I can isolate the active cases, I may be able to control it. In any case, they mustn't move off the land. That wagon train of settlers could move in and claim it under the law. That's rich country. I'll stay. I'll have to pack in a hurry. I'll need plenty of fever pills and morphine. and give them stinking Apaches and a peace treaty with Cochise. They don't farm that land. All they do is hunt on it. Oh, what what is is that that I'll that tell that you that what, good. There's an epidemic of measles in the Apache village. 
One of them come stumbling into camp this afternoon. Well, I found out that their medicine man is telling them to move north, off the land. That means we move in. Except, except for one thing. There's a fella named Doc Sixgun on his way to that village to stop the epidemic. Now, the way I look at it, Neither we stop Doc Six Gun from reaching that village, or we die. I say stop him. Listen, listen to me. You know what you're doing. Are you willing to trade your souls for a few acres of dirt? When we left Pennsylvania to come out west, we had a dream. We wanted to be free men on our own land, beholden to nobody. What's happened to you? You can't eat dreams. This is inhuman. Listen to the dreamer, men. We've had all we can stand. It's time for action. Let's go. Stop. I'll shoot the first man that moves. Well, he's in. Put down that gun. I mean it. I can't stand by and see this happen. How can we hold up our heads? Nice work, Luke. That's what's going to happen to anybody else who lily livers out. Come on. Come on. All right. All right. Nothing worth stealing. We ain't crooks. If you're not, why not take off those masks? I'll give the orders, Doctor. Now, empty that medical bag. All right. You win. Drop the stuff on the ground. Stethoscope. Narcotics. Scalpel. Needles. Cat gut. Flint. Anything else? Uh, just one thing. What? This. Oh, another gun. Don't anybody move. You see that? Cut the rifle right out of his hand. I carry an extra gun in my bag for emergency operations, Mr. Gulp. Now take off those masks, all of you. Makes you feel a little exposed without a mask, doesn't it, gentlemen? And not quite so brave. You grown men should be ashamed of yourselves, playing vigilante at your age. <laughs> Don't move, Gulp. Now get down and pick up that stuff and put it back in my bag. Hurry up, I haven't got time to wait. Close it. Throw it here. Now, I suggest that none of you boys try to follow me. I suggest you all go home and take care of your family. Come on, Faith. Let's go. Mount up, men. We're going after him. Mount up, I say. Let's go home. Let's go. No regret this. Hey, shut your mouth. I'm with you, Galt. I've got six kids back in my wagon. It ain't right them Indians have the land, even if it's there. All right, Luke. We need that land. Okay. You going after him? He's got too much thought for that. I got a better idea. What's that? Look here. In my hand. Well, it's a glass bottle. Where'd you get that? I found it out of the doc's medical bag when I was putting the things back. Read it. Dr. Metzen, prussic acid, 100 grains. <whistles> One grain would kill you dead. Well, what kind of that stuff? This stuff? This stuff is going to make Doc Six Gun wish he'd never tangled with Aaron Gaunt. Let's go. Where to go? Frenchman's Ford. I want to inquire after a sick friend. Oh, Sage. Oh, boy. Hello! Anybody here? 
Stand, White Eyes. Sir. Do not move. I am Gray Fox, medicine man to the Chiricahua. Who art thou? A medicine man to the White Eyes. What is thy name? I'm called Doc Six Gun. Why dost thou come? I bring strong medicine against the spotted sickness. Gray Fox has made strong medicine. There is nothing to do but leave this place of evil spirits. Go home, White Eyes. I come to see your chief, Tallhorn. I say, go home. I have given medicine to Modi Pony, the son of Tall Horse. I think you'd better take me to see him. Very well, White Eyes. I do not trust thee, but I will take thee to Tall Horse. Follow me. Here is the Hogan of the High Council. Enter. Who is this, O Shaman? This is Medicine Man of the White Eyes, O Chief. He says he comes in peace. Stay in peace. He says he has ministered to Son of Tall Horse. Is this true? I treated thy son only tonight, though, Chief. He lives. Thy son will recover. What is thy rank among the white eyes? Brave. Sit by my left hand. Speak. I have medicines to stop the sickness. What medicine? Here. In these blue bottles. Are these magical? They are of a lesser magic, but very strong. Gray Fox counsels us to go north. Give me just two days. What do you say, men of Chiricahua? I do not trust White Eyes. They have betrayed us before. It shall be for the council to decide. Is there consent? If so, break your arrow. All but you, Gray Fox. I have sworn against the White Eyes, as hast thou. The council has decided, White Eyes. But if you do us evil, the revenge of the Chiricahua will be swift and terrible. Now, we make thee our brother. to see how the Indian boy is getting along. Come in, come in. He's feeling much better. The fever has broken. Oh, that's fine, huh, Luke? Hmm? Oh, yeah, oh, sure, sure. That's fine, fine. You, uh, heard from the doc? No. Ah, ah, get out, get out. Get quiet, out. midnight, quiet. Ah. Mind if I go in to see him? Not at all. Just want to check. Since he came to us, I wouldn't want the Apaches to hold us responsible if anything happened to him. You understand? I will go with you. It is time for his medicine anyway. Well, I'll give it to him. Uh, uh, Luke has a splinter he'd like you to take out. Right, Luke? Hmm? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a bad one. Oh, well, I will do it. Here is the medicine for both the pony. I will mix it in the water. So, he knows how to take it. I'll just go in. Now, show me this, uh, this uh, splinter. Uh, it, it's right here in this hand. Well, I see no splinter. It come in the light. Or uh, it, it, it pains off. Are uh, you sure? I see nothing. I don't see anything. It's funny. Maybe it's the other hand. Oh, well, I will look. Okay. Forward. What? What is it? Look. Oh. Pony. He's dead. It is possible. What happened? I don't know. I gave him the medicine and he took a swallow and went limp. Let me listen for his heart. Well? He is dead. That's what I thought. Stand up and turn around. Huh? Why'd you point the gun? Do like I say. Search him, Luke. 
He's not carrying a gun. All right. You got a buckboard? Yes, sir. Put the body of Moody Pony in the back. We're gonna take a journey. You ain't coming back either. <laughs> Box. What does the white eyes want? I need help. Take two tablets from the blue book, the glass, and give them to the wife of Long Bear. As thou sayest, white eyes. Mm. This child has a temperature. Place him away from the well ones. And uh, watch for the spots. Yes, white eyes. All right, now. Gray Fox. Yes, our chief. What does the white eyes? He gives medicine from the blue glass. What's the effect? They fall into deep sleep. I do not trust it. Have any died? Not yet. Bring me news in the council if anything happens. Why does the council send for me, Gray Fox? Enter the Hogan, White Eyes. Very well. Oh, Chief, I have much work. It is not fair to thy people to... Holy pony. Gaze upon body of the son of Tall Horse. How... How did he get here? He was brought here by two white eyes, along with Peddler who did this evil thing. Pablo, you all right? Uh, he's a lot better than he's gonna be, Doc. What happened, Pablo? I gave Moldy Pony the medicine. Gold found him dead. Thus didst minister to son of Paul Horse, O Chief. You hear me now, O men of the Chiricahua? For his perfidy, the white medicine man and his friend shall be dishonored and die. Take them hence and tie them to the cactus plant with thongs of wet rawhide. When the sun shall rise full, the thongs will sink. Then they shall feel the wrath of the Chiricahua Apache. After the burial of Moody Pony, our people will burn their organs. We shall leave this land of evil spirits forever. No harm to the white eyes who came in peace. And thus has the council ordered. Fastened to the white medicine man and his friend. They are, O Chief. We will leave them. Come. Come on, Doc. You want to speed it up a little? Here's the bottle of prussic acid that killed Moody Pony. Thanks for the use of it. Come away from them. Let them meditate on their sin until the sun shall rise. I. Start the funeral. We weep for the spirit of Morty Pony. Easy, Pablo. The bones begin to press. See, the sun is high. Try not to move. See, the vultures come already. Yes. Uh, Pablo. Yes. That's no vulture. It's midnight. Midnight. Oh, I found it. Midnight. I have a thought. A wild thought, but still. What? My raven can untie nuts. What? It's a trick. I would often have him untie the string on my pendulum sack. Midnight. Midnight, the knot, untie the knot. He's going to the knot. Untie, untie. He's tugging at it. Oh, no use. He's getting it. Pablo, he's getting it. <laughs> 
Thus do I consecrate the body of my son, Modi Pony. Pile the stones on his grave. Wait, oh, Chief. Six o'clock. White Eyes stands on the rocks. Kill him. Wait, men of Tirikawa. Speak quickly, for in a moment you shall die on my lands. Men of Tirikawa, I proclaim my innocence. And I risk my life to give proof everlasting. Don't listen to him. I will. Wait. How will you do this, White Eyes? I will do it. By raising from the dead your son, Modi Pony. Oh, he tricks you. Why, this is the strongest medicine of all, White Eyes. Beware. Give me one moment. Doc, how can you do this? Get my medical kit. Golf has it. The doctor needs his medicine bag. It is a trick. We shall see. Give him the bag. Here, Doc. Pray, Pablo. If you do this magic, you are my brother. If not, I'm praying, Doc. Give me the spirit of ammonia from the bag. Yes, sir. Here. Uh, now. He desecrates the body of Modi Pony. Kill him! Stop! Look. His eyes move. He waits. My son awakes from the dead. Modi Pony. Modi Pony. Canst thou hear me? I... Tell us the name of the man who poisoned you. Uh, See, O oh chief. Uh, he points uh, at this one. Uh, Look, run, sir! Uh, him! Uh, 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 Before I explode like a bomb, what happened? <laughs> when we first saw Modi Pony's body, I noticed that rigor hadn't set in, even though some hours had gone by. Uh, then when Gold gave us that blue bottle, I remembered that it didn't contain prussic acid at all. Huh? I put morphine in it just before we left and didn't have time to change the label. Then Modi Pony was never dead? Just drugged into a deep stupor. Uh -huh. The uh, spirits brought him back. Huh? Spirits of ammonia. <laughs> <laughs> there is a saying among the gypsy people, you cannot get two skins off an ox. You have proved it wrong. You have been listening to Dr. Six Gun. Six Gun is played by Carl Weber and Pablo by William Griffiths. Today's script was written by George Lefferts. Heard in the cast were Peter Capel as Aaron Galt, Kermit Murdoch as Willie James, Donald Duke as Modi Pony, Richard Saunders as Luke, William Keane as Gray Fox, and Craig McDonald as Chief Tallhorse. <laughs> The Bakers of Weber's Bread present your all-star Western theater. Drifting along, singing a song under a Western moon. From Hollywood comes your all-star Western theater, starring America's great Western singers, Boy Willing and the Riders of the Purple Sage and a heartwarming human story of an unusual man and his faithful partner. And now, the riders of the Purple Sage. There's a rainbow over the range, and the skies are blue again. The rolling thunder spells in the far-off hills. There's a rainbow over the range. Hear the cowboys yippee i -o, while the doggies mill and low. The sun is riding high in the prairie sky. There's a rainbow over the range. I've been told there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow lane. But I found the trail, just a magic veil that's worn in the wind and rain. It's a grand and glorious day. 
and the clouds have rolled away. The pain comes to stills in the far off hills, there's a rainbow over the rain. I've been told there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow lane. But I found the trail, just a magic veil that's poured in the wind and rain. It's a grand and glorious day, and the clouds have rolled away. The fading sun distills in the far off hills, there's a rainbow over the rain. Boy Willing, I believe you wanted to say a word here. Well, Terry, I just wanted to mention a little romantic song with a Western spirit, which has won its place in today's hit parade class. And a lot of people have to like a song before it can be given that distinction. I'm talking about Adobe Hacienda, of course. Which the boys and I are going to play and sing for you now. In my Adobe Hacienda there's a touch of Mexico Yeah, it's just lovelier than orchids Blooming in the patio So desert stars and the strum of guitar Make every evening seem so sweet when vast stretches of range country were unfenced, the cowpuncher's job meant much more than just riding, roping, and shooting. Cowpokes spent a lot of time keeping the great cattle herds from stampeding and getting into quicksand or running off a cliff. You know, it took a lot of skill and experience to bring the cattle through safely and deliver them to market fat and uninjured. And today, it takes a lot of skill and experience to bake delicious Weber's bread. Always well-mixed and properly baked, you'll find the smooth, even texture and golden brown crust of Weber's bread especially appealing. And when you serve it on your table, you can be sure the entire family will enjoy its distinctive flavor. Buy a loaf of that good Weber's bread the next time you go to your grocery store. You'll know it by its familiar blue gingham wrapper. Enjoy that good Weber's bread often. You'll like it. Way back about 1911, when folks who were hep did the kangaroo dip, the crab step, the grizzly bear, and the Texas Tommy as they danced the turkey trot, Irving Berlin whipped out a song which won him undying fame. I'm not even going to give the title, no need to. Everybody knows Alexander's Ragtime Band. Come on here, come on here, Alexander's Ragtime Band. Come on here, come on here. It's the best band in the land. They can play a bugle call like you never heard before. So natural that you want to go to war. It's just the bestest band. What am honey lamb? Come on along. Come on along. Let me take you by the hand. I do the man. Do the man. Who's the leader of the band? And if you want to hear that Swanee River play in ragtime, come on here. Come on here. Alexander's Ragtime Band. Come on along with me, come on. 
come on along and see Alexander's band. Take you by the hand, take you to the man who's the leader of the band. And if you want to hear that Swanee River play in ragtime, come on here, come on here, Alexander, Xander, Xander's ragtime band. Well, the writers of the Purple Sage have chosen a love song which Western fans have taken to their hearts. And a song which, if there was ever such a girl as pictured in the title, has made her forever famous. San Antonio Rose. Deep within my heart like a melody, a song of old San Antonio. Where in dreams I live with a memory beneath the stars all alone. It was there I found beside the Alamo Enchantment strange as the blue of above Moonlit paths that only she would know Still here's my broken song of love Moon in all your splendor, lonely my heart All back my rose, rose of sand and foam Lips so sweet and tender like petals falling apart Speak once again of my love, my own old broken song Empty words I know they live in my heart all alone All that moonlit path by the Alamo And rose, my rose of San Antonio Moon in all your splendor and only my heart Call back my rose, rose of San Antonio Little so sweet and tender, like petals falling apart. Speak once again of my love, my own broken song. Empty words I know, they live in my heart all alone. All that moonlit path by the Alamo, and rose, my rose of San Antonio, rose of San Antonio. And now it's time for Foy Willing and the writers of the Purple Sage to tell another story of the West. This week they've selected a simple tale called Little Hoof. Of all the perfect lives we pictured in our dreams, the life of a vagabond seems best. A wandering minstrel like these riders of the Purple Sage to feel the sting of wind-driven rain, an outlaw racing against death, to know the coolness of water from a deep well. A wandering minstrel finds all of these and sometimes more. Sometimes he finds an affection or love that lasts longer than life itself. Better ride easy, boys. Sun's hot enough to broil a steak. I don't see how lizards stand it living in this kind of a climate all their lives. Do you, Foy? It's so hot they probably haven't got the gumption to try and go anywhere else out. Yeah. I think you got something there, Johnny. What was that? The raffle shot. They're shooting at us. Head to the boulders on the left. Let's get some protection until we find out what this is all about. Quiet now. Yeah, I think we gave him the slip. Is somebody mad at us, boy? Not that I know of. If they ain't, they're sure using the matters of a coyote. Come on out from behind them rocks. I've got you covered. Keep down, boys. I know right where you are. You know, it seems like I recognize that voice. Me too, Foy. This is your last chance. Either come on out or I'll shoot you better than last year's snake skin. Even if I have to sit here till doomsday to do it. Is that you, Scotty? You're playing right, it's me. I got a shooting iron in each hand and another in my belt. I'm Foy Willing, Scotty. You who? Foy Willing. Al Slow and Johnny Paul are here with me. Stand up. Let me see. Old Scotty must have gone loco. Yeah, yeah that's that him, Scotty. Well, dogs if you ain't, boy, will it? Say, what's the idea of shooting at us, Scotty? We've always hey, been... Boy, I owe you fellas an apology. You ain't varmints. You ought to have a hot brand and I run down my mouth for saying you was. I thought all the time I was following you that you was them outlaws that got me staked out. Outlaws? Well, outlaws been watching me like buzzards watch a stray cat. Say, how about riding back to my shack with me? I'd appreciate you letting me wrestle up some grub for supper by way of apology for calling you varmints. Well, you lead the way, Scotty. You got the grub, we got the appetite. Yeah, sure, sure have. have. What's the 
matter? Your horse thieves ain't at nothing. Don't you like my vittles? Well, I reckon we've been kind of holding off, Scotty, thinking you'd say a little more about those outlaws. Oh, them. Well, I'll tell you about them. Four months ago, more or less, Little Hoof and me brought a grub stake out here. Little Hoof? Is Little Hoof still alive? Is Little Hoof still alive? Why, it's only now she's reached full bloom. Well, we didn't mean anything against her, Scotty. Well, I hope not, because man never had a better partner. The whole history of this spinning world in Little Hoof. Or a prettier one either. You know, she's got downright pretty this last year. Flecks of gray in her hair now. And sort of a plumpness in a few spots. <laughs> Kind of softness in her eyes, too, late. Hmm. You could offer me a whole dang railroad, but dog if I'd trade that burrow. Nope. Well, what about the outlaws, Scotty? Well, I'm coming to them. Little Hoof and me brought a grub stake out here, and I started digging a likely claim. Never really expected to find anything, of course. But I'm a bow-legged road runner. If I did enough and strike it rich... You mean it, Frank? Well, congratulations, Scotty. I'm glad to hear it. Now, second now. I ain't finished. A week ago, the claim petered out, so I decided it was time for Little Hoof and me to go back to civilization. That's when I noticed the outlaws had showed up. They were after your stake, huh? Waiting for me. Waiting until I'd finished working the claim, so when they jumped me, they'd be sure to get all the gold there was. Haven't known quite what to do since, except to go through the motions of digging, so as I'd have time to think of a way out. You mean you've been here pretending to work for a whole week? I well, couldn't do much else, or they'd have come to the shack and got me. Maybe waylaid little hoof and me as we crossed the desert. Scotty, if you want to start back in the morning, we'll ride with you and see that you get through safe. Sure will, Scotty. Yes. Well, I figured maybe you would, boy. I'm mighty grateful. Well, let's count on it then. Well, boys, I reckon it's about time we're bedding down for the night, don't you? Yeah. You still awake, boy? Just woke up. Don't know why. I usually sleep straight through. Uh-huh. Funny thing. Kind of hard for me to go to sleep this evening. See, tomorrow will be sort of like a dream come true for little Hook and me. Yeah, I imagine it will. Must be two, three thousand dollars there. My whole lifetime before I never made more than enough to buy beans and bacon. We're sure mighty glad for you, Scotty. You know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to live like a king, a real royal king. First, I'll fix things so Little Hoof has a patch of grazing land all to herself where she can eat fresh, juicy grass from sun up to dark every day of the week. She won't have to do no work at all. Yeah. Then I'm going to buy a railroad ticket, get on a train. I made up my mind where I'll go yet, but wherever the engine takes us will be all right with me. When I'm on the train and hungry... I'll sit down at a table, one with a white cloth covering the top. Tell a fella to bring me a meal. The train will be roaring along, and I'll be sitting there eating choice vittles. Won't that be just fine? Be great, Scotty. Tonight I'll go to a hotel. Not a rough boarded hotel, but a hotel all made out of stone with carpets on the floor. Order me a soft bump. Pure white sheet, pure white, just like a summer cloud. Bet y'all sleep like a baby, boy. Not many men get what they want out of life, Scotty. Wonderful. Just wonderful. It's awful hard to sleep. Guess maybe I'll get up for a spell. All right. I'm just keeping everybody else awake. Stars are sure pretty this evening. Where do you go now, boy? Oh, you awake too, Al? Yeah. Oh, I kind of think he went over to see if Little Hook is all right. I heard him talking to Little Hook just before we bedded down. Same as if she was a human being. Yeah, that's right. You suppose the old fellow's gone a little loco? Another thing, boy, I ain't seen any signs of these here outlaws he's been talking about, have you? Mm, not yet. You know, Al, I don't reckon we ought to spoil things for him by talking. I mean, if he should hear us, doubt him. A couple of days to get across this desert, Little Hook. <clears throat> Another day for me to make arrangements for you. That ain't so long to wait, though, is it, old girl? Not after all these years. Good long rest. Me luxuriating on the best they is. You putting that soft old nose down, nibbling ten. <coughs> What's that? Little hook. Look. Shot. She's been shot. She's dead. Little hook. 
Who's this? Scotty. We thought we heard shooting. Do you know anything about... He's dead. Golly. They've done it deliberately. Outlaws. She's dead. The dirty rattlers. Poor old girl. They shot Little Hoof, thinking they could starve you out, Scotty. Just when I could have given her the reward she had coming for all her work. Never mind, Scotty. We'll take you across the desert tomorrow just the same. We'll ride double or something, but we'll get you across. Excuse me, boy, but I don't reckon I can go tomorrow now. I'll have to stay on here until I track down the varmints that shot Little Hoof. That wasn't right. She had a good time coming. They took it away from her. Wait a minute. Hold it, boys. What's the matter, boy? You see something? Look down there in that ravine. A camp. Right, she's hostage we found them. That's their camp. But it seems deserted. Fires are out. Two horses grazing. Nothing else stirring. Varmints probably rode over to my diggings already, wanting to find out what I plan to do. Looks to me like the outlaws care a whole lot more for comfort than they do for safety. What do you mean, Al? Well, look where they made camp, down at the end of a ravine, up against the side of the mountain. They got only one way of getting in and out, unless they ride uphill. Yeah, sure enough. Scotty, I reckon the best thing for us to do is to get on over to the entrance of that ravine and wait there until they come back. Yes, sir, that's just what we'll do. Waiting for them won't be as much fun as riding them down, but being sure we get them is more important than having fun in this case. Simon's probably figured there was only one man to look out for, an old fella, too. So they didn't care much where they camped. Never entered their minds, an old fella might have friends. Listen. Horses. That's them. They're coming back. Pull a hammer on my rifle. Don't move anybody. Stay right where you are. Get a bead on them as they pass one at a time. Do just what they've done to little hoof. Drop them without any warning at all. No. I guess we can't do that. It wouldn't be right. We've got to give them a chance for a fair fight. We've got to be fair, don't we, boy? This is your party, Scotty. Anything you say goes. It's awful hard to decide. What? I'll let him pass. Never was attempted to do an unfair thing in my life. Know how you feel, Scotty. Could have winged three of them before they'd know what was happening. Kept thinking about sitting on a moving train and eating supper. If I had in my mind, would have gone to Little Hook and I'd have dropped them automatic. Glad you did, Scotty. Fight ought to be clean. I reckon we can start moving up now. We'll close the pocket, then warn them we're there and hope they'll start to fight. <laughs> I reckon this will do. Al. Yeah. Johnny. Yeah. Take your horses to the left a little. Yep. Don't want to be too bunched up. Ready? Ready. I'll warn them, then. I'm saying a prayer they'll shoot instead of giving up so they can shoot back. Well. All right, you varmints in there. Put your hands up and walk your horses this way. See anything, Scotty? One fellow rode behind that big rock to the left. Don't see nothing else. I got a posse with me. Come on out there. We're coming in. They're doing it, boy. They're shooting at us. Now we can shoot at them. You fellas keep firing from here. I'll ride around, hit at their side, drive them out into the open. I'll go with you, Scotty. Johnny, Al, yeah. work your rifles fast. Doesn't matter what you shoot at so long as it's in their direction. Just make them stay planted. Scotty and I'll attack them from the side. We'll do it. Then. Here's a fair fight, Varmint, so I'm warning you. We've rode over so as we're on your left. Got one, boy, I got one. Another and I got another. Did you see that, boy? That last one's getting away. He's decided to run for it. Al, Johnny, get that man going up the side of the mountain. Never mind, boy. Never mind. No use of us trying anymore. Yeah, I guess you're right. Probably give him such a bad time he suffered more than if we put a bullet through his head. Come on. Go back to my shack. This is 
about all we can do for her, boys. Well, little hoof, I always figured I'd be planted deep like this before you was. Just the opposite happened. Hard to tell about such things. Maybe I'll come out this way again, though, sometime, good Lord willing. But first, I want to live a life of ease for a while and do the things I told you about. You can understand about that, I guess. Anyway, little hoof, I'm going into the shack now to pick up my outfit. And I'll get along. Sorry you can't have the <coughs> fresh... You see green grass? He's looking forward to five of them. Well, boys, I'll pick up some stuff now. Go on, Al, Johnny. We'll give him a hand. Sure. Yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead inside, boy, Al, Johnny. Jack ain't exactly a palace. But maybe when I get into that room in a hotel, the carpet on the floor, he can pay me a visit. Hope you can. I... Just a second. Somebody's been here. Well, they've dumped your stuff, Scotty. They've rifled everything. My gold. If my gold is gone... Take it easy, Scotty. Let me look. Let me... It's gone. It's tough. So, when we was hunting for their camp, they must have been here. Yeah. Must have watched us leave, more than likely. That outlaw got away. He must have been carrying it. Well... Yes, I won't eat a meal on a moving train after all, will I? Sure wish you'd change your mind, Scotty. Why don't you come along, Scotty? How's your chance when you can ride back? I reckon I'll stay here. Got enough grub to last a while. Outfit's still in good shape. But if you ever come this way again... Ain't too much trouble. At least you'd bring me a little burr. Man, this kind of work can't get along without one very well. We'll bring you a burr, Scotty. Don't you worry your head about that. Don't you worry about me. Deep down inside my heart, I don't think I ever believed I'd really sleep in no stone hotel. With carpets on the floor. Wear fancy store clothes. Deep down my heart, I... No, it wouldn't, I guess. Well, bye, boys. Thank you. Pleasant ride to you. So long, Scotty. Bye, Scotty. Did you ever wonder where the soft, soothing melodies of cowboy songs originated? Well, according to a legend of the Old West, many of them grew from the cowpuncher's efforts to soothe and reassure the herd of cattle over which he stood guard through the long nights. Range cattle were especially nervous at night, and to guard against a stampede, the cowboy would sing a low, quiet song or a ballad to let the cattle know that a friendly guardian was close by. The bakers of Weber's Bread enjoy recreating the atmosphere of the Old West on the All-Star Western Theater, just as they take pride in supplying your neighborhood with delicious Weber's bread. Weber's bread is good bread and has long been favored because of its firm, even texture and distinctive flavor. Serve Weber's bread for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and for in-between snacks. You'll like it. Look for that good Weber's bread in the familiar blue gingham wrapper next time you visit your neighborhood grocery. Every week, the writers of the Purple Sage and I choose what we believe is a truly great song of the West. And this week, we've chosen Twilight on the Trail. Here it is. When it's twilight on the trail And I jog along The world is like a dream And the ripple the scream is my soul When it's twilight on the trail And I rest once more 
Theater, a VM Bear production starring America's great Western singers, Boy Willing and the Riders of the Purple Sage. The script was by Ray Wilson, direction by Tom Hargis. This is Terry O'Sullivan speaking. This program came to you from Columbia Square. KNX Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. Story of the violence that moved west with young America. Story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Got it. Almost. Ah, there it is, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, a little piece of lead, just as we thought. You see? Now, that took you long enough, Doc. Now, nah, don't you blame me. You should have come here before. People never do go to a doctor until the last minute. I've carried that lead in my leg for over a year, Doc. It never did bother me any. The only reason I came up here today is because you weren't busy and I didn't have anything else to do myself. Aren't you through yet? No, I'm not through yet. I'm looking for my needle. I've got to take a couple of stitches in it first. <laughs> oh, yes. And if you're <laughs> talking like that just to get my fee down, you're wasting your time. You know, it's when I'm not busy that I'm poor and I have to charge more. Oh, ah, there. Now, that ought to hold you fine. Not much of a wound. It let it work right up next to the skin. I could have cut it out myself. Yeah, but you didn't. And <laughs> it's going to cost you $5. Five dollars? Well, you're the only patient I've had today. I've got to make out somehow. Oh, hand me my pants, Doc. How is he, Doc? Oh, he'll live, Chester. Worse luck. Uh, say, there's a fellow in the office downstairs who wants to see you, Mr. Dillon. Oh, so who is it, Chester? Uh, he didn't say. All right. I'm ready. Uh, we'll finish our discussion at supper, if you like, Doc. Well, there's nothing to discuss, but I'll eat with you anyhow. <laughs> Thanks. See you later. Are you Marshal Dillon? I am. 
My name's Parker. I'm a special deputy representing the New Mexico Stock Raisers New Association. New Mexico? Of course. Haven't you heard of the association? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've heard of it. I was just thinking you're a long way from home, aren't you? Perhaps. Marshal, I have a warrant here for the arrest of Dane Shaw. Dane Shaw. I never heard of that name around here. We'll let the marshal handle this, if you don't mind. Oh, we will, huh? Well, now, you're a pretty high and mighty for just a... Just a Easy, doggone... Chester, easy. Here's the warrant, marshal. Who issued this, Mr. Parker? We had Judge Blant of Santa Fe issue it. You had him issue it? Well, no. What I mean is we, uh... Well... Uh, uh read it. Read it. Yeah. Uh... It's got the judge's name on it and a seal. That looks okay to me. What makes you think this Dane Shaw's in Dodge? I didn't say I thought he was in Dodge. You're the one looking for help, mister, not me. It's a warrant and you're a marshal. And we think Dane Shaw may be in or near Tascosa. Tascosa? That's a long ride from here, Mr. Parker. Isn't there someone closer than I am? No, I was told to deliver the warrant here. I see. Oh, what's this show wanted for, anyway? Rustling, murder, banditry. All of that? He once rode with Billy the Kid. Does that explain it? Not quite, Mr. Parker. We hold those men equally responsible. Every one of them. We? The Stock Raisers Association. And others. Ah, I see. Now, you say Shaw once rode with a kid. You mean he isn't still with him? Shaw left the gang just two years ago. Who told you he did? Pat Garrett. Pat Garrett? Well, if he said so, it's probably true. We've got to put a stop to that gang, Marshal. New Mexico is like an armed camp till we do. But Shaw isn't with a kid anymore. He's of the same breed. And he'll be back, maybe with his own gang. Yeah, that's possible. In any case, the man's wanted and you have the warrant. Why don't you come down to Tascosa with us, Mr. Parker? No, no, that's not my job. I'll wait right here in Dodge. Yeah, I thought so. Any idea what Dane Shaw looks like? Six feet, black hair, about 180 pounds. That's not much help. Anything else? They say he has a knife scar across his ribs on the left side. Well, that's something. Where's he from? Who knows where any of those men come from? They all lie, anyway. Why, they say Billy the Kid claims to have been born in New York. Or well, maybe he was. Oh, nonsense. How do you know? Well, I was born in New York, for one thing. And you couldn't both have come from the same town. I'd hate to think so, Marshal. <clears throat> all right, Mr. Parker, you keep nice and cozy here in Dodge, and we'll ride down to Tascosa for you. Oh, Marshal, I don't think that's quite called, Chester. Chester. Go get our horses. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Tascosa lay on the Canadian River, a couple of hard days' ride south. Until recently, it had been a Comanchero trading point. Now it was mostly a center for cattle thieves looking for a place to spend their money. I hadn't been there for several years, and when we rode in, I was surprised to see how much the town had grown. Well, at least they got some trees down here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, and a couple of new buildings under them, Chester. It looks like there's another one being started. Mm, it's going to be a big one, too. Doesn't look like a house, though. I wonder what it is. Oh, we can ask in the saloon over there. <laughs> the Red Deer, that's a pretty fancy name. Maybe we can find out if there are any respectable citizens in this town. There don't seem to be anybody here at all, sir, respectable or otherwise. Hello. Oh. I sure could use a drink, Mr. Dillon. Well, I figure we've earned one. Gentlemen, what'll it be? Beer. Oh, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> one beer, one whiskey. Right. There, now. That's the best-looking thing I've seen yet in this town. Here's how. 
Uh, Tascosa's changed some. <coughs> you been here before? Yeah, some time ago. Uh, what's the new building they're putting up? Hmm? Oh, that's going to be a schoolhouse. A schoolhouse? In Tascosa? Yes, few men have moved into town with their families. Kids need a school, so it was Nat, of course, got it organized. Nat? Nat Temple, he owns the Red Deer here. Oh, I see, I see. He uh, must be sort of a leading citizen here, then, huh? In most ways, I suppose he is. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'd like to talk to him. Where is he? Out back, building the fence. Door's right there. Oh, thanks. There's your money. See you later. Sure. Mr. Temple? Matt Temple. I'm Matt Dillon, and uh, this is Chester Proudfoot. I'm glad to know you. Barkeep told us that we'd find you out here. Yes, yeah, Mike Parsley. He's a good boy. I gathered from him that uh, you are the right fellow to come to, Mr. Temple. What can I do for you? Well, uh, I'm looking for a man. You are? Why? I'm U.S. Marshal, Dodge City. We... Don't get the law down here often, Marshal. No. Man I'm looking for is Dane Shaw. Do you know him? Nobody by that name around here. Oh, I expect he's changed his name. Well, and how are you going to tell him from anybody else? Uh, he's six foot tall, black hair, weighs 180 pounds. Could be most anybody that built. He's got a scar across his ribs. It isn't often you see a man without a shirt, Marshal. What you want it for? He used to ride with Billy the Kid. He... Quit, but they think he might be planning to return to New Mexico with a different bunch, one of his own, maybe. Then it'd be better to stop him now, if that's true. Oh, I agree. That's why I'm here. Well, wish I could help you, Marshal. What are you going to do? Uh, I don't know. Stay around for a day or so, I guess. Maybe I'll hear something. Fine. You know, it'd be too bad since that fella quit the kid if he went back to the same old outlaw life. Sure. But he probably will. Men don't often change. Some do, if they get the chance. Take Mike Postlin there, the, the barkeep. No? What about it? Uh, Mike used to carry a gun for Harry Gunter. Gunter calls himself a rancher down here, but he spreads a mighty big loop. You mean he's really a cattle rustler? Yeah, everybody knows it, but nobody's proved it yet. And one reason was because of Mike. He sort of kept everybody off Gunter. How? Mike Postle's pretty fast with a gun. I see how come he's tending bar for you, Temple? Well, I'll tell you. He had decided himself to stop working for Gunner, and one night he was telling me about it, and I helped him decide the rest of the way. Ah. And then you gave him a job, huh? That's right, Marshal. He'll make out fine if Gunner lets him alone. Well, that was decent of you, Temple. I hope it works. But being a lawman, I suppose you don't think it will. <laughs> Well, a lawman isn't all bone, Mr. Temple. Lawman could arrest Mike Postle right now for what he's done. You can't arrest everybody. But anyway, if I were handling it, I'd go after the head man, Gunner. <laughs> they don't seem to think you're way over in New Mexico. Well, I hear Pat Garrett's after Billy right now, and you'll get him with any luck at all. Pat's a good manhunter. Maybe. But they also want this fellow Dane Shaw. Yeah, there's a warrant for him signed in Santa Fe. Yeah. If Pat does stop Billy, there's no point in letting Shaw come back with a new gang. If that's what he aims to do. Well, he might have it in mind. Well, Marshal, that's your problem. Right now, come on inside and have a drink on the house. Oh, thanks, Mr. Temple. It'll be a pleasure. And then I'll tell you where you can get something to eat. Won't poison you. Well, say now, I think I'm going to like Tesco after all. Sure you are. Pretty good turkey, Mr. Dillon. You should have tried it. And they must have a Chinese cook in that place. It's better than the usual feed trough in a town like this. Mm. Yeah, let's sit here a while, Chester. All right. Just think, Mr. Yeah. Dillon. Someday Tascosa may be as big as St. Louis. 
I doubt that, Chester. Well, as big as Dodge, then. Uh, that's a little more likely. Ah, here come some citizens now. They sure are. Looking for trouble, and ain't even dark yet. Yeah, maybe they just want to cut the dust in those roads, Chester. Mean-looking bunch, if you ask me. I'll do the talking, man. Okay, Gunner, we're behind you. If he ain't in here, we'll find him. Did he say Gunter? Yeah, I did, Chester. Come on, let's watch this. Over here, Chester. Yes, sir. You come here for a drink, gentlemen? No, Postle, we didn't come here for no drink. And state your business, Gunter. You're the first man ever walked out on me, Postle. I don't like it, and I don't aim to tolerate it. That all? There's two reasons you're coming back. I'm not interested in your reasons, Gunter. One is I need your gun. I'm through selling my gun. And the other is you know too much about my business. Your business is your affair, Gunter. You know I don't talk. Maybe. But you're still coming back. That's so? Which one of you is going to bring me back? You're pretty handy with that six-shooter of yours, Postal. Ain't any one of us fool enough to go against you. That's about what I figured. But you can't shoot the whole bunch of us. Don't sure try hard. Then you'll die trying. I'm telling you, Post will be back in camp a day after tomorrow. We ride in after you. Wait a minute, Gunner. What do you want, Timber? You caused enough trouble already. It ain't true yet. Gunner, if you come back here, you'll have to face me. No, Timber, no. Shut up, Mike. Now, just remember that, Gunner. I'll be here, too. And you'll both die. Come on, men. Who are those two? I never seen it before. That's a couple of grub line riders, I guess. Let's go up to the bar, Chester. Mm -hmm. Now you've seen him, Marshal. That's Harry Gunner. Oh, Gunner's not my business, but uh, I wish you luck with him. Mike and me will face him down. I'll face him, Temple, not you. No. I helped get you in this. By heaven, I'll see you through it. It's not your fight, I tell you. It's my fight. I believe any man who wants to make a change deserves all the back and anyone can give him. I'll see you get it. You'll just be killed for nothing. Besides, you're a married man. Being married has nothing to do with it. Maybe we'll both be killed, but that's better than giving in to a man like Gunter. Mike, I never told you going straight was easy. You should have been a preacher, Temple. I'm going to get my supper now. I'll be back again. <laughs> I'd make a fine preacher, I would. But if business don't pick up some here, maybe I'll have to give it a try. Well, the town's growing, Temple. Business ought to be good. Well, it's growing, Marshal, a little at a time. <laughs> when I first came here, there wasn't more than a couple of adobe huts in the whole place. When was that, Temple? Oh, when you first came here. One year and nine months exactly, Marshal. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got work to do. Let's get some air, Chester. All right. He's a mighty nice fellow, that Nat Timble, isn't he? I, I mean, willing to back up Mike Postle that way. He, he's a man of his word. And, and building a new school and all that. Married, too. Funny thing, Mr. Dillon, I can't quite figure out if you like Timble. I like him fine, Chester. Only his name isn't Timble. What? It's Dane Shaw. He's the man we're looking for. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, tomorrow night on most of these same stations, 
CBS Radio presents Dick Powell in the role of Richard Diamond, private detective. Remember, Richard Diamond, private detective, calls on you via CBS Radio tomorrow night. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. The idea of taking a man like Nat Timble in and sending him back to New Mexico to face a jury of scared and vengeful cattlemen didn't sit too well with me. Anyway, I decided I had to wait it out at least until Harry Gunter made his play. Two days, Gunter had said. And the night before the final day, Temple asked Chester and me to a little dance they were having to celebrate the start of the new schoolhouse. And there we met Ms. Tremble, a fine-looking woman with a strong face and steady blue eyes. If you'd like some punch, gentlemen, my husband's serving it right over there. Uh, yes, I might enjoy Samson, little man. I'll be right back. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? Huh? Oh, my goodness. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. I'd also enjoy fetching you a cup of that punch. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chester, but I'll have some later. Well, sure, ma'am. Any time. I... Uh, I'll be right back. I'd uh, be foolish not to take advantage of your husband's being busy, Miss Kimball. Would uh, you do me the honor? No offense, Marshal, but I'd rather get a breath of air outside. Why, certainly, ma'am. Would you accompany me? <laughs> Why, of course. Nice evening. You think it'll hold, Marshal? Oh, it won't rain. Not for the next couple of days, anyway. That's not exactly what I meant. I was wondering how nice tomorrow evening will be. I, uh, afraid I don't quite follow, ma'am. After Harry Gunter and his gang ride in. Oh. Well, now, I wouldn't worry about that, Miss Timble. My it's, husband's uh... involved, Marshal. I'm bound to worry. Of course. It's not that I don't want him to back Mike Postle and fight alongside him. He's got to do that. But I don't want him killed. He's the finest man that ever lived, Marshal. Yeah, sure, sure, Miss Timber. He believes that a man's got a right to change. And he's willing to die for that. I know. Tell me, do you think he's right, Marshal Dillon? In spite of what the law might say, do you think he's right? I think he's right, ma'am. I had a feeling you would. But, uh, maybe things will work out all right tomorrow. Maybe everything will be fine. I hope so, Marshal. Anyway, I'll bring our son up to know his father for the rare kind of man he is. Oh? I didn't know you had a son. We haven't yet. What? I haven't even told Nat. But we're going to have one, Marshal. Oh, I see. Shall we go in now? And I'll be your partner for the next dance, if you like. What? I'd be proud, Miss Kimball. Real proud. Next morning early, Chester and I saddled up and rode out past the edge of town to the south. There we pulled off the trail into a clump of scrub cedar and waited. Beyond us lay the Canadian River, and across it broad Vegas of spring-fed meadow grass. As we watched, a buffalo, cow, and calf came to the river and drank. And then they suddenly moved off upstream and disappeared in the mesquite. And a moment later, six horsemen came out of the distance, riding hard for the river and for Tascosa. I reckon that's them, Mr. Dillon. You, uh, don't have to do this, Chester. I know it. Any objections to me using a rifle? There are no rules in this game. I'll feel a mite cozier behind the wind, Chester. Eyes open, Chester. Yes. Come on. Hold it, Gunner. Oh, who are you? I'm a U.S. 
Court Martial. My name's Matt Dillon. Them the fellows we saw with Bum's gunner the other day at the Red Deer. Yeah. Get off the trail, Marshal. You got no business with us. Turn around and ride back where you came from, Gunner. Mike Postel's staying in Tascosa. Postel, eh? So you're in on this, too. I've dealt myself in, Gunner. Now do as I say. And keep away from Tascosa from now on, or I'll get a posse and come after the bunch of you. <laughs> we don't need any lawmen down here, Marshal. Who's that? It's Kimball and Mike, Mr. Dillon. How did they know we were out here? Looks like we won't have to go into Tascosa, Marshal. We can settle this right here. You were missing this morning, Marshal. I kind of figured we'd find you here, boss. You and Timbo both ought to stay out of this. This is my trouble. It's a little late for that now, Postal. Well, the odds are down, Gunner. They sure are. I ain't facing all them. Come on, Gunner. We'll catch Postal later when the rain hits the clock. There we are. Not me. I'm going. Shut up. Timbo, you're responsible for this. I'm proud of it, Gunner. Get him and Postal, men. Get the Stop it, Gunner! Should we go after them three? No, let them go, Chester. They won't be back. Now, Temple's been hit. How is he, Marshal? Yeah, he got hit bad. Chester, go see if Gunter and those other two are really dead. Yes, sir. I told him not to come along. He wouldn't listen to me. Here, let me pick him up and get him back to town. No. No, it's, uh, it's no use. He's done for, Apostle. Are you sure? He was dead before he hit the ground. We finished him, sir. All three of them. It'd take more than three of them to be worth that temple. I'm sorry, Apostle. Done enough for me already. Why do you have to come here? This was my fight, not his. No, Apostle, not the way he looked at it. You see, Timble himself went straight a couple of years back. He did? Yeah. I came down here carrying a warrant for his arrest. You ain't going to be able to take him in now, are you, Marshal? No, no, I'm not. You know, I'm kind of mixed up about you. Coming down here to arrest him and then meeting Gunner and them out here today. I'm not important, Postle. Just you remember what kind of man Temple was. I ain't likely to forget. I'll swear to that, Marshal. Good. Uh, look, you and Chester stay here. I'll send a wagon out from town. I, uh, I'm going in to see Ms. Temple. You'll be going back to Dodge now, Marshal? Yes, ma'am, I, I will. I want to thank you for trying to stop it. It's my job. No, not quite. Well, I guess Mike will have to run things now. He's a good man. He'll make out fine. Sure. Tell me one thing, Marshal. Yes, ma'am. I know you came here to arrest my husband. I figured you did. If this hadn't happened today, would you really have taken him back? <sighs> Miss Temple, I, I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. If I had, it would have been my last act as a lawman. You mean you'd have quit after? I'd have quit. If you're around Tascosa again, Marshal, come and see us. Me and the baby. I, I'd be proud to, ma'am. Real proud.
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner and Tom Tully, with Harry Bartell, Paul Dubov, Helen Cleave, and James M- Nusser. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tennessee and Virginia are the home states for CBS Radio's Saturday Night Country Style just a bit later tonight. That's where the rural rhythm's coming from, but it's going out all over the country on most of these same stations. This is George Walsh speaking, and remember, you'll find Western Adventure and Music with Gene Autry Sunday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. Horse of the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high of silver, the Lone Ranger. The wild and untamed west of yesteryear lives once again as the famous Lone Ranger urges his great horse, Silver, down the trail to new adventure. He has a stirring action drama for us now. So make way for those silver shot hoops and thrill to a story of the phantom figure of the plains. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver, old boy. There is up ahead. We're coming, Tonto. In the first scene of our Lone Ranger drama, we see two horsemen racing their mounts over a backcountry trail just north of the Rio Grande and east of El Paso. Where they're beaten and disreputable, they carry the stamp of outlaws on their hard features. These parts are getting too civilized for us, Mike. They're always beefing about something. Yeah, it ain't only me. It's the rest of the boys, too. I'm giving orders and you're taking them. But you got to admit that rustling don't pay no more. It's too hard to get rid of the cattle afterwards. There's going to be a new stagecoach line from Paso Doble to Dalton. They'll carry gold. Hey, what about it? I said gold. Oh, hold up for me. The country's too open. Ain't no cover in the whole 30 miles. They start operating in a week. Hey, look at that creek we're coming to. Are you sure there's a ford? Must be. Well, let's try it out first. Uh, what are you afraid of? Quicksand? I don't take any chances. I don't have to. All right. Oh, boy. Oh. 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 What are you getting off for? Talking about quicksand, you got me nervous. Well? I'll try it out with a rock. Come on, come on. That sand gobbled up that rock like it was hungry. Yeah? Deep, too. Maybe if we go... How deep? What? The creek. About ten feet. Think a stage could get to the other side? Nah. Listen, Butch. You can start spending that gold from Paso Doble. What's the stage got to do with the creek? Plenty. The stage is going to take this road. I know. It follows the main road straight to Dalton. It won't after we fix up the signpost at the crossing. The signpost? That's what I said. It's a new route and the drivers will be dependent on them a lot. Especially at night. Yeah. What's more, will be on the night stage they carry the gold. Mike, I got to hand it to you. We'll be ready for them on the first run. Come on. The boys will be plenty glad to hear about this. Get up there. You do it. Get up. Get up. a great deal of activity in front of the express office in Paso Doble. The night stage was being made ready for its first run to Dalton. In the dark shadow of the building, the Lone Ranger and his faithful Indian companion, Tonto, were watching the preparations. There, Buck, now. Yes, Tonto, coming this way. Him drive stage? That's right. Him not crook now, huh? He never was a real crook, Kimasabe. Only the victim of bad companions. 
He gave me his promise to go straight when we helped him out of that scrape in Sonora. Well, I knew he'd keep his word. Not good. Take the horses back away. I want to congratulate him on his new job. Oh. Stranger. Hello, Buck. Gosh, mister. I never thought I'd see you again. I'm keeping my promise, though. Look, that's my stage. They gave me the job driving. I know, Buck. Congratulations. Did you have anything to do with it? Why do you ask? Well, I heard about the new line. That's why I headed over here. But nobody listened to me when I asked for a job. And then all of a sudden, it was different. The marshal stopped me on the street one day. He asked me a few questions, and then he took me over to the express agent. In five minutes, it was all settled. I'm glad. Have you been in town since I got here? Yes, Buck. I wanted you to have your chance. I thought so. I'll never be able to thank you enough. Just do your job and do it well. You don't have to worry. I'm going to be the best stagecoach driver in the Southwest. I'm sure of it. What's more, I'm going to get married and settle down. Oh, look over yonder. You see that girl stepping into the stage? Yes. That's Betty Stevens. Oh, yes. Her father owns a general store in Dalton, doesn't he? That's right. She's been over here visiting her aunt. We're going to be married next week. Hey, Buck, come on. We're ready to start. Who's that man? Butch Larson. He's the guard. You know him? I believe I do. Come on! Right away! Well, goodbye, mister. The best of luck. I may see you in Dalton. <laughs> Be right with you, Butch. Are you comfortable, Betty? I'm fine. You'll be in Dalton before you know it. Uh, give me a hand up, Butch. Sure. Bow stowed away? We're all set. Right. Get up. Get up there. Come on. Get up. An hour after the stage had started its journey, Black Mike and his gang of outlaws were lying in ambush near the quicksand ford at Salter's Creek. (laughs) What are you laughing about? A butch getting a job as guard on the stage. There ain't a chance of things going wrong now. We got the signpost changed all right. Yeah. We'll see the stage any minute. What do we do after butch knocks the driver out and stops it? I told you once. You and a couple men ride down there. Get the passengers out and take them into Dalton. Then report to the sheriff. And you and the boys unload the gold, cut the horses loose, and drive the stage into the creek. That's it. The stage will be underwater. It'll sink in the quicksand. And the express company will figure the gold went with it. It's a slick scheme. Hey, Mike. The stage is coming down the road. Over the hill, men. Get your horses out of sight. You stay here, Jake. Yeah. Don't treat any of the passengers rough. They gotta think you're trying to help them. I got you, boss. Out of sight. Get away before the stage gets here. This road don't look familiar. Sure it does. Can't fool me about this country. I think we took the wrong turn back at the fork. The arrow was pointing this way. I'm going to pull up. Not yet. We're doing Dalton in an hour. Going to be late on your first run? We might be later if we keep going. There's a creek up ahead. That proves we're right. That proves we're wrong. There ain't no creek on the main road. Oh, here we go, friends. I got you covered. What's the idea? I'll show you. Why, you dirty double cross. <laughs> That settles him. Oh, go there. Oh, there. Oh, there. What's the matter? The bridge is out. Hey, driver, the bridge is out. I can see that. Is it too deep to get through? Yeah. Quick sand bottom besides. Any passengers inside? Uh, Two. A man and a girl. Will you give them a lift into town? Sure thing. Get them passengers out, boys. Everything's set. Good. How about the driver? Had to knock him out. He ain't come to yet. Here, I lift him on your horse. No. Mike and the rest of the gang will be along in a minute. You're supposed to wait for him here. The driver goes back to camp. Buck, where are you? Maybe the girl will cause trouble. Not for long. No rough stuff. I got my orders. I gotta hurry, though. See you later. Buck! He's all right, ma'am. He just don't want to leave the stage. We're going to take you into Dalton. That same night, the Lone Ranger and Tonto were riding along the main road to Dalton. 
Suddenly, the masked man reined in his great white horse. Go, go, Silver! Go, 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 go. Why? Why we stop here? That signpost. The arrow points along the other road. Oh, that's wrong. I know it. We'd better investigate. Come on, Get Silver. Get white fellow. This road goes south. I'm wondering if Buck could have taken it by mistake. Quick, Sam, quick. One mile. No bridge. It's less than a mile. The moon's out now. We'll be able to see it at the top of the next rise. Get up, white fellow. I suspect that the guard on the stage is an outlaw tunnel. He may have had a partner who changed the signpost. Ah. It's Buck's first run. He doesn't know the country very well. Maybe him in trouble. I'm afraid so. Oh, 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 oh. There's the stage. Ah. Many men there. What them do? They seem to be unloading something. The gold, perhaps. We help them? Our help isn't wanted. Look. They run hedging the horses and pushing the stage into the stream. That's right. And then they're going to head south. I'm sure of it. Butch and those men are outlaws. Hi, oh, Silver! Away! The stage is almost underwater. Me, see him. We must get it out somehow. Right, Tuttle. Every minute counts. Stage horses run away. Yes, we might overtake them, but there's more important work to be done here. Oh, Silver! Oh, 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 oh. We must make sure the gold has been stolen. Uh, not safe go out there. It isn't far from shore. I might be able to jump it. Oh, this ground soft. I have to make sure. No, me climb tree. Tree? Oh, I see. You can work your way out on that limb and drop onto the coach. It's almost directly underneath. Here, I'll give you a lift up. Uh, me. Climb up there. Uh. You'll find the gold in the baggage compartment. Uh, me, no. Try that limb. Make sure that it'll hold your weight. Uh, it, it's strong. That's good. Take it easy, Kimosabe. Box open. Can you see if the gold's gone? Mm, not, not yet. Easy. Box empty. That's all we need to know. Me drop on coach? No, come back. There's work to be done. We follow outlaw? Not yet. If that stage show sinks into the quicksand, we can never prove the theft. It's sinking deeper every minute. What what we do? Silver has never failed us yet, Tonto. I have a plan. Listen. It was an hour later when the three outlaws, headed by Jake, rode into Dalton with Betty and the other passenger from the coach. They headed straight for the sheriff's home. What do you want with the sheriff? I got a report what's happened to the stage. There's nothing happened to it. He just can't get through. Well, there's gold on board. And there's outlaws riding the range. Outlaws? But here tell there is. Then Buck may be in danger. Tell the sheriff to hurry. The sheriff will hurry all right when I get through talking to him. Jake Winters! Boy, what do you want this time of night? I'm just a call hand, Sheriff, but I want to report a robbery. What's that? Leastways, it may be a robbery. Me and my two buddies were riding along by Salters Creek, and we saw the stagecoach from Paso Doble was drawn up by the side of the road. What was the stage doing near Salters Creek? I guess the driver and the guard had a scheme to steal the gold on board. Steal the gold? Yeah. We rode up and asked what was the matter, but both of them pulled guns on us. They told us to take the passengers into town and keep our mouths shut. The guard and the driver, huh? That's right. We did like we was told, but I looked back as we were riding toward the shallows, and they were driving the stage into the creek. Trying to afford it. Well, maybe. I figured different. The driver's name was Buck. I heard Buck them call... Newton. That reform gunman the express company hired. I told Higgins it was a mistake, and this proves it. Yeah. Thanks, Zeke. I'm going to round up a posse and get Buck Newton dead or alive. <laughs> Now to continue our story. You will recall that in the first act of tonight's Lone Ranger drama, a band of outlaws thought of a scheme to steal the gold carried over the new stage route to Dalton. Signposts were changed, leading the stage into the quicksands of Salter's Creek. Three of the outlaws posed as cowboys, 
and took the passengers on to Dalton. The sheriff received word that the stage had been wrecked and organized a posse to ride out after the outlaws. Our next scene opens in the outlaws' camp. The stage driver has been bound and gagged and placed near the campfire. Mike, the leader of the band is speaking. Any of you men still want a new boss? Not us, Mike. That gold sure looks good. We gotta hand it to you. Hey, what I'm thinking is this. We ought to keep right on moving till we hit the border. We gotta wait for Jake. Maybe when he shows up, he'll have some good news for us. Maybe we can stay here. Ain't no sense in that, Mike. I say as we wait. Uh, here's Jake now. Steady, steady, boy. Did you talk with the sheriff? Just like you told me to. Did he believe you? Sure did. He organized a posse, rode back to Crick. The stage had sunk into the quicksand just like we figured. There wasn't ev- any evidence against anybody. That make you feel any better, Butch? You could see the stage underwater, couldn't you? Not a trace. Yeah, funny it should go down so fast. Tell him the rest of it, Jake. You mean about Buck? Yeah. Well, I told the sheriff that Buck had driven us away from the stage at the point of a gun and then run it into Crick. At first, he took my word for it that Buck was a crook. But he got thinking on the way to Salter's. And he allowed that maybe Buck was only trying to ford. <laughs> I gave him an argument at first. Then I allowed that maybe he was right. Maybe. Yeah. The sheriff's plumb convinced the two men couldn't have made off with all that gold by themselves. He figures it sunk down the quicksand with a coach. There ain't no other way to look at it. But if anybody starts getting suspicious, Buck's the one who'll get the blame. And Buck ain't going to show up in Dalton for a long, long time. <laughs> we don't have to worry about nothing. Maybe we can make a little more money if we stick around here. What do you mean? They'll be sending another coast from Paso Doble tomorrow night. You can't pull the same trick twice, Mike. Why not? Well, for one thing, the driver won't take the wrong turn. He'll be warned about it. Listen, we'll do it a little different. What if we stop the coast before it gets to the crossroads? Yeah? We make the guard and driver prisoners just like we did to Buck and you. Then two of the boys drive the coast down the creek and into the quicksand. Well, wait a minute. You I... wait. We unload the gold before when the coach sinks, there ain't no evidence. There ain't nothing to see. But if it happens twice, the sheriff will know there's something wrong. He'll start hunting for Buck. <laughs> but he won't find him. How'd you like a trip to Mexico, Buck? Let's get rid of him right now. Now, Jake, he's going to do a little job for us. It's this way. Just in case somebody should see us hold up the stage, Buck's going to be out in front. And he won't be wearing a mask. <laughs> The morning following our last scene, a group of men were standing in front of the sheriff's office in Dalton. Betty Stevens pushed her way through the crowd. Let me see, I've got to see the sheriff. Sheriff, look what's coming down the road. It's it's a covered wagon. Covered wagon? Nothing. That's a stage. The day coach isn't due from Paso Doby until this afternoon. It's the night coach. The one that got stuck in the quicksand. Buck got it out. Maybe he's driving it. There's two men in the box. One of them's an engine. And the other man is mad. Don't shoot. Stand out in the center of the road, men. We gotta stop him. Miss Miss Strong Lane. He's planning to stop anything. Halt in the name of the law. Hey, boys, get up there. Hey, what time you again, sir? Who are you? I'm sending this coach over to you as evidence. Only outlaws wear masks. If you'll investigate the baggage compartment at the rear, you'll find that it's been broken open. That's right, Sheriff. Ain't nothing in it at all. And the gold was stolen after all. Yes. What have you done with it? The gold was gone when my friend and I found the coach in the quicksand. You're an outlaw, and I'm holding you for the robbery. You'd better listen to me first. Why should I come to you if I were guilty of a crime? I don't know about that. We're going to lock you up and ask questions afterwards. You won't keep us locked up for long. Oh, 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 oh. It's Marty Sheridan, the marshal from Paso Doble. You're just in time, Marshal. What's going on here? We just caught the outlaw that stole the gold last You're night. You're wrong. Well, he just come driving up in the coach and the gold is gone. The gold belonged to the United States government. The United States government's taking charge of the case. Let go of that man. You're interfering with justice. Oh, no, I ain't. I've already had a talk with him. You wouldn't be so concerned up at him if he was riding his own horse, Sheriff. We ain't going to lock him up. We're going to take orders from him. Start talking, stranger. The 
the Lone Ranger, backed by the authority of the United States Marshal, made plans for the capture of the outlaws. The sheriff and his posse followed the masked man's orders. That night, they rode down the stage trail with the Lone Ranger in the lead. It's about time you told us where we're going, stranger. He's the one in command, Sheriff. Ain't no harm in asking where we're headed. We're heading for the crossroads. You sure the outlaws are going to hold up the stage there? Yes. Then all you have to do is point them out to me and I'll do the rest. We'll only watch the whole up, Sheriff. What's that? There'll be plenty of time to attack later when we get all the evidence. What's more, we got to get back that first ship from the gold. They won't be carrying it with them. Get up, get up there, Pete. Get up there. Benny, what are you doing here? You didn't think I'd stay at home and Buck was in danger, did you? This ain't no woman's work. It won't do no good to tell me to go back, Sheriff. I'm riding with you. Tell your men to pull up. We can watch the crossroads from this hill. Oh, Silver. Oh, 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 there. there they are, hiding in that gully. It's a good thing there's a full moon. We can see everything. They're wearing masks. One of them isn't. Oh. Quiet, Betty. Ain't that the stage coming down the road? Sure it is. The outlaws got it spotted, too. See? They're stepping out in the road. That ain't the new stage. No. I thought your Indian friend drove it back to Paso Doble so it could make the night run. I had a better idea, Marshal. It's Buck Newton out in front of the outlaws. Sure looks like him. Can't be. Ain't no doubt about it. This is all the evidence we need. Buck is not an outlaw. I can't hide, ain't I? Maybe we made a mistake about Buck, stranger. No, Marshal. Man! Don't give any orders yet, Sheriff. Why not? They strapped the coach. They tying the driver and the guard. They're unloading the gold from the back. We can't stand by and watch a hold up. You can't accuse an innocent man either. Look closer. Look at that man standing behind Buck. He has him covered. It's true. He's a prisoner. I ain't so sure. You will be. They're driving the stage down the creek road. That's Buck who's got the rain. We've seen all we want to see here. Tell your men to follow me. And let them outlaws escape. There's no time to lose now, Sheriff. Follow me. Kyle Silver! Well, Buck, you dirty... Don't get mad, boy. I ain't gonna kill these horses. I ain't gonna drive them into that quicksand. Maybe you're hankering to get killed yourself. I heard you talking last night. You're gonna kill me before you start for the border anyway. Whoa there, whoa. Whoa, whoa there. What's the idea? Whoa. Slow enough. Keep him covered, boss. I gotta take the reins. Get up there. Get up. Get up there. He heard us talking. I'll finish him off now. No, you don't. I'm sitting too close for comfort. Go on, shoot. We don't want to leave him lying near Dalton either. Somebody might find him and follow our trail. We won't be able to travel fast with all that gold. All right. Just that up ahead in front of the creek. It's a wagon. It's my stage. They pulled it out. I can't stop. The brake. It don't work. We're going to crash. Pull over on the side. Too late. I'm going to jump. Get away. Windy, boss. Yeah, get on a horse and make tracks for camp. Right. Are you hurt, Roach? Are you hurt? Uh, no, my leg. I can't stand up. Uh, uh, my uh, horse. Uh, uh, hang on. Uh, get up there. Get up. That stage. The sheriff and his men must have raised it today. It ain't possible. Uh, we saw it, didn't we? Maybe they followed our trail to camp. We shouldn't have left the goal there. Yeah, we couldn't take it with us. Back to camp, men. And don't spare the horses! There it is! Ain't nobody been here yet. We know better about when we get to dig up the gold. Oh, oh boy, oh boy. Oh, oh. Now, boss. I buck up to a tree. And it saved time if we took care of him right away. And yeah, the gold comes first. Dig it up. Mm, it's safe, all right. They wouldn't have bothered filling up the hole. Yeah. Light a fire so we can see better. Hey! Bring Buck over here. Yeah. Who's that shooting? They came from the woods. Another one. That came from the south. They come here. You rode straight into a trap, Mike. Put up your hands. Nobody's going to catch me without a fight. 
You ain't got a chance, Mike. I know that boy. I'll take care of you before I... Oh, my arm! Good shooting, stranger. We ain't got a chance, boss. They got us surrounded. They can see us and we can't see them. We got to surrender. Don't shoot anymore. You yellow rats. I'm going to fight it out. Not with that arm. Come on, mister. They're all reaching for the sky. There are your men, Sheriff. You'll find the gold over by that tree where they've started to dig. We might never have located it if we hadn't followed your directions. I've got to hand it to you, stranger. Fixing the brakes on the coach made him crash and head back for camp in a hurry, huh? Uh, round him up, men. Take our suit and Thanks, mister. I figured I was on my way to the happy hunting ground. Another few minutes and I guess We'd I acted any sooner, Buck. You might have been arrested as an outlaw. What's that? We were watching that hold up at the crossroads. It sure looked bad. Mike had a gun sticking in my ribs every minute, Marshal. You're in the clear now. Of course, a lot of it was my fault. I never should have been fooled by that sign pointing the wrong way. Well, I guess I won't be driving any more stages in this part of the country. Think you'll lose your job, eh? Can't miss. Think again, son. After tonight, you might even get a raise. A raise? Mm Mm-hmm, as a sort of wedding present. Oh, Buck, you see. Oh, sure I am, honey. And did you hear what the marshal was saying? Maybe I'll get a raise from the express company as a wedding present. We owe it all to that mess, man. That's right. I want to invite him to... Hey, he's leaving. Hold on now. Come along there, Silver, old boy. Justice is needed in El Dorado. Hello, Silver. Slaughter's my name. Luke Slaughter. Cattle's my business. It's a tough business. It's big business. I got a big stake in it. And there's no man west of the Rio Grande big enough to take it from me. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. Civil War cavalryman turned Arizona cattleman. Across the territory, from Yuma to Port Defiance, from Flagstaff to the Huachucas, and below the border through Chihuahua and Sonora, his name was respected or feared, depending on which side of the law you were on. Man of vision, man of legend, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. Ten pounds of dust this last couple of weeks. Won't be much longer, Jim. With luck, we'll be in Tombstone day after tomorrow. Won't be none too soon for me. Once I get out of this saddle, I'm going to stay out of it a while. you never been to Tombstone, Jim. A couple of things you ought to know. Such as what? It'll be a pretty wild town. Oh, they got some peaceful, law-abiding citizens there, all right. They've also got some of the toughest drifters in the world. Gunslingers? Yeah. So remember, you keep that itchy trigger finger of yours under control. Don't you worry none about me. Hold it. <laughs> What's your matter? A little smoke coming out of that brush over there. Jim, keep the herd headed straight. Come on, Wichita, let's take a look. Right. Could be a campfire. Yeah. This is... Indian country around here, ain't it, Slaughter? Indian country, bandit country, rustler country, you name it. Well, as soon as we get up to the edge of the wash here, we... Yeah, there it is. Little campfire down near that clump of Ocotillo. The fire's out, but it's still smoking. No sign of life around. You reckon... Hold it. (laughs) Movement back there in the mesquite. All right. Come on out of there. Come out. 
I'm coming. Don't you shoot now. Who are you? My name's Ralston. He's got a leg wound, Slaughter. What are you doing here? You a marshal? No. I got into a scrape in Tombstone. I had to get out. With a souvenir in your leg, huh? It's not bad, but it slows me down. My horse got away from me last night, and I couldn't catch it. I had a hole up here. And a scrape were you in? I didn't do nothing wrong, mister. I'm innocent. I didn't ask you about that. I asked what kind of scrape. Slaughter. Yeah, I see him. Two of them. Rifles across their saddles. You think this fellow was a decoy to get us into a trap? No, no, that's not true. Wait a minute. It... One of them's wearing a badge. Yeah. I've seen him before. Taggart, sheriff from Tombstone. All right, Ralston. Just hold it right where you are. Don't try nothing. That bad leg of his, Sheriff, I doubt he's going to try much. With fugitives, I don't take no chances, stranger. Thanks for rounding him up for me. He's a fugitive, huh? He sure is. My name's Taggart. I'm the sheriff of Tombstone. It's my deputy, Blackwell. Been trailing Ralston for two days now. What's the charge? Payroll robbery. That's a lie. You keep your mouth shut, Ralston. Everybody in Tombstone knows you did it. Easy, Blackwell. He ain't going to make no trouble. We'll see to that. Payroll robbery, you say? Yeah, one of the mines. He was supposed to be guarding it. Instead, he took off with it. You got any witnesses? You got plenty of evidence. I asked you if you had any witnesses. What business is it of yours? Just a minute, Blackwell. I'm talking to Taggart. Who are you, stranger? Luke Slaughter. Slaughter. I heard of you. Supposed to be pretty fast with a gun, ain't you? It's a matter of opinion. If you ask me, it's more an opinion. I didn't ask you, Wichita. Oh, yes. You got a warrant for Ralston's arrest, Taggart. Well? Well, no time to get a warrant. That's funny. Last I heard, there was a judge right there in Tombstone. Wouldn't have taken you very long. How about you busting right across the border without any papers or anything? Slaughter, you got a bad habit of being insulted. That's a habit I'm going to break. Now? Let's take him, Taggart. Can you take both of us, Blackwell? <laughs> We've got the drop on you, Slaughter. Well, that's a matter of opinion, too, Taggart. Meaning what? Those rifles of yours are pretty clumsy at close quarters. I don't think you got the drop on me at all. Let's find out. I'm here to take my prisoner back to Tombstone. Not without a warrant. Well, now, you ain't going to Don't move that rifle the... unless you're going to use it. You got a herd out there, Slaughter. You heading for Tombstone? That's right. And I'll see you in Tombstone. It's fine with me. Come on, Blackwell. Here. Thanks, Slaughter. Thanks a lot. Get Ralston up behind you, Wichita. Let's get back to the herd. By sunset, two days later, we were in Tombstone. We herded the cattle into the pens, then we went to the Crystal Palace to collect our money from the cattle buyer, Ezra Canfield. Well, I've checked them cattle over slaughter. He's in good condition, considering the distance you brought him. Here's your money. Count it, Wichita. Right. What are your plans now, Slaughter? Heading right back to Mexico. Pick up another herd. Good. We got a lot of hungry miners here in Tombstone. Need all the beef we can get. Now, don't tell me we got to leave right away, Slaughter. I want to see the sights around here. Tombstone's not a very good town for you to be wandering around loose in, Jim. I promise you I won't get in no trouble, Slaughter. I just want to do a little living for a change. Money's all here. All right. Jim, take it back to the hotel room. Sit on it. But what about seeing the sights? We'll talk about that later. I'll get moving. All right, doggone it. <laughs> Sounds like he sure spoiled his evening, Slaughter. Well, I think we can arrange for him to get a couple of breaths of night air around here before we take off. Taggart just come in. I see him. Well, Canfield, 
Look like you ain't too particular who you do business with. There's nothing wrong with them cattle he sold me, Sheriff. I checked them myself. That ain't what I meant. I'm talking about slaughter here obstructing justice, refusing to turn over a fugitive to me. Where are you hiding Ralston now, Slaughter? You ought to know. You're the sheriff. <laughs> What's that signify? I had a little talk with Ralston on the trail. All he wanted was to be sure of getting back here in one piece to stand a fair trial. Turned himself into your night guard at the jail. You're bluffing. Well, that'll be an easy bluff to call. Why don't you go find out? I aim to. Uh, he's a pretty poor excuse for a sheriff, Slaughter. But he's all we got. Well, what do you expect? Who'd want the job? Tombstone's a rough town. Not too rough for the right man. I think you could be the right man, Slaughter. Me? Yeah. There are a lot of us around here who'd like to see law and order established once and for all, Slaughter. And we know about you. We know you can handle the worst of them. You know, that might not be such a bad idea, if you ask me. Nobody did, Wichita. Oh. I'm sorry, Canfield. My business is cattle, not law enforcement. In Tombstone, law enforcement's everybody's business. Get over, Slaughter. Hey, if you was to take the job, Slaughter, I'll bet Jim would be glad to be your deputy. Yeah, that's all I'd need around here. He'd probably start more fights than he'd stop. Come on. Slaughter, I wonder about you sometimes. I wonder if you wasn't already a lawman once. <laughs> I wonder about you too, Wichita. I wonder if you were born with that big nose of yours or did you grow it later? <laughs> <laughs> had it as long as I can remember. Well, hey, it's raining. I didn't know it ever rained in Tombstone. It isn't very heavy. Won't last long. Slaughter. What is it, Taggart? What kind of play is this? I don't know what you're talking about. Ralston is what I'm talking about. I told you. Ralston turned himself in. Yeah, well, he ain't in the jail now. That cell door is wide open. What? And what's more, my night guard's been pestle up. Looked like Ralston had a friend helped him to break out. You wouldn't know who that'd be, would you? No, I wouldn't. Hey, Sheriff. A horse has been stolen from Wilkie's livery stable. That's proudly how Ralston made his getaway. Looks like I got you to thank for this, Slaughter. Think so? Yeah. If I handled things my own way, this wouldn't have happened. Next time you cross me, it's going to be the last time. Don't be too sure of that, Taggart. <laughs> you know, Slaughter, you got a natural talent for making enemies. A man like Taggart, it isn't hard. <laughs> Come on. Let's get back to the hotel. I still don't get it, Slaughter. Why would Ralston have gave himself up and then busted out of jail? Some men you never know about till they make a move. Ralston didn't do it alone. He had to have a friend. Maybe his friend convinced him he wouldn't get a fair trial. Maybe. Anyway, he... Slaughter, look, Jim, on the floor... He's been slugged. He's out cold. Wait a minute. The cattle money. Yeah. It's gone. In a moment, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone returns. Whenever significant events take place, you can count on CBS News to bring you first-hand and well-detailed descriptions of what is happening, often broadcast right from the scene of the event. You can count on CBS Newsmen, too, to make certain that fact is emphasized and conjecture clearly labeled. Each correspondent on staff brings a fine background in reporting to his job. And in the tradition of the CBS Newsroom, they all share an uncompromising respect for the truth. So why don't you let CBS News keep you as fully informed as an expert? And now, Act Two of William N. Robeson's production of Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. Jim. Jim, come on, boy. Wow. That's it, boy. Come on, come out of it. You all right, Jim? Oh, 
I, I guess so. What happened, Jim? I, I don't rightly know, Slaughter. I heard a noise. It sounded like it come from outside the window on the balcony. Yeah. I went over and stuck my head out to look. Something awful hard hit me on the side of the head. I went down. And then somebody climbed through the window into the room. I tried to get to my feet and he hit me again. Well, that's the last I remember. You get a good look at him, Jim? No, he... His hat was pulled down low and he had a bandana over his face. Was it Ralston? I don't know. He... He took the cattle money, didn't he? Yeah. Fine guard I turned out to be. Yeah, it's too late to worry about that. Just be glad you have a hard head. Slaughter. Yeah. It was Ralston. How do you figure? Remember that ring he wore? Mexican work, looked like? What about it? Had a green stone set in it, carved like a snake's head. Yeah, I remember. Here it is. I found it on the floor. Must have been jarred loose when he slugged Jim. It's a stone, all right. Well, looks like Taggart was right after all. <laughs> Well, well. So you finally wised up to Ralston, huh, Slaughter? Too late, of course. Maybe not, Taggart. What's your time? Yeah. You got the grub ready? Packed in the saddlebags. Maybe next time you won't interfere when I'm trying to enforce the law. How about the bed rolls, Wichita? All ready. You going after him, huh? What do you think? I think there's a couple of things wrong with that idea. Like what? In the first place, you get a poor chance of finding his trail at night in the rain. Rain's letting up. It'll stop soon. I want to be ready to start trailing as soon as it's light. The second thing is wrong. Is law enforcement is my business, Slaughter, not yours. That's my money he got away with. Yeah, but there's still a matter of that mine payroll he's got stashed away somewhere. <laughs> and look, it's Slaughter. Ain't no sense our being at each other's throats all the time. You crossed me once, it riled me, but I'm willing to let it pass. I figure everybody's entitled to one mistake. Depends on what the mistake is, doesn't it? The point is, we both want Ralston. Now, the smart thing to do is for us to trail him together. Me and Blackwell, you and Wichita. How about it? All right, Taggart. Good. Good. I'll get word to Blackwell right away. He's on his ranch, out of town a ways, up near Crocker Mesa. Well, he ain't a full-time deputy, huh? <laughs> this town can't afford one. I'll send word to him to meet us in the morning. We'll be ready at sunup. Let's keep in Blackwell, Taggart. Well, you be along any minute, Slaughter. Oh, it's been an hour since the rain stopped. We're wasting time. That trail's going to get cold on us, even if we manage to pick it up in the first place. And that ain't going to be easy. Easier than you think, maybe. What do you mean, Taggart? I had a talk with Wilkie down the stable last night. That stolen horse had thrown a shoe off of his left hind hoof. Wilkie didn't have a chance to put a new one on. That'll help some. Oh, here's Blackwell. Uh, sorry I'm late, gents. Busted a cinch strap saddling up and had to rig a new one. Yeah, no harm, Blackwell. Ten minutes isn't going to make much difference one way or another. It does to me. All right, gentle down, Slaughter. Now, I figure Austin headed south, out of town towards the border. We'll cover that area first. Let's get moving, gents. <laughs> Looks like that was a bum hunch of yours about Ralston headed for the border, Taggart. You've covered every trail leading south out of Tombstone. Well, like I say, Slaughter, everybody's entitled to one mistake. Gotta admit it was logical to reckon he'd be headed straight south. Well, we covered most of the country west of town, too. Well, we'd just keep circling. Maybe he took off to the north. Hold up. Hold up, hold up, hold up. What is it? Over there. Tracks. I'll take a closer look. What about it, Blackwell? Yeah. This is the one we're looking for, all right. No shoe on the left hind hook. Hidden straight west. Yeah. From the San Pedro River. 
Let's move. The tracks lead right into the river. Yeah, it's an old trick, but it still works. Probably rode up or downstream a ways, then out on the other side. This trail's gonna be tough to find again over there. That's pretty rocky ground. So I see. When we do pick it up again, I'll bet it turns south. I still think he's heading for the border. Let's cross and split up. Two upstream, two downstream. Right. Whoever picks that trail on the other side fired two shots. Right. Gang, if I can figure a fellow like Rolston out, Slaughter, I sure never figured he'd take this way of paying you back for everything you've done for him. Hold it here, Wichita. What's the matter? Let Taggart and Blackwell get out of sight around that bend. Hmm. Let's get back to the riverbank. I don't get it, Slaughter. We're not going to look for tracks on the other side of the river. We're going to look for them on this side. I still don't know what you... Get off your horse. Yeah. Now take a look, a close look at those tracks we've been trailing, Wichita. Uh-oh. Well? There's a little dry dirt in the bottom of each one. Yeah, it was raining last night when Ralston supposed to have stolen our money in the horse and made his getaway. Yeah, rain stopped about an hour before sunup. And these tracks were made after it stopped raining. That's why you see dry dirt with the hooves cut through the wet. Wait a minute. You, you mean somebody rigged this trail to lead us on a wild goose chase? It's just what we're going to find out. <laughs> We worked our way along the riverbank. Half a mile upstream, we picked up the tracks coming back out of the river and circling. We followed them, headed northwest. Twenty minutes later, we came over a rise and spotted a small ranch house in the hollow below. The only sign of life was a few buzzards clustered on a mound in a little gully behind the ranch. We left our horses concealed and worked our way down the slope under cover. Buzzards reluctantly took flight. We saw what had been buried in the mound, or what was left of it. Ralston's body. Yeah. Whoever stole our cattle money busted Ralston out of jail, forced him out here, and killed him. Yeah. Question is, who done it? Whose ranch is this? See over there to the right? It's Crocker's Mesa. Crocker's Mesa? Taggart said Blackwell had a ranch near Crocker's Mesa, so Blackwell's our man. Looks like it. Well... We we better get back to that ranch house before Blackwell gets back. It might be too late. If they figure we tumbled to the fake trail, they could circle back here to the ranch ahead of us. They? You mean Taggart, too? We'll soon find out. Keep down as much as you can. We'll circle around the corral There's here. Taggart on the porch with a rifle. Get down. That answer your question about Taggart? Sure does. No doubt about it. They're in it together. There he goes, inside the house. We gotta bust him out of that house somehow. Wait a minute. That wagon there beside the corral. Yeah. When I get the word, we'll head for it. Get behind it. Now. Well, what now? The ground slopes down to the house from here. Let's get this wagon moving. It'll cover us. Now. Shout. Shout. Stay close behind it. Be ready to shoot when it hits. She's heading right for the house. Stay low. Yeah, yeah, sure will. There she goes. Come on, fast. Yeah, there's Blackwell at the window. I'll get him. Oh! Hold it, Tiger. Drop your gun. Drop it. All right, Slaughter. All right. Don't try it. Hey! Hey, my, my, he took a little convincing. Where's the money, Blackwell? Where is it? Uh, uh, under uh, a loose board in the, in the floor. Loose board? I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's our cattle money, all right. And the mine payroll. Well, I guess that's that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, Slaughter, appears to me you was taking quite a chance. Just a winging Blackwell and knocking out Taggart instead of gunning them down. You don't owe them no favors. I wasn't doing them any favor, Wichita. I was just saving them. Saving them? For what? The citizens of Tombstone. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, starring Sam Buffington. Written by Robert Stanley, with editorial supervision by Tom Hanley, and directed by William N. Robeson. Supporting Mr. Buffington were Junius Matthews, Sam Edwards, Vic Perrin, Lawrence Dobkin, Jack Moyles, and Frank Gerstel. Next week at this time, we return with... Slaughter's the name. Luke Slaughter. When we meet up again, you can call me that. Luke Slaughter. The Romance of the Rancho. New Mexico, 1841. Workman Roland Party starts for California. Los Angeles, 1846. Americans' lives saved by revolt. Los Angeles, 1876. Panic closes Southland Bank. The Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles presents The Romance of the Ranchos a weekly dramatization of the colorful events which make up the history of our Southern California. Each week, our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, tells another true story of famous people and happenings, rich in romance and adventure. Now a word from the Title Insurance and Trust Company about a kind of insurance that takes precedence over all others today. Victory insurance. That's what your regular purchases of defense bonds and stamps really are. For the money thus made available to our government in this time of greatest need will provide the planes, tanks, guns, and bombs that alone can insure our victory. And don't forget that in buying this victory insurance, you're also insuring the future financial well-being of your family. Defense bonds are a sound business investment, guaranteeing a definite and substantial return. So put your dimes and dollars to work for America and for you. Do it now. Do it regularly. Do it often. Buenas noches, señoras y señores. Our story tonight concerns two of the Southland's early pioneers, partners in ownership of a vast tract of land in the fertile San Gabriel Valley, the great Rancho La Puente of William Workman and John Rowland. Here is a story rich in the romance of the ranchos. Our story starts about the year 1841, when two business partners in the little New Mexican town of Taos, near Santa Fe, discussed an important matter. But, John, does this mean that our partnership is dissolved, that you're striking out on your own? Of course not, Bill. Who ever said anything like that? Well... Well, the firm of William Workman and John Rowland is going to go on as long as we live. As long as we live and maybe longer. Now, that ain't the idea at all. It's just that we'd be, well, transferring operations somewhere else. Uh, but you want to go to California. Oh, sure. Sure I want to go to California. I want to take a look around. See if it looks like a good place to settle down and start our business all over again. You know, we can't stay here. No, we can't. It's getting more unhealthy every day. Sure, Ben Wilson says that Armijo, the governor, has gotten word somehow or other that the Texas boys are organizing to march in here and take over New Mexico. Bad enough for Americans here now. But when that happens, none of us will be safe from these New Mexicans and Indians. Uh, we got to get out while there's still a chance. Yes, you're right. But Ben, California, that's a long way off. It's another Mexican province. There aren't many Americans there. Why not go back to Missouri, back to civilization? What chances we have? No, Bill. We ought to go out there where we can start something. What where we have a chance to really make a place for ourselves. Not just get in on the tail end. 
Yes. Well, perhaps you're right. It seems like a peculiar place to start a business out in the wilderness where there's nobody to do business with. Well, yeah, you may be right. That's what I want to find out. That's why I'm going out there. Anyways, I've always had a hankering to see it. Ever since the first time I heard tell about California. Oh, it must be a mighty nice place to live, all right. Yeah, more than that, though. If it's such a nice place to live, sooner or later, people are going, going to live there. Americans. Yeah, they're spreading farther west every day. Won't take them long to get out there, and well, we'll be in on the ground floor. Well, I trust your judgment, John. Go on, see what you can find. Whatever you decide will be all right with me. As long as we have to move anyway, it might as well be west, I suppose. Good. I'll make arrangements to leave right away. Man, that's a hard trip. In fact, nobody's ever made it except a few trappers. <laughs> How'd you get there? Uh, you seem to forget, Bill, that, well, I've been a trapper. Oh, yes. I've done a lot of exploring around this west, and I haven't forgotten all I knew. I'll find my way to California, all right, and I'll be back in the spring. Back in the spring, ready to take both our families back to a new home in California. So John Rowland took leave of his partner, William Workman, and made the hazardous journey across Indian-infested mountains and deserts to the remote Mexican province of California. Once in Southern California, the young American was pleased with what he saw. And back he went to Taos, determined to persuade the others. He arrived in the New Mexican town in the nick of time to find his family and friends considerably upset. Listen to them, John. These riots have been getting worse and worse. Governor Armijo has whipped them up into a frenzy against us. No Americans have been attacked, have they? No, not yet, but if this keeps up, it'll only be a matter of days. They've been threatening several times. We've barricaded the doors and windows just in case. How many of us are there? Well, about 20 men with their families. Altogether, about 40 Americans. Ben Wilson and I have rounded them up and taken whatever measures we could to ensure their safety, but we're outnumbered, 20 to 1. More than that. Well, thank heavens I got back in time. They still have a chance to escape. Bill, we'll call them all together tonight. I'll lay my plans before them. What is it? California? That's right. We'll find safety and a future fortune there. And I'm proposing that we stock up and get ready to leave as soon as possible. The American pioneers of Santa Fe accepted John Rowland's proposition and escaped the trap of the New Mexicans just in time. Across the parched plains and hazardous mountains, the tiny caravan plodded. And after almost two months of difficult travel, on November 5th, 1841, they came down through Cajon Pass into the promised land of Southern California. It was the first party of American settlers to come to the Southland with the idea of making it their home, the vanguard of that great westward migration which made world history. As such, the Workman Roland Party, with its honor roll of future great names in Southern California annals, made history. Besides the leaders... There were Don Benito Wilson, Lemuel Carpenter, John Reed, and many others. Most of them were to make their homes here. Many of them were to follow much the same procedure that John Rowland did. One day, he accosted his friend, Don Benito Wilson. Well, that's what I said. How about coming up north with me to see the governor and get some land? You mean, uh, all you gotta do is just ask for it? That's the size of it. I got some real nice country picked out for Bill and me, and I'm going up to claim it. How about you, Ben? Oh, no, not me. I'm not able to settle down here. And like I told you before, there's plenty more places to see. And I don't intend to live, die, and be buried in one out-of-the-way spot like this. I still think you'll change your mind, but, well, I'm going anyway. Sorry you won't come along. Who said I won't? I'll go up there with you, but only because I want to find a ship that's headed for China. Now, maybe I'll be lucky enough to find one in Monterey. (laughs) Anyway, it's worth a try. (laughs) All right, you old Rolling Stone. We're off for Monterey. North to Monterey rode the two friends. And John Rowland paid a visit to Senora Guello, the prefect of the district. Ah, Senora. Uh, Rowland, did you say? Uh, what can I do for you? Well, I understand you're the man who can help me prepare the proper petition to obtain a grant of land. A grant of land? Aha. Uh-huh. Oh, but you, Senor, are an Americano, are you not? See, si. Well, that is, I was born an Americano, but I'm a naturalized citizen of Mexico. So... Here are my papers. Mm. I'm a resident of the Department of New Mexico. 
I married a Mexican wife. Hmm? In fact, I've produced seven little citizens of Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> bueno, you will do, senor. And in that case, I shall prepare your petition. I can get the land? Oh, I do not know. But you have passed the first requirement. Uh, tell me, senor, where is the land you want? The land's to the east of the San Gabriel River near the bridge La Fiente, known as the Exmission Lands of San Gabriel. Oh, oh, the Padres will not like that. Ah, but no matter, that is government land now. So you are entitled to it. See, this would make a good place for a rancho. Yeah, that's what I think. Uh, <laughs> then you'll uh, prepare the petition? Hmm? Oh, see, si, see. Si. I shall draw it out. Uh, when can I take possession of the land? What? As soon as the provisional grant is issued. Uh, but... When will that be? I, I mean, well, you see, I was planning on going back to my family and partner, and well, I'd like to know I had the land before I left. Oh, see, si, of course. <laughs> and when are you planning to leave, senor? Oh, in a day or two. Santa Maria, a day or two. <laughs> senor, you, you Americanos are too impatient. You shall be lucky if the grant is issued in two months, let alone two days. Is that so? Well, that seems a long time just to say yes or no. Oh, senor, wait until you have been here a while. You will understand. It is much easier just to take your time. Si, senor. In fact, here it is easy to forget time. Uh, si, senor. Time was made for slaves. In spite of the Californian's contention that time was nothing, John Rowland and William Workman chafed at the bit until in 1842 their provisional grant was issued. They were able to take up their abode on their Rancho La Puente. Once on their land, the two friends and partners built homes close by one another and started the irrigation and cultivation of their land. But when the final provisions had been lived up to, they received their title papers, discovery was made. Bill... I don't know how I could have made such a mistake. It's all right, John. We have the land. The grant is legal. Everything will be all right. But the grant is made out only to me and not to both of us in partnership. Well, it doesn't really matter. But it does. Legally, you couldn't will your part to your children or... Well, I couldn't anyway. Neither of us can. That's a provision in the grant. Well, it isn't right. We're going to have this changed. You're my partner on this like on everything else. Half of this ranch is yours, and I'm going to see that you get it. Yes, and your children, too. We'll have it re-granted without any provisions at all. And John Rowland did have the Rancho La Puente re-granted to himself and William Workman. Thereafter, the two partners shared evenly in the profitable growth which followed. But the two men had arrived in California at a period of extreme upheaval, and within four years after their arrival, they were to take part in the great events. In 1845, when the army of Governor Michel Terena was being defied by Southern Californians, both Mexican and American, it was William Workman who aroused the local Americans to support the defenders of Los Angeles. Michel Terena is advancing on Los Angeles. He'll be in the city tomorrow. Well, let's be stopped. He must be stopped. I appeal to every one of you. You all know what this man's army means to us. Right. Do we ever want to have any degree of self-government here in California? If we want to live in a society which has respect for law and order, if we ever want to be rid of the brigandry of Mitchell Corena's lawless mob, we must stand firm right. and fight beside our neighbors, the Californians. Right. Are you with me? Right. With workmen as leader, Don Benito Wilson, John Rowland, William McKinley, and some 50 other Americans did stand firm with the Californians and defeated Michel Terena in the Battle of Cahuenga. They made Pio Pico governor, and now calm was restored. For the last, for only a short time, for in 1846 came war with the United States. The American forces of Commodore Stockton took Los Angeles. As the Commodore moved on, he left a small force to guard the city. It was then that word came to John Rowland. Bill, it's revolt. A general revolt of all the Californians. Oh, as bad as that. Well, surely Gillespie's men can stop it. Stop it? That handful will be annihilated if they don't get help. It's really serious. Juan Flores is the head of the insurgents, and they're out to get every American. Oh, that's bad. I'm having my horse saddled. I've got to ride out and warn Ben Wilson. Yes, he has a squad of soldiers, and maybe he can get to Gillespie with help. I'm afraid we'll have to have more than Ben's squad. They were just organized as a border patrol. Oh. Now I've got to warn Ben to save himself. Flores has sent out a hundred men to round him up. But, John, you're an American, too. 
If you're caught with Captain Wilson, you know what it would mean. I know, Bill, but I've got to warn him. Well, then I'm going with you. No, Bill, this is one time you're not with me. You're an Englishman, not an American. If you stay here out of the way, they probably won't bother you. Look but... here, man, I'm not going to stand aside and do nothing to help. We're supposed to be partners on everything. All right, then, partner. The best way for you to help me is to stay here and take care of the ranch. I'll be all right. This will all blow over in a little while. Then I'll want to come back here to a ranch that's been kept up. Yes, but look no here. No buts about it. I'm on my way. Take care of things. I'll be seeing you soon. Uh, but John! John! <laughs> Roland reached Captain Benjamin Wilson and his men just as the Californians were closing in, and together they were besieged in the Williams Ranch house at Chino. For the time they held the attackers off, but... Well, we can't hold them off much longer, John. No, the ammunition's almost gone now. Wait a minute. Do I smell smoke? Me? Yes. Oh, it's a fire. They've set the roof on fire. It's going up like tinder. Hurry, men, get out. Back out to the patio. Well, they'll smoke us out even there, man. I know we're done for. Might as well give up right now. We're prisoners, and may God help us. The Americans under Don Benito Wilson were herded into an improvised prison in Los Angeles. There they remained for some time in great physical discomfort. Then, one day... Senor Palomares. Oh, Senor Workman. Come in, come in. Won't you sit down? Uh, gracias, Senor. I have something important to talk to you about. <laughs> bueno. I've not seen you for some time. Not since... No, not uh... since this trouble started. I see. I only come now, Senor, because of word I've received from my good friend John Rowland, mm. who, as you know, is held prisoner here. I know. It is unfortunate. Senor, I come to you because you're an honest, humane gentleman, as are most Californians. Gracias, Senor. I know that... Even though our sympathies may not lie on the same side, you are a man of honor, and you will not countenance dishonor among your countrymen. Dishonor, senor, among us Californianos? Come, senor, workmen, speak up. Very well. I have received word from my friends that General Flores plans to send them as trophies of war to the government at Mexico City. Senor, you are sure? See, si. for so Flores has already told them. Don Ignacio. You will not allow him to do anything so inhumane, so dishonorable, will you? Senor, many of us have not liked Flores' treatment of the Americanos. But we have felt uh, we could do nothing. After all, you sent here from Mexico. See, si. When the Americano forces come back, he will flee to Mexico again, leaving you Californianos to bear the shame of his dishonorable dealings. I know that, senor. This whole unpleasant matter is much to be regretted, senor workman. But you have my word for it. There shall be no more to be regretted. Flores will not carry out this scheme. Tony Ignacio, I knew you would not allow it. I shall call my friends together right away. And we shall take action. With force, if necessary. Quickly, Don Ignacio Palomares gathered the honorable California dons around him and challenged General Flores' command of the insurgents. Anxiously, the prisoners waited in their quarters, the sound of firing ringing up to them. Ben seems to be fading away. There's not as much firing as before. Yeah, sounds like it's Peter now. I'm afraid we're sunk, John. Oh, if only we could do something, not just sit here in prison waiting and praying when out there our fate is being decided. I'm afraid it's been decided. The firing's almost stopped. I didn't think Flores would give up that easily. Then we'll soon be on our way to Mexico. John! Hmm? John Rowland! Ben Wilson! It's Bill Workman. Huh? Bill, what are you doing here? Workman, how in the world... Roll over, men. You're safe. We've just finished off the last of Flores' men who held out. But how? It was easy. Most of his own men were on our side. (laughs) General Flores is in irons, and you're safe. Whom do the public records show to be the owner of the land upon which you're living right this minute? Do you know for sure? Do you know what they show about who owned it before the present owner acquired it? What rights or claims or interests any person or any corporation or any municipality has in that land? Suppose you didn't know the answer to all those questions, but you wanted to know. And surely you would want to know if you were buying that land or if you were lending money with that land as security. It is the business of Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles to determine from a mass of millions of different records the answers to all these questions. 
when that determination has been made, not only from an examination of these records, but by an interpretation of these records, it issues what is called a policy of title insurance. This insures you against any loss you may suffer by reason of mistakes in the policy of title insurance as to any of these matters. When you buy real estate or lend on real estate, just think, title insurance is my protection. The Americans under Captain Benjamin Wilson were freed from the threat of being taken to Mexico City as trophies of war by the prompt action of the Californians. Flores was later restored to his command after promising to refrain from any mistreatment of the American prisoners. From now on, Roland, Wilson, and the others fared better, but they were still captive. Then, on January 8, 1847, the day before the Battle of the San Gabriel, General Andres Pico visited them in a cell. You mean, General Pico, you're releasing us? See, mi amigo, for we have no one to guard you. All of our men go to the battle, and you would not be safe here. The mob might get out of hand here in the Pueblo. You're letting us go for our own safety. Let me see, but on one condition that you promise not to join the Americano forces against us. I'm sure that you have our promise, General. You're being more than generous. Gracias. We have never had any ill will toward you, senores. I only wish that this unpleasantness could have been avoided. See, si, General Pico, that goes both ways. But I'm sure that well, whatever happens, we can all live here in this grand country together, peacefully and happily. On General Andres Pico's horses, Wilson and Roland make good their escape and return to their homes. The next day, the Californians were defeated at San Gabriel, and all California knew that it was to become a part of the United States of America. But the course of events changed the even tenor of life on La Puente, but little, for a time at least. On the Workman Roland property grew up a virtual community in itself. In 1855, Workman built the first brick house in California, which still stands. Beside their crops and vineyards, the cattle and horses, John Rowland built a flour mill and a winery. His flour and aguardiente supplied many in the Pueblo. Those were prosperous years during the 50s, for settlers were pouring into California. Gradually, with growth, conditions changed. From the sleepy frontier village, Los Angeles began its growth as an American city of commerce and industry. As the years passed, the American rancheros took an active part in the development. William Workman joined with his son-in-law, Francis F.P. Temple, and Isaac W. Hellman to go into the banking business. Later on, in 1870, Workman and Temple established a bank of their own and for a while prospered. Then, three years later, on a little barren plot of ground on Rancho La Puente, a sad scene was enacted. Don't you think we'd better be getting back to the house, Mr. Workman, sir? No, Francis. Just a minute more. I want to stay here with him a minute more. But it's getting late. I can't believe it yet, Francis. There under the soil he loved so well lies John Rowland. It's where he'd want to be, sir. Yes. Yes, it's where I want to be too, Francis. Remember that when the time comes. John and I lived and worked and fought together. We've been friends and partners for most of our lives. And when it comes to me, too, I should be like to, like to be laid right here, Francis, here beside my old partner, John. I promise you it will be done, sir. <laughs> but what are we talking about? That's far in the future. You'll probably outlast me many years. Oh, no, son, I, I have a feeling that now John's gone, it won't be very long for me. And William Workman was to live only a few years longer, contentedly at home on his Rancho La Puente. Surrounding him were his children, his grandchildren, his sons and daughters-in-law, among them many names illustrious. John Reed, Francis Temple. There were the Boyles and John Rowland's family, including William, the sheriff who captured the bandit Vasquez. The old pioneer left his banking business pretty much in the hands of Temple. And all went well until, in 1874, Workman was hastily called to the bank... 
Francis? Francis, what is it? What's the matter? No, Mr. Workman, I'm glad you're here. What are all these people doing here? It's a run. A run on the bank. It's getting worse and worse. It's a panic, sir, a panic. But why? What's the cause of it? Well, yesterday in San Francisco, the Bank of California closed its doors, and all over the state, one bank after another is following suit. Closed? But, Francis, there's no need for us to close, is there? Yes, sir, I'm afraid there is. We can't keep open in the face of a panic like this. We've given out almost all of our cash now. That's why I asked you to come. I want your permission to to close the doors. But why should I lend money to a bank? Every one of them's closed. But the scare is over. I'm sure if we can reopen, we'll be all right, Mr. Baldwin. The Hellman's reopening tomorrow, E.J., and we want to do the same. If you'll put up this money, we can. You say you want 310000 huh? It's a lot of money. But it's safe, E.J. Both Francis and I are willing to stake our property on it. Yes, we'll give you a mortgage for our combined real estate. Mm. All right, all right, I'll do it. But I don't envy you, fellas. Looks to me like you're jumping from the frying pan into the fire. Well, Francis, how does it stand? You've been poring over those figures for hours. It doesn't look good, sir. You mean... Yes. Yeah. We can't liquidate our assets, we can't call back enough loans, and our money is gone. And that means we'll have to close again. Yes, but this time for good. And our land, the Rancho La Puente. It's gone. The shock was too much for William Workman, and a short time later, they carried him to his final resting place. And so, he places here beside his old friend in this little acre of God, just where he wanted to be. May he rest in peace. We who knew him shall never forget him. Not forgotten is William Workman or John Rowland, pioneers of early Los Angeles. Today, their many descendants are prominent in Southland affairs, including a famous president of the city council, the Honorable Boyle Workman, who has written much about his kinsmen and his life in early California. They are remembered, too, on the land of Rancho La Puente, where today prosperous farms and homes and the thriving cities of Covina, Puente, and Baldwin Park are located. For it is men like these who have helped to make Southern California as it is today. Such is the romance of the ranchos. When you deal with land, you deal with people. Because things which happen to people may affect their land. You must know, for example, what legal disabilities, if any, a person might have which might prevent him from or affect him in dealing with land. Now, suppose you were buying a lot from Catherine Jones, spelled with a C. Suppose the records disclose that one Catherine Jones, spelled with a K, is incompetent. Is that the same person? It doesn't appear to be, but it might be. It's the business of Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles to establish the identity of these persons and to insure you against loss by reason of any mistake in any such identification. Incidentally, there are at least 24 different ways to spell the name Catherine. Does this give you some idea of the magnitude of the work which must be done by the Title Insurance Company? There's a saying in the West that a cowboy is a man with guts and a horse. This is the story of one. His name was Slim. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. a 
horse in Cheyenne and was riding to Laramie in Wyoming Territory. I wanted a chance to really look at this grazing country and the thousands of head of cattle dotting its plains. I rode north of the railroad tracks until the telegraph poles lining it were lost in a dusty haze. And I saw clouds, heavy and bronze, over the distant mountains. It was during the afternoon that I came upon the cowboy, a lean man of about 30, with a cigarette hanging from his lips. He was examining the right foreleg of his horse, and he looked up as I approached. Hello. Howdy. You need any help? That fool horse stepped in a gopher hole. Don't seem to be no spring, though. Ah. Uh, Fine-looking animal. He ain't a bad old buzzard head. Hey, you English? <laughs> yes. You a ranch man? No, no. A newspaper correspondent. Oh. Well, maybe if you was a ranch man, you'd be looking for a hand. Uh, I'm sorry. They don't make no never mind. I'm chasseying over to Laramie. They're going to get me a job on them new layouts I hear tells open up. I'm bound for Laramie myself. You mind if I ride with you? Well, I take it as real friendly. Quit it, you moon-eyed <laughs> son of a gun. Hold still. You think we'll have rain? Eh, don't feel like it. Of course you can't tell with them clouds. I've been on the range and there ain't been nothing but blue up there. And wango, down she comes. Hail as big as your fist. I tell you, nature's a skittish beast. Ain't no how bridle wise. Oh, incidentally, my name is Kendall. Slim, all right. Slim? Been in these parts long? Oh, a few weeks. I came down from Montana Territory by way of Deadwood. That's so. Yeah, here, Wild Bill Hickok got plugged a while back in Deadwood. Yeah. I was there when it happened. That's so. Mm. What happened to the feller that done it? McCall? Yeah, that was his name, Jack McCall. He, he was tried. The jury found him not guilty. That's so. Mm. Mm. Did you know him? No, just here. Oh. What do you write about in your newspaper? Well, I see people out here, their way of living. Kind of different in England, huh? <laughs> yes, it's quite different. Ain't no plains, or mountains, or rivers. Ain't nothing back east or in England like we got here. That's true. Don't figure how come a man went to live back here. Well, it's a different kind of country, a different kind of life. It's a... It's... Well, uh, what? Didn't sound like no regular shooting. Oh, hold still, horse. I'll mash your side to Seems to come from the hills. Yeah. Reckon someone's in trouble. Let's go. A range of hills, low-lying, somber, about a mile to our north. It was from that direction we heard the shots. Slim's horse easily outdistanced mine, and by the time I reached the first slopes, the cowboy had disappeared into a canyon. matter with him? Looks like he's been locking horns with some Indians. I was just riding up to him when I fell down. There's half an arrow in him. Oh. Broke off. Now, oh. Take it easy, part. <laughs> Kendall, you better take his rifle. Keep an eye out. Yeah. No shells in it. Rappaho. Rappaho's got it. Where? Where? Where did they go? Up the canyon trail. Wagging horses. Clara. Oh, that's too bad. Too bad. He ain't gonna have no breakfast again forever. That's for sure. Well, what about the woman? Clara. I guess she's still alive. Though maybe she'd rather not be. Indians keep captured white women around. Sometimes for a hostage. Sometimes for... Other things. Well, do you think we'd have a chance of catching up with them? It might. Depends on how long a start they got and how many. I'd kind of like to bury him first. He ain't fitting for a man to lie out in the open after he's curled up. Well, but it'll take time. What about the woman? It won't go no better or worse with her for the time. Well, that ground's too hard for hand digging. I'm going to have to make a rock grave. Tell you what, though. You start on it. 
I'll work up the canyon a bit, see if I can find signs. Now, if you hear three shots, come a running. I'll do the same for you. Right. We oh, may have some shells left for the Winchester. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's something. Eight of them. You better keep the rifle here. So long. I began the task of burying the dead man. From letters and a homestead deed in his pockets, I found that his name was Theodore Belding. There was also a tintype of a young, rather pretty woman whom I gathered to be his wife, Clara. It took the better part of 45 minutes to complete the grave, and it wasn't until almost an hour later that Slim returned. I found the trail, followed it away up. There was four Indians in the wagon. They cleared the wagon and left it burned. Took the horses, though, and the woman. What are our chances? Can you shoot? I'm fair. Well, I ain't done any trailing since five years back, but we ain't got nothing to lose. Be getting dark by and by. We'll keep going till light gives out. Do you know this country, Slim? Not much, but a man can read a lot of things from places he ain't been. Here. That's where they stopped the wagon, see? Oh, you mean those double wheel ruts? Yeah. Must have ambushed him from over there. And the feller fell here. See the blood spot? Guess he made things hot for him for a spell. Were you an Indian scout, Slim? Yeah, for a while. Worked with Custer. Oh? What do you think of him? For him, I got a can of cuss words and I best keep the lid on it. Yeah, we'll save our breath for breathing from here on. I want to be able to hear what there is to hear. We went on up the canyon, Slim reading the ground, or, as he put it, following sign. For a mile or more, the trail was obvious, even to the most unpracticed eye, but after we passed the burned-out wagon, it became more difficult to follow. For another hour, we rode in silence. The sun was beginning to set. A cool breeze was sweeping down the canyon. Oh, oh, no. oh. You hear that? Could mean Indians made a camp. Those crows ain't flying. Figure they're sitting in the trees waiting for a handout. Uh, unless they're feeding on carrion. It wouldn't be corn if there were. Sounds as if they're in those trees. See, just over the rise. Don't seem smart enough for Indians to make a camp this early. Or oh, they know we're following and they're waiting for us. Now, shut your mouth, you glandered, spavin coyote. Oh, smells them. Now, we better tie the critters up. All right. Pull down that injured rubber neck of yours. Pale, pink, wall-eyed son of a gun. I'll skin you alive. Did you think that Slim, that it might be an idea to work our way through the trees instead of along the canyon wall, huh? I sure do. That old sun's right behind us. We make awful pretty targets. Keep in the shadows as much as you can. We'll just figure they got no weapons except in bow and arrow. That gives us a mighty advantage. All set? Yes. Come on, then. And watch out for twigs and dry leaves. Walk soft. Ahead of us, through the trees and shrubs, lay the brow of the rise. We made our way upward until we were within ten yards of the top. That's when I saw a glint in the sunlight and a trickle of sand moving down the slope toward us. Get down! In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Does that sound go with this music? Sure it does, when it's the sound of the shutters coming off the summer place in the woods, in the mountains, or at the shore. Only five more days from now, all America opens up the summer place as we swing into the three-day Memorial Day weekend, the first great outdoor holiday of the year. But first, what does your summer place need? In the refrigerator, on the kitchen shelves, the bathroom shelves, round the grill. Check now. Make a list now. Buy at your grocer's, your druggist, your hardware store. Then you'll be all set for that great big three-day weekend. And say, don't forget to have your portable radio checked and ready. Wherever you spend your happy holiday, 
There's a CBS Radio network station to keep you posted on the weather and the news. And now we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. Phew. You got good eyes, Kendall. I sure could feel the sawdust in my beard that time. Where are they? Well, one of them is between the boulders. A little to the right of the clump of alders. There, you can see the rifle sight. Want to try a shot with a Winchester? No, not yet. Only eight shells. We better save them. How many rounds you got for your gun? About 20. I got near the same. Say 50 rounds between guns and rifle. Not bad if it don't take too long. How many you figure we're shooting? Two, from the sound of it. Sharps repeaters, that's for sure. Well, we sure cut a big gut that time. Seems to me the only thing to do now is to wait until it's dark. There's no other way to get at them without being seen. I'm wondering what our chances are after dark. We ain't in the best position. Might be we ought to pull back down canyon, wait for morning before we pick up the trail. And what about the woman? Well, if she's still alive, she knows there's help around. Nice man! Come up from trees. We make medicine. <laughs> Here's the Indian couldn't drive nails in a snowbank. He's trying to draw a fire. Locate us. Well, let him. You want to make medicine, Siwash? You come down here. That came from the left, higher up. One of them must be in a tree. I think I can see him. Yeah, there's enough sticking out. Gone, gone now. Not on this side. Now there's one good Indian. Where'd you learn to shoot like that, mister? Odd places. What? I'm hit. Where? Oh, I'm hit on the arm. Oh, man, that hurts. Oh, that hurts. Let me see now, Slim. Oh. Well, it ain't the gun hand, anyhow. Can you you bind it up? Yes. I keep down now. White man! You want white woman? We talk. Maybe you pay gold. Get her back. Come down here. We'll talk. How does it feel now, Slim? Like a brand in irons inside. Well, there's not too much bleeding, though. That's something. I sure wish we had more cover. I feel naked as a painted cat laying out here. man. We come down top. You shoot, woman, die. What do you think? We might have them buffaloed. Let them come. But watch them for tricks. They got a hundred. Come down. We'll hold our fire. There's only one of them. Now, if he ain't a setting duck against that sky... Well, there's two more, though. They must be with the woman. Yeah, maybe. Keep your eyes peeled. White man has been wounded. Indian has been killed? We are many. You are two. Climb down, Siwash. There were four of you, now there's three. I have Little Knife, chief of the Arapaho. You're Little Knife, a renegade dog who steals women. Little Knife, not renegade. Fight with crazy horse. Little Knife, not steal woman. Take woman. Like white man, take Little Knife land. Maybe kill white woman. Like white man kill Indian woman and child. The war is over. There's no more killing on either side. White man say war is finished. Not Indian. Quit your coyote around the rim, Indian. What about the woman? You give me your guns, rifle, and gold. I give her to you. I'll see you hung up to dry first. Not our guns or rifles, but perhaps some gold. How much? How much you got? A hundred dollars? Not enough. That's all there is. All guns and hundred dollars. No. I go back. Maybe you hear a woman die. Then you pay. Maybe you don't go back, Siwash. What about that? Like all white men. Break word of truce. You speak of honor and murder with the same breath? We can kill you all. We wait for night. Then we kill I got a finger it's itching right now to wait for nothing. Little knife not afraid to die. 
Little knife. You... You took the belongings in the white man's wagon. Return the woman, and we let you keep it all. That and a hundred dollars in gold. You let little knife keep what he already has? Not a trade. Listen, you double distilled son of a gun. I seen a fair sized anthill down the canyon away. How'd you like to be staked out? I make good offer. Woman for guns and hundred dollars. You say no? I go back now. Soon as the night. Then we take your guns and the gold. The Indian turned and moved back up the slope. For a moment, I had an uncontrollable desire to shoot. Then I thought of the woman, of what would happen to her. I lowered the rifle. We shifted our positions a few yards to the right, and we lay there, waiting, and the darkness settled into the canyon. Funny thing. Huh? What? We ain't heard no sound from the woman. Yeah, I was thinking of that myself. Wonder if she's all right. Well, should be better than three quarter moon tonight. Coming up in a while. They gonna try something. It'll be afore the moon. Slim, I think we better sit back to back in case they circle around us. Yeah. I was just thinking. Wish I had me a drink of red eye right now. I know a place in Dodge. Tell you, Kendall, a shot of that tornado juice would draw a blood blister and a raw hide boot. <laughs> I'd like to see that. Shucks, that ain't nothing. Tell her what runs the saloon. He serves a free snake with every drink. Shh. Shh. That ain't what you think. It ain't no woman. That's an Indian. I know. I heard him before. They want us to think it's her. Are you sure? I'll show you. Hey, you crow bait dogs, which one of you is a squaw? See what I mean? Yes. One thing I don't understand. What's that? Why do they stay here? Why not ride off with the woman? Yeah, I figure there's two reasons. First, Little Knives probably left the reservation. He ain't got no particular place to go. Second, they want our guns. Indian will do a lot of fool things to get hold of a gun. Come to think of it, there's... There's something else. Oh? Yeah. Maybe they're low on bullets. You reckon? Yeah. It's quite possible. That's why they haven't attacked. Sure. Sure, they're using sharps for Peters. That feller's Winchester ain't the same caliber. So whatever shells they picked up in the wagon ain't worth a thing. In which case, we don't wait for them to attack us. Oh, I know what you're getting at, but it won't work. Well, why not? I wouldn't be no good. Not with his busted wing. Slim, you stay here. Cover me with the rifle. Uh-uh. No, he'll hear you before you get ten feet up the rise. Slim, I'll admit that I'm a comparative greenhorn in your territory, but I've had the dubious pleasure of slitting a number of throats under similar circumstances in India. Those chaps didn't hear me. I'll take my chances with these Arapaho. Are you, you going to use a knife? Oh, if I have to, yes. <laughs> You sure are a funny kind of Englishman. Here, take your rifle. Mister, I sure hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> so do I. I crawled out of the hollow and inched my way up the slope. I had seen the flash of the Indian's rifle and knew his approximate location. In the direction I was taking, I planned to reach the top of the hill some yards from where I had last seen him. It was slow. Slow. Then, as I raised my head over the summit, I saw the great orange glow of the rising moon, and silhouetted against it, the crouching form of an Indian half turned from me behind a boulder. I drew out my knife. <laughs> he died without a sound. Then I made out little knife and the remaining Indian. They were a few feet away, standing over a gagged and bound body. And in the constantly growing moonlight, I saw the chief bend down, the glitter of steel in his hand. This time I knew it would be a woman's scream I was going to hear. Little knife! Huh? Hey, look! Hey, look! 
It's all right, Slim. She's alive. She's all right. I cut the ropes, loosened the gag from the woman's mouth, and for a long moment she only looked at me. Then she began to cry. I carried her down the slope to where Slim was waiting. Then I went back to get the Indian horses and the things which had belonged to Belding and his wife. After that, Slim and I took her to Laramie in Wyoming Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jack Moyles as Slim and Lawrence Dobkin as Little Knife. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed, from the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat. These are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for, teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! how many people realize the power of the printed word. Of course, maybe you're wondering, too. Maybe you're wondering how come a frontier town lawyer like me, Chad Remington, should feel he's entitled to get up on a soapbox about the printed word, uh, newspapers, and the power of public opinion. Well, <laughs> like all lawyers, perhaps I'd better present my brief and see if I can't convince you just how important newspapers can be to a raw, tough territory like the frontier. Not too long ago, I received one of those infrequent telegrams signed by an old friend of my father's, Ike McCauley, who prints and publishes the greatest little newspaper in our part of the country, The Independent. Ike told me he was in trouble, intimating bad trouble, trouble that might need the advice of a lawyer, and I gathered a good deal more. So, mustering out that ex-medicine man, Cherokee O'Bannon, who runs the livery stable over which I have my tiny office, we started out for the toughest, most rowdy, and largest town any place west of Abilene, Dobie City, on two of the least spavined horses from Cherokee Stable. Can't my fat brain barrister, would you be so kind as to answer a question for me? Now, look here, O'Bannon. If it's anything to do with stopping in a barrel house before we get to Dobie City, the answer is a definite no. And you may be an attorney, my boy, but you're certainly not a mind reader. First off, should I choose to titillate my tonsils, I have a small flask of my genuine Cherokee and then rattlesnake oil with me. Second, that was not the question I was about to... Oh, oh, rain up, Cherokee. Compounded corruption was that? Well, it wasn't a bee or a blue tail fly. And I think if you'll look to your left and see the gentleman who's approaching us with a Winchester in his hands, you'll have your answer. To my Billy Blue Blazers, Chad. That is what is known in circles I no longer frequent as one tough looking barman. If you're just out for some target practice, mister, you got two more shots coming. A three for a nickel. I haven't had to practice with this rifle for twenty five years. I can hit any target I aim at any time. Well, then I take it your shot wasn't meant to hit either one of us, but it was just a friendly little greeting, huh? Yeah, uh, you might say it was friendly, because I'm here to give you some very friendly advice. Turn them cayuses around and head back where you come from. Have you the audacity to stand there and think that you own this country? Partner, I don't have to think. 
I know what I'm talking about, and I'm telling you to slope. Well, uh, I've found you can argue with a judge and argue with a jury, but you never get very far arguing with a Winchester that's aimed right at you. Dad, you mean to say that you're going to let this barrel-chested behemoth dictate to us? No, Cherokee, I, I mean I'm going to see that that rifle barrel gets pointed somewhat. <laughs> You bulldog him like a yelling calf. Friends, you better let go of that rifle before something snaps. Now, get up on your feet. Remington, now you are in trouble. Remington? You hear that, you Cherokee? This wasn't an accident. He was waiting for us. You try going on to Doby City, and you'll find other people waiting for you. The doctor and the undertaker. I'm afraid we won't need either one of them. I carry our embalming fluid right along with me. Who sent you out here? Who put you up to this? Well? But he sounds as dumb as he looks. I'm waiting for an answer. And you've got an awful long wait coming. Because I ain't... Hey, let go! You... Hey, excellent, Chad. Just proves the validity of the old saying. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Cherokee, I, I think we'd all be better off if you lend me a hand and help tie this critter up. I'd like a few hours in Doby City before he gets back and reports to whoever it is that doesn't want us there. It didn't take us long to get to Doby City after that and to find Ike McCauley from the office of the Independent. Ike's story was a strange one. Strange and mostly baffling. Chad, I know it doesn't make any sense, but that's the way it is. This other newspaper, this uh, new one, isn't too far from putting me completely out of business. Call if I can't understand how this other paper... What's its name again? The Doby Democrat. I can't understand how the owner not only can get these news items that you say are yours exclusively... But after getting them, how he gets them printed and his paper published before you do. If I knew the answer to that, Cherokee, I'm sure he wouldn't have telegraphed to me. Now, take the cattle prices that I supply every week. I started that several years ago, and it's a costly proposition. However, in cattle country like this, it's a real service to my readers to know what the prices are in Omaha, Kansas City, and the other big markets. Mm -hmm. Certainly is. Tells the ranchers where they can drive or ship to get the most money for their stock. But how do you get these prices, Mr. McCauley? Well, I have six men, one in each of the six large stockyard centers. And each Thursday night, they telegraph me the prevailing prices at the close of business for the week. And your competitor, this other paper, gets the same information at no expense at all? And gets it published and on the street from six to twelve hours before I do. Chad, I'm telling you, the way my circulation is falling off, I, I can't stay in business this another two months. Mm. Who, who owns or runs the other paper, I? A fellow by the name of Jason, who moved in here only recently. And if the rate he's going, will end up controlling practically everything around here by the simple device of influencing public opinion any way he wants it to go. Well, obviously he tried to influence us not to come into Dobie City. And it wasn't very public. That was quite personal. <laughs> Yeah, there's something very personal about a Winchester that's pointed right at you. I the obvious answer so seems to be that this Jason, whoever he is, is either paying for or stealing the information from someone who works for you. Man, I, I sure doubt that. You do? Why? Well, first, I have only two people working for me, and I trust them implicitly. And second... How could Jason get the information out of my composing room and still get his paper out half a day before mine? Yeah, that does seem to be a stumbling block. Uh, but let's get back to the people who worked for you first. Who are they? Well, my printer, Foley, he's been with me almost since I started publishing. And the only other help I have is my brother's daughter, Nellie, uh, my niece. Oh, what did he say? Young and attractive, he's no doubt? Yes, Nellie's only 23 and she's real pretty. I brought her in here when my brother died. All, all he left her was dead. How did that happen, Ike? I mean, you've always been reasonably well-to-do. Matter of fact, don't I remember your, your brother having been in his apartment or yours? And he was until he started drinking and gambling. I warned him about it for years. Then, finally, I, I had to let him go. Bought him out. But when Jim died, I felt the thing to do was to take care of Nellie. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to try a little experiment, Ike? 
Uh, this being Thursday, it's the day you get your telegrams from your stockyard correspondence, isn't it? Yes. The wire should be coming in any, any time now. Well, then, what, I, what I'd like to do after the telegrams get in is to change the prices before you turn them over to Nellie or Foley or whoever it is that takes charge of them. Change the price? That's right. And if there is a leak here, Jason will get the wrong information and print it in his paper, which won't do him any good, and will prove to us that the leak is here somewhere in this building. Well, I I didn't telegraph you not, not to take your advice, Chad. So if that's what you want to do, I'll, I'll string along with you. About an hour later, having hidden the telegrams with the real prices safely, we went back into the composing room and met Foley and Nelly. Now, let's see if we can't get this set up and on the street this time before the Democrat comes out. Uncle, I... I know you think that Mr. Jason is stealing this cattle price information from you somehow, but I don't think he's the kind of man who'd do it. Oh, really, Nellie? You, uh, you know Mr. Jason? Well, I've met him. He seems nice, real nice. And anyhow, why shouldn't he have his own men send him the prices just the way you're doing it, Uncle I? For the pure and simple reason that, well, he wouldn't spend a plug nickel if he could get it for nothing. Yeah, that's the way I feel about it. Well, then you know Jason, too, eh, Foley? Well, I don't actually know him. I mean, I've seen him like everybody else in Doby City has. <laughs> you can't miss him. Big ten-gallon white hat, checkered vest, boots embroidered with gold threads, smoking big cigars. <laughs> no, sir, any money that one spends, he spends on show. From your description, Foley, Mr. Jason sounds like he'd make a very successful medicine man. Uh, well, if we stand here flapping our jaws, the Independent never will get printed. So what do you say we go about our business and leave the newspaper to those who know about it? As soon as a reasonable time had elapsed, I left Cherokee at the hotel and walked down to the office of the Dobie City Democrat. I wanted to get my hands on a copy of their paper. I walked in and up to the counter. There was a man seated at the desk with his back toward me, engrossed in what he was writing. From the loud plaid shirt, I gathered it was Jason himself. There was a small stack of newly printed papers on the counter, and as long as the man in the office hadn't noticed me, I picked one up. There were the out-of-town cattle market prices in a box on the front page. But not the false prices we'd turned over to Nellie and Foley, the actual prices that had been telegraphed in. This was quite a shock. Only the first shock I got in that few moments... Because just then, the man turned around, got up, and walked over to the counter. Yes, sir. Is there something... Well, Chad. Chad Remington. Chip, what are you doing here? Where would you expect the owner of the paper to be if not in his office? What? You're Jason, the owner of the Democrat? Mm Mm-hmm. One and the same. And if the new name of Jason bothers you, (laughs) a numerologist told me to change it. Said that's why I never made a successful lawyer like you. You never even finished studying law. Yeah, I know, but my clients didn't. Well, what brings you in here, Chad? I came in to have a little talk with the owner of the paper. Now that I know it's you, I realize talking isn't going to do much good. Because as in the old days, Chip, we're again on the opposite sides of the fence. I got a feeling that before I'm through in Doby City, I'm going to bust down that fence and wrap the rails right around your stubborn head. Oh, is that so? Oh. Well, Chad... If you think you can do it, go right ahead and try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just try and see where it gets you. <laughs> because I think it'll only get you stretched out right up in Boot Hill. <laughs> we'll return to the second act of Five Gun Final, our exciting frontier town adventure in just a few moments. I 
found it pretty difficult to explain the genuine feeling of shock I suffered in finding Chip, the owner of the opposition paper. Not only did it make the job a little distasteful, but, well, knowing Chip, I knew he was slick and smooth and capable. Of course, that was only part of my frustration. The other part was finding the little scheme I'd devised of changing the prices that meant nothing. That Chip Jason's paper had the true and accurate cattle prices neatly boxed on page one. My first impulse was to walk out of the office with the half-meant warning I'd given Chip and let it go at that. But I couldn't quite bring myself to it. I hadn't seen him in about ten years. Not only was there a lot I wanted to say to him, but a lot I wanted him to remember. <laughs> You ought to sell your Blackstone and law library and go into the publishing business too, Chad. You can have the men who make the laws. When you're a newspaper publisher, you're the man who makes the men who make the laws. You haven't changed a bit, have you? No. Praises be. That is, I've gotten a little smarter, I think. My philosophy of life is actually just what it was when we were studying law together. Yeah, I remember. That's how you got your nickname, too. Chipper. Nothing ever bothered you, not even your conscience. How could my conscience bother me? I never had one. No, I guess not, or else you couldn't do things like this. Publish these stockyard quotations. Why, those quotations are the backbone of my success. A real public service to my readership. I wouldn't care if you bought the news. Oh, but I do. I pay a good price to get that cattle information. Don't lie to me, Chip. I'm not lying. I don't like to be called a liar. No real man does. You keep that up and you'll find out how real a man I am. You're the last man in the world I'd want to look at over the barrel of this. But if it comes to a showdown, well... You'll be making a mistake, Chad. I'm a pretty influential gent in this community. Too influential to trifle. But not quite influential enough to make me quit this case. That's up to you. Entirely. Especially if McAuliffe has enough money left to pay your fee. I'm not worried about my fee. Well, if the old man does run out of cash, he's still got that niece left. You know what I mean. <laughs> you better get out of here, Remington. Get out. And fast. And you better learn to talk like a gentleman if you remember how. Goodbye, Chad. Let's just make it hostile awake. And in case you don't remember, that means goodbye for now, but I will be seeing you again. <laughs> For me, Chad, I can't understand why you've got me chained to this hotel porch when we could be across the street in one of those places of entertainment. I told you before, old Bannon, I got some thinking to do. A lot of things. He told me that what's his name was no good when you knew him years ago. No, it isn't that Chip's just no good, but Hell, he's always felt that a man doesn't have to work for a living. Just work enough to get a little money, and then that money will bring power. I hope you're not going to let this. Uh... Your former friendship with this gentleman deter you from trying to clean this up. You ought to know me better than that. How can you clean something up when you don't know where he's getting the information? I thought surely that changing the figures in the telegrams today would... Well, go on, go ahead. Cherokee, look. Across the street. Across the... Well, well, I'll be blamed. Isn't that Nellie, Ike McCauley's niece? Sure is. And the gentleman she's with, who's holding her arm so closely, is Chip Jason. <laughs> Come on, Cherokee. We're going to follow those two, and after Chip takes her home, we're having a little talk with Miss Nellie. A mighty serious talk. I don't care what you say. Chip Jason's been the only person who's been decent to me ever since I've gone to work in this town. My dear Miss Nellie, you mean to stand there with your sweet little face looking angry? Tell me you think it's wise to consort with someone like this Chip Jason after all your Uncle Ike has done to you? Uncle Ike. The only thing he's done for me is to make me work for the money which really belonged to my father anyhow. Doggone it, Nellie. You shouldn't even think things like that, let alone say them. What right have you got to tell me what to do? Uncle Ike or not... What I do with my life after I get through working for that $12 a week he so magnanimously pays me is my own business. No one's life is their own business, Nellie, particularly when there's a sharpshooter like Chip Jason involved. Now, if you Leave me alone. Do you hear me? Leave me alone. That girl got a temper. She certainly didn't want to talk about it, did she? You, if you were selling your uncle out? Now, look, you old charlatan, there's not one shred of proof that she's selling out anybody. If she happens to be, it 
least she's admitted her motive. Somehow she seems to be very bitter about Ike being forced to buy out her father. Well, then... If Jason is getting the information from Ike's composing room, it still leaves Mr. Foley to check up on, if we want to be positive. Foley? How do you propose to do that? <laughs> I got a very unintelligent idea. Oh? Uh-huh. That, uh, you're going to like it. Am I? If Mr. Foley's like any of the printers I've ever known, then he's in one of the five saloons in town drinking. Why didn't I become a printer? So I'm going to advance you $10 and turn you loose to find Foley and buy him some drinks. Hallelujah. Counsels, curb your impatience. Sucker is at hand. I said to buy drinks for Mr. Foley. You've got to abstain yourself so you'll be able to pump Foley for whatever information you can get out of him. <laughs> that, sir, is not only placing Satan behind me, but in front of me and all around me. And hero that I am, I'm no man to fight off eight, Satan. Now, you better do as I tell you, Cherokee, because if you start imbibing, your head will be so big in the morning, I'll have no trouble hitting it with both of these fists. <laughs> now, go on, and don't drink anything but the chasers. Bartender, two more to save. Now, what was that you were saying again, Mr. Foley? Huh? I, no, I wasn't saying nothing, except he's to you. Here's mud in your eye. Down the old... Water. You, you want some water? Oh, here, we'll take mine. Uh, no, thank you. I have poor water. Oh, now that ain't healthy. Water's good for you. Water may be good for the average person, Mr. Foley, but I happen to be a man of iron. Water makes me rust. Now, what was that you were saying again? Something about good old Ike? Here's uh, good old Ike. As fine a man as ever run a newspaper. And the finest man I've ever worked for. Ah. Now, uh, let's have one on me, O'Bannon. Uh, no, I don't think so, Mr. Foley. If it's all the same to you, I'll be going over to my hotel and floating to bed. <clears throat> Water. Or the I may be amused now, but I certainly wasn't then. In the first place, it was a little disconcerting to learn that Foley loved Ike like a father and had no motive for selling him out to Chip Jason. And second, after six glasses of water and five drinks of good bourbon slyly spilled in the brass receptacle at the bar, Cherokee was no man to share a hotel room with. You know what they say about a woman spurned? Well, Cherokee had a fury that was much worse. And something else, Mr. Remington. Just for what you made me submit to... Starting the first of the month, I'm raising your rent five dollars. Oh, go on, you old fraud. That sublime sense of self-sacrifice you're enjoying is making you feel so holy that even a teetotaler like me can't stand you around. I should get Satan behind you and help him push. Now, are you sure that's all Foley said? I have never been more cold sober in my life. And I assure you, I've repeated every word he said verbatim. And since my brain is clear as it is, I'll save you a lot of trouble by telling you that there's no doubt Nellie is selling out her uncle. I'm uh, right? sorry, Cherokee, but while you were wrestling with Satan, I concluded it can't be Nellie. Can't be? Nope. Thirty minutes after we gave Nellie the cattle prices to set up, Chip's paper was printed with the accurate information. There's only one way that could have happened. That Chip had access to the telegrams before I got them. Can this be possible? Well, we'll soon find out. Because in your precarious, sober state, you're taking a horse and riding over to Acacia Springs. Acacia Springs? Acacia Springs. And you're going right to the Western Union office and send a telegram from there stating that there's been a flood which has closed Doskin Pass and that any ranchers wanting to drive their cattle to the railroad had better pick another route. What do you expect to accomplish by that kind of a telegram filled with misinformation? I expect to wind this thing up by tomorrow and get back home where I won't have to occupy a room with you moaning like the ancient mariner. Now, now go on, Cherokee. Get going. Chip Jason couldn't wait for his regular edition. He came out with a special edition with a banner line in 72-point type announcing the flash flood that had closed Doskin Pass. Five minutes after the paper hit the street, the town marshal had arrested the local telegraph operator. And armed only with his confession, I set out to pay one more call on my old friend Chip. Where I give my news is my business, Chan. Chip, you're in for a big disappointment. Because the only real news in Dobie City right now is this headline in the Independent. Here. Dobie said Jason arrested for fraud. Are you local? This is an out-and-out lie. Oh, then I suppose this is, too. 
This confession from the telegraph operator that he'd been taking money from you to give you all news information that came over the Western Union wires. Why, that's a lot of... <laughs> you were pretty smart, weren't you, Chad? And so were you, playing up to Nellie McCarliff and taking her out in public to make it appear that she was giving you the information. That was pretty slick, too. I should have known you'd have figured that. Well, there's only one thing wrong with this headline, Chad. They haven't arrested me yet, and they're not going to. You're right about that. They aren't going to arrest you. I am. And I'm placed... Chip, leave that gun alone. I'm sorry you made me do that, Chip. You went for your gun first. I know you're in the deep end. You said you were going to wrap that fence rail right around my head. The only thing you hit were my stomach and shoulder. <laughs> Operator, Chad. I was bothered about how Chip got the news so far in advance of the time when Ike got the telegrams. But what cinched it in my mind was remembering what happened to us the other day on the way to Dolby City. You mean about that gun toter who tried to warn us to go back home? Exactly. Since Ike sent me a telegram asking me to come over, someone must have had access to the wire. Of course. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> because you were too busy wrestling with Satan. Well, now that it's all over, I suppose there's no harm in telling you that I wrestled with him and won the bone. But I did it with a little trick. Oh, so? What trick was that? Well, Satan got me down once and knocked the wind out of me. Knowing I needed some stimulation to win the bout, I took three small slugs of bourbon while he wasn't looking. Then I got up and threw him horns, hoofs over hoofs, and right out of the rain. Well, <laughs> the dickens you did. The devil I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Raymond Burr as Captain Lee Quince. Specially transcribed tales of the dark and tragic ground of the wild frontier, the saga of fighting men who rode the rim of empire, and the dramatic story of Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry. He's in there. Red Horse is dying, Captain. He sent for me. And you have come. Red Horse alone believed you would come. He's an old friend. Is he alone? The great spirit chief is near. But Red Horse is alone. He waits for you and Snowfoot. Yeah. My old friend, come sit by me. Thank you, Red Horse. I knew you would come. There's a feel of the heart between us. I sent for you and Snowfoot, my son. And I knew you would come. Will Snowfoot come? As a father, I hope he will. As a man, I know he will not. I cannot blame him. I can. 
To come to me is to come on to the reservation. Snowfoot will never do that. He is young and certain of many things. Snowfoot's how old now? About 15? As the last leaves fall from the trees before the first snowfall, my son will begin his 16th winter. His mind moves quickly, but he is yet too young for wisdom. If he is all you say, maybe the wisdom will come. But he's heading for trouble, Red Horse. He and that pack of young braves with him. So far, they're content to ride fast and make a lot of noise. That won't last, you know. Snowfoot has not killed. Not yet, as far as we know. But he's wild. He'll be looking for coup feathers. You don't get them running off horses and firing empty cabins. These are my mistakes he is making. You know better than that, Red Horse. My good friend, believe what I say. I know better in this moment than I have ever known. It is the privilege of the very old as well as the very young to be certain. And the years in between? You are living them. They are a time of learning and unlearning, of being right and being wrong, of slow courage and quick anger, years of growing. If it's in a man to grow. I put food in his mouth that he might grow strong of body. But I fed his mind on bitterness and hate. I take credit for one. I must take blame for the other. You're... You're tired, Red Horse. I'll... I'll go now. Come another time. My good friend, there can be no other time. You and I have always shared wise counsel. You think a fever speaks in me. Because you never saw the part of Red Horse which knew hate and bitterness, but it was there. And at my knee in this lodge, Snowfoot learned to distrust the white man. It's time he learned otherwise. It's time he thought for himself. If he were at my side, I would tell him that. Would he listen? I am his father. You sent for him as his father. He's not here. My heart knows that well. Red Horse, I came here as your friend. I speak as your friend. If Snowfoot finds trouble, it's his trouble, not yours. If I find him, I'll deal with him as I find him, as Snowfoot, not as a son of Red Horse. You prove you are my friend. You speak to me now as you have always spoken. There are those who promise empty words to a dying man. To do this would be to dishonor our friendship. And when I find him? Tell him a chief stands straight among all people. Tell him a man cannot stand straight when his mind is crooked. I can promise that, Red Horse. You give me peace. Go now, my friend. You cannot hear him come, but he is near. The great spirit chief comes only for Red Horse. Red Horse, I... Have no fear. It is a gentle time. And I am ready. You are the one who sent for Snowfoot? I rode to his camp myself. Where is his camp? On Dry Fork, near the joining waters of the Powder River. You think he will come with you, Captain? I don't know. I told him Red Horse was dying. He called it White Man's Trick to get him to come on the reservation. I hope you reach him in time. It's too late for Red Horse. It may even be too late for Snowfoot. Pick up 
pickets are out, sir. I just wrote check on camp. Everything's quiet. Too quiet for me, Mr. Syberts. Has Sergeant Gorse returned from the telegraphers? Not yet, Captain. You expect trouble? I expect quiet. Patrolling the reservation is a quiet business. Death is a quiet time. It's all too much quiet, Mr. Syberts. Your friend Red Horse is dead? Yes. Before I'd reached the agent's house... The death song had begun. Indian ways are primitive. I don't understand them. You understand funerals? Funerals? Anybody's funeral. White man, red man. A man dies with dignity, but the mourners wail. Music plays. Songs are sung. I guess you're right. Yeah. I, uh... Telegraph the Major for new orders, Mr. Syberts. If they come through, you'll be in charge of the patrol here. New orders, Captain? I want to go after Snowfoot. You know where he is? His camp's on Dry Fork, north of here, where it joins the Powder River. Snowfoot's been quiet, Captain. He hasn't been raiding lately, unless you have new information. If he's done nothing, he'll be easier to talk to. I don't see your sentimental side often. You think you see it now, Mr. Syberts? Red Horse was your friend. You're doing this for him, aren't you? Red Horse is dead. I couldn't do anything for him now if I wanted to. I'm sorry, Captain. I know he meant a lot to you. I'll tell you what means a lot to me, Mr. Syberts. I'd like to be out of a job. I'd like the whole army in the West to be out of a job. That'd mean a lot to me. I don't understand. When they talk peace... Real peace. The red men and the white men, they won't need an army out here. Snowfoot's a young Indian. There's hope in him. If we can talk to him now before he starts killing, if we can get him and his young band to come on the reservation, they they might help us write that peace. I can't imagine you out of the army, Captain Quince. I might surprise you, Mr. Syberts. Yes, sir, I think you might. You think the Major feels like you do? I mean, you think he'll let you go after Snowfoot? I don't know. I telegraphed him from the Indian agents this morning. I should have heard by now. Suppose the Major says, all right, go after Snowfoot. Will Snowfoot listen to you? I think he'll listen. That doesn't mean he'll do as I say. Captain Quint, sir? Oh, come in, Sergeant. Captain, Lieutenant. Telegrapher just got it, sir. Uh, Turn up that lantern, Mr. Syberts. Yes, sir. We have new orders, Mr. Syberts. We? I mean, all of us? All of us. We'll be joined by reinforcements to bring us up to company strength in the morning. Our orders are to move north against Black Eagle. Black Eagle? He's a real savage, Mr. Syberts. Sergeant Gores? Yes, sir. You've heard the orders. Pass the word. See, we're ready to break camp, move out half an hour after Reveille. Yes, sir. Uh, How far north are we going, Captain? To Powder River, Sergeant. Near Dry Fork. Yes, sir. Captain, that's where you said Snowfoot makes his camp. Well, Mr. Syberts? Then maybe it's Snowfoot we're after and not Black Eagle? The Major's telegram says Black Eagle, Mr. Syberts. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, what about your request for new orders to go after Snowfoot? They were denied. We have a hard day of riding ahead, Mr. Syberts. Uh, yes, sir. I think I'll turn in early. Good night, Captain. Good night. This is Dry Fork we're following, Captain? That's right, Mr. Syberts. Water in it. Yeah, looks like it. I guess it doesn't have to be dry just because that's its name. Over east of here, near the Black Hills country, there's a scrawny little stream called Old Woman Creek. I say what you mean, Captain. Do you? Sure, just because of its name doesn't mean there's an old woman in it. It was the last time I saw it. You're joshing me, Captain. Old Indian squaw standing knee-deep washing clothes. Guess you just can't tell. Guess you just can't, Mr. Syberts. Back there a ways, Captain, where we found those settlers butchered. That was Black Eagle's work? Yeah, it looked like it. 
Why not Snowfoot? Oh, the way it was done. It was a big raid, a lot of horses. From all we know, Snowfoot has a small camp. Not over 20 braves ride with him. It was Black Eagle or someone like him with old enemies. The settlers were old enemies? Yeah, at least two of them were. The two men who weren't scalped. I wondered about that. Yeah, there's an old belief among some Indians that an unscalped enemy suffers after death. So if you gotta be killed by an Indian, Mr. Seibert, make sure he hates your guts. Well, sure try, Captain. About three hours of daylight left. If we keep up this pace, we should make our rendezvous by sundown. Got Maid's infantry closing in from the east, sir? Yeah. Started over in Black Hills country, Mr. Seibert, near Old Woman Creek. <laughs> Wonder if old squaw is still at her laundry work. Maybe so, Mr. Seibert. Maybe so. Looks like Sergeant Gorse, Captain. Yeah, I wonder what happened to his scouting party. Company! Company! Halt! Captain Quint, sir? Sergeant? Just ahead, over the rise near the wash, the settler. It was a raid, sir, not too long ago. The fire's fresh, Captain. And the settler? Still alive, sir. Company! Company! At the gallop! At the gallop! At the gallop! Oh! Doesn't look much like the last settlers, Gorse. How much? How much at all? I count six arrows. You count them all, too. Mm. One shed fired. Cabin's all right. You look inside? It's neat in there, Captain. Like somebody give it good care. It's been read up recent like. Nobody in there? Nobody. How about the barn? Ice house? Nobody around. Nothing torn up, throwed around. Funniest kind of engine raid I ever heard tell. Not many of them either, judging from the hoof marks. I'd say they were riding west, Sergeant. Bearing toward Powder River, sir. Hmm. Yeah, let's have a look at that settler. Lieutenant Seibert's been looking to his knees. Back there, Captain, the other settlers' the engines was riding east. I know. Yes, sir. Looks lucky that's all they did. You, uh... Feeling better, mister? Yeah, just telling the lieutenant here. None the worse for wear, near as I can tell. Head wound, Captain. Head wound. Yeah, lean over, mister. Uh, yeah, skin's broken a little. You got yourself a good-sized knot there. Feels like a boulder, but it don't hurt much. Well, it will. <laughs> What'd they hit you with? Hit me. You're all bound and determined I was hit, ain't you? Well, sir, I wasn't. I fell right over my big feet getting out of their way. Cracked my head a good one against that rock yonder. And that's the size of it. Getting out of their way? Who are they? They were the Comanches, of course. Comanches? Well, Indians, they're all Comanches to me. And these was bellering like Comanches, you take my word. Yipping and screaming. Didn't know what I'd die of first. Cracking my head or the noise? Well, for all their noise, they didn't do much damage. Uh, how many Indians, mister? Oh, dozen, I'd say, maybe more, but not many more, mind you. I might have missed a few, seeing they was through here and gone like the wind. We're figuring they rode through here to the west. That right? That way. Yeah, yeah, west, toward Powder River. Oh, uh, there's something else you can figure on while you're about it. Uh, what's that? Well, they was young, real young. <laughs> I guess they'd have to be bellering and yipping that away. Yes, indeedy. Mighty young. (laughs) 
Captain Mead will have to get a move on if he expects to make camp with us before nightfall, Captain. Yeah, I thought he'd beat us here. You worried about Snowfoot, sir? Worried, Mr. Seibertz? His camp can't be far away. Not far. It's less than ten miles to Powder River. Are you going after him? My orders are to engage Black Eagle, Mr. Seibertz. Well, I know that, sir, but if Snowfoot's I so intend far... to follow my orders, Mr. Seibertz. Yes, sir. Uh, got a message for Captain Quince. I'm Captain Quince. Message from Captain Mead, sir. No, oh, thank you. Yeah. Mead engaged Black Eagle at Porcupine Creek. Trapped him. Was a rout. Black Eagle? He's dead. Any reply, sir? Yeah, my compliments to Captain Mead. Tell him tell him well done. Yes, sir. How long since you ate, soldier? Been a spell, sir, since early morning. And Sergeant Gorse! We'll see you get some hot food, soldier. Oblige, sir. What about our orders now, Captain? Our orders are clear, Mr. Seibertz. Captain? Sergeant, see this man gets food and rest, see his horse is tended to. Report back to me in half an hour. Yes, sir. Come on, soldier. Captain Quince, about our orders... The company will start back to Fort Laramie in the morning. Any questions? No, sir. I'll be in my tent, Mr. Seibertz. Yes, sir. I'm crazy, Gores? Maybe not crazy, but you're sure acting like a man who wants to get himself captured. And suppose you wanted to talk to Snowfoot one man to another. You know any better way than to go to his camp alone? The way you want to talk to him unofficial-like? No, I don't know a better way. You want him to hold top hand, don't you, Cap? Yeah, he has to, Gores. Mm. There ain't many engine camps I'd walk into alone, but... If I had my pick, I'd take Snowfoot's. You'll help Mr. Seibert's understand this, won't you, Sergeant? <laughs> now, that might be a lifetime job, Captain. It's got to be between Snowfoot and me, not the Army and a young Indian band, if it's going to do any good. Well, he'll have scouts out. You set to handle them? If I have to. I'd rather they captured me. Captain Quince, if you figured you was going to get yourself killed... I'm not figuring that way, or I wouldn't do it. Do you know that, Gorse? Yes, sir, I do. Or I'd have to tag along one way or another. Snowfoot hasn't killed yet. I don't see him counting me uh, his first coup. I sure wish you luck, Captain. Yeah, thank you, Gorse. See you back at Fort Laramie. <laughs> His trick, his white man's trick. You see, Snowfoot, by morning white man's army come. Trick belongs to Snowfoot, Spotted Dog. Go now, call the council together. I will speak to them when I have finished with White Captain. But Snowfoot... Go now! That your whole band, Snowfoot? We have scouts out. We make up in young strength what we lack in number. So, we trick you, White Captain. You did? Raids of Snowfoot bring much fear to White Man, or White Captain would not be here. You're not thinking very straight, Snowfoot. I knew White Man would come. I know you, White Captain, would come, friend of my father. I have a message from your father. My father is dead. Before he died, he asked me to tell you that a chief stands straight among all people. That a man cannot stand straight when his mind is crooked. He was an old man, my father. Old men stoop, grow soft, with the mind of a squaw. Old men go to reservation to make friend with white men, and to die. Your father was a proud chief, Snowfoot, and a wise one. Before he made friends with white men, yes. What do you want from the white man? My hunting grounds. The right to move in peace among my own people, on my own lands. Do you think you'll get what you want this way? It is the only way. You don't know what you're talking about. Your words are like your raids, a lot of noise and not much meaning. My raids have brought white captain. 
White man now sees the power of Snowfoot. You don't believe that yourself. White captain speaks big words for a captain. What do you do with your captive, Snowfoot? Snowfoot has his ways. You never captured a thing but a few horses. You never killed a thing but game. That's why I think maybe there's some hope for you. White captain is prisoner. Big coup for Snowfoot. Tomorrow, white army men come. Talk terms with Snowfoot for release of white captain. They won't come tomorrow, Snowfoot, because I'm not big enough. And because you're not big enough. They will come. If I were a general, if you were sitting bull, maybe. But we're not. We're just a couple of men this country could use. They will come. A lot of young braves like you are hunting on the reservation and fishing and sitting at council tables with white men. White men will come. Bring counsel to Snowfoot. Make peace on Snowfoot's terms. You'll see, Snowfoot. We're not big enough. White captain has said no white men come. And they do not come, Spotted Dog. Our scouts have seen them move away. Two sons have gone. And I have watched you, Snowfoot. Much power with White Captain. You grow weak on his words. You speak with a crooked mind, Spotted Dog. There is room for strength in the mind as in the body. Now you speak as our fathers before us. We are our father's sons, Spotted Dog. White Captain, bad medicine. Then we will rid the camp of him. Kill? You will get White Captain's horse, Spotted Dog. Now. You will go, White Captain. You will return to the white man. Show them you knew no harm in Snowfoot's camp. Yes, I'll show them. They will see I am proud chief, worthy of counsel. Maybe they will. There's always counsel waiting for you on the reservation, Snowfoot. The reservation holds grave of my father, and I am my father's son. You will go now, White Captain. Cybert, good to see you. Good to see you, Captain. You all right, sir? I'm all right. How's Major Daggett? Uh, I guess he's fine, sir. He was worried about you. Sent me back with the patrol as soon as we reached Fort Laramie. How far have you ridden, sir? Oh, 10, 20 miles. Well, looks like you made out, Captain. I'll know better later on, Sergeant. Well, anyways, they didn't kill you. Oh, they decided I wasn't important enough. Well, we're here to show them you are, Captain. We'll give them something they can understand. What are your orders, Mr. Seibertz? Why, to rescue you, sir. Do I look like a prisoner to you, Mr. Seibertz? You look fine to me, Captain, but shouldn't... I mean, we can't let them get by with what they did, sir. They did nothing. I rode into their camp, and I rode away, unharmed. Well, that's true enough. You but... were to secure my release and return to Fort Laramie. That right, Mr. Seibertz? That's exactly right, sir. I suggest we follow those orders. But what about Snowfoot, Captain? He's Red Horse's son. I think we'll see him on the reservation someday. I hope so. Fort Laramie is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars Raymond Burr as Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry, with Vic Perrin as Sergeant Gorse. The script was specially written for Fort Laramie by Kathleen Height, with sound patterns by Bill James and Ray Kemper. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. 
Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Jeffrey Silver, Ralph Moody, Lee Millar, Frank Cady, Lou Krugman, and Jack Moyles. Company, tension! Dismiss! Next week, another transcribed story of the Northwest Frontier and the troopers who fought under Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry. This land of the gunhawks. It's one that took place a long ways from the old bar 20. Owen Lomax, the son of an old friend of mine, had gotten into a shooting scrape and hit the Owl Hoot Trail, not knowing that the man he'd shot recovered and cleared him. Owen's dad asked me to try and bring the boy back before he got into real trouble. Owen's trail led into the Cherokee Strip, the Indian Territory, where outlaws from all over the West took shelter. California and I finally tracked him through the Badlands to the town of Lance the headquarters for Three Jack's gang of bandits. Wow, it's hot. And water country. Nothing but engines and outlaws and rocks. And Owen Lomax, California. If he rode in to join Three Jack's gang, he'll be in Lance. That's their hangout. Yes, sir. Nice sociable country with bandits for leading citizens. <laughs> oh, stop complaining. We'll probably have a nice peaceful visit. Somebody shooting rabbits? And uh, these badlands, it's more likely someone shooting men. Those shots are coming from over that rise. Wait here and I'll take a look on foot. What you see, Hoppy? Four hombres ganging up on one man down in the basin. Looks like they shot his horse. Horse to one? That's kind of tough odds. I was thinking the same thing. Let's even it up a little. Unliver your gun, California, but shoot over their head. We don't want to plug anyone until after we know what the play is all about. Well, <laughs> look at them scamper. Yeah, they don't act like four to three are good odds. Let's get down and see who we rescued. Hi, stranger. What was the shooting about? Buenos dias, senores. You have arrived in time to save my life, you think? I am Don Patrick Manuel Brian Esteban of Flaherty, Italia Ferro, at your service. Er, uh, all of that are you? Si, sí, senor, but you can call me Don Patrick. I think I will accompany you if you are headed toward Lance. But your horse has been shot. <laughs> it is but the little trick we play. Yevete, senor Cleveland. Your horse is named Cleveland? After your great presidente, senor. Like him, mi caballo is good at the running. Oh, Hoppy, do we have to listen to his jokes? No, we don't. Maybe you'd better ride on by yourself, Don Patrick. For me, that is fine. But you need my help. This town of Lancet has a bad habit, senor. I'll bet. What is it? You? Senor, please. It is that for men of honest face like yourself, Lance has the habit of arranging special welcome. Yeah? Uh, you mean like a dance? I mean like the murder. <laughs> Now, back to Hopalong Cassidy and our story, Land of the Gunhawks. Trailing Owen Lomax to the Cherokee Strip Badlands, Hoppy and California bring news they hope will make him return home. But as they near the town of Lance, hangout for Three Jacks' gang of bandits, they are delayed for the rescue of Don Patrick O'Flaherty, who warns them that Lance has no welcome for any but outlaws. So, senores, if your occupation is not dishonest, I would suggest you do not reveal it in Lance. I have the idea you will be compadres of mine. I will tell the town of Lance that you are Wild Bill Cassidy, bad man from the Big Ben country, and you, viejo, will be Fingers Carlson, the horse thief. Hoppy, did you hear that? I'm going to shoot him, so help me. Uh... <laughs> yeah, easy, Fingers. Don Patrick has a good idea. If Three Jacks thinks we're just another pair of outlaws, we'll be a lot safer until we locate Owen. You must be very careful. No one knows this Three Jacks. You mean this Three Jacks has never been seen? Not by anyone who lives, except his straw boss, Link Schofield. 
No one has seen three jacks without the mask. Then uh, even you may be him. If so, senor, you're as good as dead men right now. But look, we're coming into town. See? Lance has put up this signpost. I can see. Lance, population 340 Indians, 61 white men, and four sheriffs dead. <laughs> ah, there's Don Patrick Callop. I mean fingers. Let's join him. Uh, right, Rafi. Uh, I mean, Wild Bill Cassidy. Don Patrick, you get thirsty too? Si, sí, senor. What will you have? Sarsaparilla for me. But of course. Bartender. Yeah, friend. What's the poison? For me, amigo, one. Uh, senor Cassidy. Yeah? Tell me my ears are no good. What was your order? Sarsaparilla. Then I did hear right. Uh, perhaps it is better if you order for yourself. Wild Bill from Big Ben. <laughs> Uh, bartender, give us a couple of sarsaparillas. You can call me weepy, but I ain't got no sarsaparilla. And maybe you got water? Why? You dirty? Uh, well, I, er, uh, oh, what's the use? Uh, I'll tell you what, weepy. We'll settle for an introduction to Link Schofield. Introduction? Well, I'll tell you. If you turn and spit, you'll sure hit him. Only I wouldn't advise it. Because he can throw that knife he's playing with through a knot hole at 20 paces. Amateur. What? <laughs> hey, Schofield. Yeah? This caballero says you're an amateur with that knife. How about a match? He does, huh? Sure, Don Patrick. What'll it be for? Money or chalk? Shall we say a thousand dollars, senor? Oh, a weepy. You've been feeding this guy too much rot gut. My pardon, senor. I thought you wished a wager. If it is sport you want. Oh, that's sonny. You can shout a thousand. You got a bet. And if you can't, I'm liable to slice those pretty ears off to teach you not to brag. It would be the dangerous lesson to teach, senor. But to save your life, I will obtain the money. Watch, Weepy. I'll bet I can sink this knife right through that spot on the back of the shirt. Hold it, Schofield. You throw that knife and I'll give you some lead with it. Oh, I forgot. You're his compadres, aren't you? Just drop the knife, then we'll get friendly. I never like to drop it. It might break the handle. But I'll put it away. And don't get the idea your gun counts for much. Those guys at the tables have had you covered since you walked in. Oh? Well, in that case, end of hostilities. The gun's up. Uh, by the way, I don't think you've introduced me to your friend. <laughs> you have got a nerve. Maybe my friends won't like that. Want a bet? <laughs> you know, I have a hunch you're going to be an asset to Lance Cassidy. Either that or you're going to get awful dead. All right. I'm right to left. Slim, Tony and Big Ear. Next table. The kid, Soapy and Vic. In the back, playing cards, Tennessee, Pete and Frenchie. Sweet bunch of cutthroats. What the hell did you pick them out of? Oh, now you start to ask questions, Cassidy. Lose the habit. Yeah? What happens if I don't? <laughs> I think I see what you mean. <laughs> When do we leave? Why, fingers. Didn't you enjoy our visit with Mr. Schofield? I never was so darn scared in my life. That grinning ape talks too soft, and those fellas sitting around holding guns on us. Hoppy, my knees were knocking so hard, a plumb near fell down. What? Oh, <laughs> what California. With those bow legs, you couldn't knock your knees if you had to. But at least we did find Owen Lomax. We, uh, we found... Hoppy, you been out in the sun too long? No, it was simple. Most of Three Jack's gang were there, and only one young enough to be Owen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, the sprout with the floppy hair? The one Schofield called the kid. It's Owen. Looks a lot like his dad, too. Doggone it, Hoppy. I get bad feelings about this whole thing. Ah, take it easy. That's why we came back to the shack. We can see the saloon from here. If the kid comes out alone, I'll ease out in Shanghai. We may be out of this town with the job done today. I hope so. I'd sure like to be heading home. Here. Here, take a look. Isn't that the kid walking toward the cafe across the street? Where? Uh, yeah, sure is, Hoppy. And he's all by his lonesome. Stay here. I'll get him. Hey, kid. Kid. Yeah? Oh, it's you. 
What do you want? I'd like to have a little talk with you. Come into the shack. Well, sure. What's it about? In a minute, kid. Hey, I, that was a nervy thing you did, Brayson Schofield. I wouldn't be surprised if Three Jacks invited you to join us. That would be good. Well, you must be joking. Well, he's got the best gang in the whole territory. Hiya, fingers. Uh, what? Uh, oh, uh, howdy, kid. Sit down, Owen. You're going to listen to a little straight talk. Sure. Hey, what did you call me? Owen. That's your name, isn't it? Owen Lomax. We trailed you here. What? The, the law. You're the dirty, stinking law. We're friends of your dad. He just happens to be a man that doesn't deserve the heartache you've given him. Oh, I get it. You're a preacher. Well, go on. Sing me a psalm. Look. Maybe you had reason to think the cards were stacked against you. The man you shot didn't die. He recovered and has admitted it was self-defense. So you can come home now. You through? Maybe Hoppy is, but I ain't, youngster. We've ridden a lot of miles and stuck our necks into a lot of danger to give you this chance to go straight. And by heck, you're gonna take it. Oh, man, you got a big surprise coming if that's what you think. <laughs> oh, wait till three jacks hears about you guys. Er you mean you're going to turn us in after we come to save your hide? I sure would, mister. Hoppy, we can't let him go now. I know it, California. I guess we'll have to do this the hard way. You can stop the bluffs. You wouldn't dare pull anything off here in the middle of Three Jacks Town. Son, you'd be surprised at what I'd dare. Sorry you couldn't see it our way, but I guess you will in time. Excuse me, I... Hey, what... Oh. Oh. Well, he'll be quiet till we're ready to pull out. Rustle up our horses as quick as you can. Right, Hoppy. Now, I'll just hoist you over on the bed, kid. California! Hey, 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 hey. Hoppy! Two fellas were just plugged right across the street. Sure, for a moment I was afraid it was you. They come riding up to the hitch rack and the shotgun let go from between those buildings. Better go get our horses. We want to get out of here as quick as we can. Uh, right, Hoppy. Senor Cassidy. Hi, Don Patrick. What's the shooting about? It looks as if still another person takes the hand in my affairs. Those two men who were shot were part of the group that attacked me this morning. Who shot them? Gen Savi. I can ease your mind, gents. The killer was three jacks. He told me he was going to get those men who were trespassing in his territory. Three jacks don't like... Don't feel grab him. Oh! All oh, that, Cassidy. I'm Patrick Cobra. Si, sí, senor, but what is this? He's a lawman, Schofield. He and his pal came to take me back to hang. But you must be mistaken, kid. They saved my life this morning. They're law, I tell you. Thanks, Owen. Oh, shut up. Schofield, they're not outlaws, and he knocked me out. Look at my jaw. I slumped. Cassidy, you're in trouble. Get his guns, kid. Sure, sure. While you're at it, Owen, take a look at those men three jacks just bushwhacked. Your brave idol is just a plain murderer. Shut up. Kid, hand me one of those guns. Thanks. Now, Cassidy, I'm going to teach you not to talk so much. Like this. Wait, I... Oh! oh. Feel good? <laughs> I used to be pretty good at pistol whipping. Uh, senor, maybe this uh, three jacks he not like this. <laughs> I don't think he'll mind. But take him and lock him in a shack for now. Kid, get the boys and round up the old geese and throw them in with this one. I'll check with three jacks to see what to do with them. Oh, Cassidy, uh, I wouldn't make any long-range plans if I were you. <laughs> no, sir, I sure wouldn't. <laughs> Now, back to Hopalong Cassidy and our story, Land of the Gunhawks. Hoppy and California have really met up with the bad men of the town of Lance while searching for Owen Lomax, son of a friend of Hoppy's, a young lad who apparently has gotten in with a band of outlaws. Both Hoppy and California are prisoners of Link Schofield at present, with little or no chance of escape. You could do with a little breakfast. Morning, Weepy. You the jailer as well as bartender? Uh, me? I'm anything they want to use me for. Folks take advantage of a sick man like me that's not able to ride and fight like the others. Here, I'll get it down. Hey, that sure smells good. Uh, uh, what you feeding us for? Fattening us up for the kill? Now, I'm the guy you should ask. How should I know? Where's Schofield? We've seen no one since yesterday. What's going on? That's right, badger me. I ain't got enough troubles with my back ailing me again. 
And the doc says I gotta go to bed for a week. But you guys gotta badger me. Well, you must know something. You know, we can pay you. Huh? You can. Here's twenty dollars that's yours if you'll tell us what's being planned. Oh. Right pretty, these gold pieces. Well, reckon won't hurt to tell you. Seems that Schofield's getting the gang together for a raid. Three Jacks decided you're to ride with them. One way, that is. Yeah? Where's the raid going to be? Some town in Texas, just across the border from the territory, named Colville. Uh, but that's all I know. You hombres best eat hearty. You got a lot of riding to do. <laughs> and I guess a lot of dying to do. I'll pick up the tray later. On and wavy. How's the prisoners? Tolerable, Schofield. Tolerable. Sleep well, gents. Oh, fine. Nothing like the prospect of being murdered to make you rest easy. I wish I could get my hands on that double-crossing kid. You better wish for a bulletproof gizzard, old man. You two are joining our raid into Colville. Three Jacks figures maybe they'll throw suspicion off our gang when they find your bodies. So eat fast. We ride in 20 minutes. We are not far from our destination, senores. Don Patrick, where are all these riders coming from? We seem to pick up a half a dozen at each turn of the rocks. It is the combination of many small outfits, senor. The idea of three jacks. He intends to wipe out the town of Colville completely. The whole town? He's plum loco. Is he, Senor Carlson? Take a look. There are over 60 men in this bandit army now. Given the advantage of surprise, they will take Colville by storm, long before resistance can be made. Hey, Don Patrick. Untie Cassidy and Carlson's hands and feet. I want to give those rope marks enough time to disappear before their bodies are found. A kid! Yeah? Scout on ahead and see how the land lies. We want to pull us attack just before sunup. Right, Gofield? It must be closer than I thought. The time draws near. Yeah. Who's to be our executioner? It is said that three jacks will appear during the battle. Your death is to be his pleasure. Turn, have ever heard of such a bloodthirsty galoot as this three jacks? See, si, senor. Uh, there. You are untied. Now, if you will excuse me, I have the words to make with senor Scofield. California, we have to warn that town. We can't let them be massacred like this. Well, sure, I know, Hoppy, but we're due to get massacred a little ourselves. Uh, how are we going to warn them? I'm going to try a break. When we hit that ravine ahead, there should be cutoffs in it. When we come to one, I'm going to make a run for it. This dark, I might make it. Right, Hoppy. I'll rear my horse and try to confuse them a little. We're entering the ravine. Get set. I think I see a cutoff. Hold up, everyone! Hold up! I guess I'm not leaving. Sophie! You and Big Ear take the prisoners up front. Put ropes on their horses just in case they get any bright ideas. Right. Colville's just over the next hump, men. Now check your guns. We'll go in just as soon as the kid brings us the okay. You take the old buzzard, Big Ear. I'll dab my loop on Wild Bill's horse. Senor Schofield, three jacks is coming soon. He'll be here to take care of those two prisoners. The young one, he's late. Perhaps all is not well with the plan. Well, a kid would have signaled if anything was wrong. If you don't get back before time for us to move in, it'll be his hard luck. He'll get caught smacking a crossfire. And it'll serve him right. Look, Senor Schofield, the moon. She's starting to hide her face in the clouds. Yeah, that's what we want. All right, get set, men. All right, get set. I'll have to try it on foot, California. I can't take the rope off Topper, and we can't wait any longer. Right, Hoppy. I'll do my part, but... Before you go, I... I, um... What? Oh, nothing. Just take care of yourself. Thanks, partner. So long. Hey, come back! He's making a break! Hey, hey! Run, Virginia! Hey! Something you fool! I told you to keep alert! Tennessee! Big ear! Throw him when he tops that hump! Hoppy, hoppy! Keep down! There he is! Get him! You got him! He's down! Why, you low-down, dirty killers, you... Slippy slap this guy! Yeah. Hey, no! Uh, uh. Uh, good. That'll keep him cool. Now, Patrick, get over there and make sure Cassidy's done for us. See, si, Senor Scoville. Soapy, you stupid lunkhead. 
It'll save you right if three jacks gives it to you along with Carlson. Oh, how was I to know he'd try a stunt like that? Senor Schofield! We do not have to worry about Cassidy. He done for? See, si. he caught one dead center. He was dead when I raised him. Good. Oh, sh- the shots mean we can't wait for the kid any longer. Soapy, stay with Carlson. Three jacks will be along pretty soon. He'll take over. Right. All right, men. Let's go calling. <laughs> You coming around, Carlson? Uh, uh, Hoppy. How's Hoppy? Ah, oh, forget him. He's dead. And I reckon you will be too, Pronto. Just as soon as he... Three jacks! Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I'll take over, Soapy. Now look at the hero. Masked and carrying a scatter gun. A very effective weapon, my friend, as you will see. Soapy, go join the others. The attack should hit Colville any time now. Sure, Three Jacks. Sure. Well, goodbye, fella. Give my regards to the devil. Well, Fingers, how you feeling? Huh? Ah, hear my boys? Well, well, get it over with you, murdering rattlesnake. Uh, don't be so anxious. I like to enjoy these moments. I hope you enjoy the one when they hang you. Oh, quiet, will you? I'm listening. Uh, that shooting seems awful heavy. Sounds like the town is putting up a fight. I hope they get the whole game. Blast it. Shoot it and be done with it. Very well, if you insist. Hey, wait, who's that? Sophie, what's up? Three jacks! Three jacks, you've got a hot tail of sudden. The town was warned. Our gang's being slaughtered. What? Well, that's impossible. They must have rode smack into a trap. I saw what was happening and got away. Well, now, how do you feel now, Three Jacks? Shut up, you. Hey, Sophie, hit for the territory. Three jacks, I ain't stopping till I hit Canada. This country's going to be too warm for my blood after tonight. So long. Yeah, perhaps he's got a good idea. I think maybe I'll head for there myself. Just as soon as I take care of you, Carlson. Which is right now. Say your prayers. Here it comes. Do it! I'm shot. Yeah, shot. Hmm. Funny, uh, I don't feel a thing. Uh, I must be dead. Uh, California, it's me, Hoppy. Then I am dead. Uh, Hoppy? Uh, this sure ain't heaven. Uh, you mean we're in... <laughs> California, you aren't dead. You aren't even hurt. What? Uh, but they said that you uh, and three jacks were... Hey... What's she doing on the ground? I'm alive and three jacks is dead. And the end of a long trail for me, senores. While Bill again, you buddy. Don Patrick, I thought I heard another shot over mine. You shot him too? See, si. I am on three jacks trail for a long time. Well, I suspected you were a lawman, Don Patrick. But I wasn't sure till you gave me that break tonight when I was supposed to be shot. And uh, when you accidentally dropped a gun near me. Oh, uh, so that was it, huh? You, uh... You suspicion me, Senor Cassidy? <laughs> you have two pinholes in your shirt, Don Patrick, right where a star would hang. Did you warn the town? Oh, no, no, not me, Senor. It was the kid. When he had time to think about your talk, he had the change of heart. Ah. I saw it and persuaded him to set the trap. But, uh, who is the masked three jacks? I must remove the hood. It's Weepy, the bartender. Didn't you catch the giveaway? Weeper? Uh, why, it is him. It was the shotgun. Only one man to have one of those in a town like Lance would be the bartender. And two, Weepy has mighty timely spells of sickness to cover his absence. Si, si, oh, I am the idiot. Yeah? <laughs> well, it came out fine. The kid all right? See, si. He stayed in town after warning them. He will meet you there. Ah, oh, that's good. You know his dad's going to be mighty proud of him. Did, uh, did you get uh, Schofield? Uh, Senor Schofield and I finally had our knife contest, Wild Bill. Uh, he cheated me, the big thief. How? Oh. I won. But he was too dead to pay his honest debt. Uh, I'm desolate. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's too bad, Don Patrick. Well, California, you had enough action? Have I? 
Coffee, when we get back to the bar 20, the only action I'm going to have is penny ante stud games. <laughs> and you know what? The first fella that yells he's got three jacks, I'm going to shoot him on general principle. <laughs> <laughs> on the Red Horse Ranch. When we left Red Horse Ranch, Alabama and the boys had just discovered that Dewey Dawson was missing, and they're sure it was the work of the outlaws who were once members of Trigger Dawson's gang. Dawson, now dead, was supposed to be Dewey's father. While the boys ride out to find Dewey, they leave Arizona and Tex to watch things at the ranch. <laughs> What do you mean, Dodie? His name's Dewey. Dewey or Dodie, I can't remember. Oh, what do you expect me to do, Cookie? Play Tiddly Wakes? Oh, yeah. oh. Law me, oh, oh. there's Dewey's dog. Oh, oh. Where you come from, you hound dog, you? Gosh, that's Dewey's dog, all right. But Dewey ain't with him. I wonder what's happened to him. Oh, poor little puppy. 
Gosh, I better go up and tell Mr. Carter about the dog coming back. Oh, man. You better find that boy. I don't know what. Than you dear. Oh, what a dream would be a cozy little cottage beside the western sea. something. Well, what is it, Arizona? Look what just wandered in, Mr. Carter. Why, it's Elizabeth, Dewey's dog. And Dewey was looking for him when he was lost. Well, where did you find the dog, Arizona? Yes. I didn't find him. He just wandered in. Oh, hello, I ain't Elizabeth. seen nothing to do it, though. Well, now you mark my words. There's something behind all this. It's a sure thing. It's the work of those outlaws. But doesn't it seem strange that men like that would want to get a hold of the boy? Well, what could their reason be, Dad? Well, we ought to hear something from Alabama and the boys. I know. They've been out looking for Dewey all the afternoon. Oh, Dad, look. The boys are coming back. I see them. That's him, all right. Is Dewey with them? Well, I I can't tell yet, but surely they found out something about him. Drop your horses, boys, up here. But Dewey isn't with them. Oh, Alabama, where's Dewey? I wish I knew, Rose. We've looked everywhere we can think of around here. Oh, the poor boy. Yes, and if I ever get my sights lined on the varmints that made off with them, they'll be eating hot lead. Come on up on the veranda, boys, and rest yourself a spell. Oh, Bob, have you still got that locket of Dewey's we found over there in the trees? Yeah, looks like there was a little scuffle. Must have accidentally pulled it off his neck. Well, I'll take care of it, Bob. Dewey thought an awful lot of that locket. All right, Rose. Arizona, for gosh sake, quit picking on that guitar. Well, a song wouldn't hurt at all, boys. No. Go ahead with one. Yeah. Take me back to peaceful valley. Sit here long enough. 
Where we strike out for next, boys? Alabama, I think our next step is to ride over to Roaring River and see if we can find the outlaw gang's hideout. Well, it won't hurt none to find out. Come on, boys, let's do some more riding. Oh, good luck, Alabama. You've got to find him. Hey, we will wait a minute. Who's that riding up? Why? Well, as I someone? live and breathe, it's Steve Bradford. Steve oh. Bradford. Now, what do you suppose that rat's doing over here? I thought I told him to stay off of this ranch. Uh, hold on a minute. Uh, Idaho, uh, there's somebody with him. Why, uh, But that couldn't be... It why. is. It's Dewey. Oh, Steve Bradford's brought him home. Now, what do you reckon Bradford's doing with the kid? Oh, I don't know. Howdy, fellas. I thought you might be looking for this youngster. Dewey. Come here, boy. Hey, he brought me back. Oh, there's a little... Oh, it is, Dewey, and he's all right. Oh, Dewey, where have you been, honey? Just a minute. Bradford, you can start explaining now. Now, don't get excited, Mr. Carter. Go ahead. I thought you'd be mighty glad to get the boy home. We'll listen to your story, Bradford. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. I found this boy wandering around over on my bar D. Is that all you can think of to say, Bradford? Well, you can ask the boy. He'll tell you. Well, what about it, Dewey? You can tell us what happened. That's right, Alabam. I was looking for Elizabeth, and I thought I heard him bark down there in the trees. Yeah? So I went down there, and a couple of fellows grabbed me and made me get up on one of the horses. Then what? Then they took me over across the hill in the bar D and let me go. And then Bradford came and found me. Well, Alabam, is that enough? There's something funny about this. No, Alabam. He's right. Right. Well... I'm sorry for what I said, Bradford. We are grateful for your helping us find the boy. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Better not count on folks around here taking care of you after this young fella. Uh, well, I'll see you later, fellas. <laughs> well, can you beat that? Come on, fellas. Let's show Dewey yeah. we're glad he's home again. Start us off, Monty. Yeah. 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 Texas cowboy, far away from home. If ever I get back to Texas, I never more will roam. Yeah. Montana is too cold for me, and the winters are too long. Before the roundups do begin, our money is all gone. I've worked down in Nebraska, where the grass grows ten feet high, and the cattle are such rustlers that they seldom ever die. I have worked up in the sand hills and down up on the flat. For the cowboys are good fellows, and the cattle always fat. You're the lady, you're the lady, you're the lady. I've traveled lots of country, Nebraska's hills of sand, down to the Indian Nation, and up the Rio Grande. Yeah. But the bad land of Montana are the worst I ever see. The cowboys are all tender feet, and the donkeys are too lean. Dewey, but listen, don't you know why those outlaws tried to take you away? Well, no. Only they asked me where was my locket. Your locket? Yes. They said it was going to take it away from me. Well, well, and I looked and it was gone. I, I lost it. Why, Dewey, I have your locket. The boys found it down there by the tree. Oh, give it to me. Right. I guess it busted off when they grabbed me. But what could they want with a little locket like this? Rose, I figure that when we find that out... We are going to know what this whole thing's about. Well, it looks as though Dewey is going to be the center of interest for quite a while. Let's be sure to stay tuned to Red Horse Ranch. Until the journey's 
Close Grape Nuts Flakes, the great two-minute energy cereal, brings you the Roy Rogers Show, transcribed on the Double R Bar Ranch, with Pat Brady and the Queen of the West, Dale Levin. Happy trails to you, time to ride again. And here he is, in person, the King of the Cowboys, Roy Rogers. Well, howdy, folks. You know, being a cowboy, you need lots of energy. That's why Grape Nuts Flakes is the cereal I like for strength and energy. Just two minutes after you eat a big bowl full, that whole wheat energy starts going to work for you. Try Grape Nuts Flakes buckaroos. They're great. And now, here's our story. The hard-packed clay road from the Double R Bar Ranch to Mineral City is only a mildly busy thoroughfare this morning. The travelers are a lithe German shepherd dog covering the ground with smooth, driving strides, a magnificent golden palomino cantering along with rippling power in reserve, and mounted on the horse, a happy, carefree cowboy. Oh, give me land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me it. Hey, what's the matter, Bullet? Don't you like the concert? It's free. Hey, I've heard you howling, and compared to that, this is grand opera. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't fence me. Whoa, whoa, Trigger. Whoa, boy. Someone's in trouble just around the bend. Get there fast, Bullet. Hurry up, Trigger. Come on. That was a woman's voice. Who in the world would be out? Please, please, someone help me. Well, come on, ma'am. What's the matter, ma'am? Right over there. That dog was just in time. Wow. A rattler and a granddaddy-sized one. Stick with him, Bullet. Oh, I was simply paralyzed. Can the dog handle it? Well, he's doing a pretty good job of it. I don't want that snake to nick him with his fangs, though. Bullet, let go, boy. Let go of him. But the snake, it isn't dead yet. Well, he will be. Come back here, Bullet. Now. Mister, you hit him with all four shots. I don't know how to thank you. I'm glad we happened along. Those rattlers are mighty dangerous critters. You oughtn't to be walking out here alone. Well, I, I didn't start out walking. I, I was riding a horse I wasn't used to, and when he saw the snake, he reared and threw me and ran away. Are you hurt? Oh, no, but I landed practically on that snake, and I, I was so frightened for a moment I could scarcely move. Which way were you heading, ma'am? I want to get to Mineral City as soon as I can, but if you'd like to look for your horse, mine doesn't mind carrying double. Well, I was riding to Mineral City, and I imagine the horse will head for the livery stable there. That's where I rented him. Well, climb up here behind me, then. I'll take you in. My name's Roy Rogers. Roy? Oh, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Rogers. My name's Jane Farmer. I passed by your place a little while ago. Here, let me help you up. This is Trigger and my dog's bullet. While I don't generally care much for rattlesnakes... I'm sort of glad that one happened to be out here. Dale, I can't imagine what's in this dern package. The label's torn so I can't even see where it come from. But it's sure addressed to me, all right. Oh, why don't you open it and find out, Pat? Say, this is interesting. I'm not going to open it because I can't remember ordering anything. Now, let me hmm, well, see. what do you know? Sophie Jacobs finally got married. Gee, this paper's wonderful. What's so wonderful about a three-week-old newspaper? I wish I knew what was in this package. Well, it's my hometown paper, that's all, and it's news to me, even if it is three weeks old. Package is too big to be spark plugs. It ain't heavy enough to be a new motor. Hey, here's something Roy will be interested in. Ed Rawson died in the state prison. He was 60 years old. I could use a new cowboy straw hat, but I don't remember ordering one. Who was Ed Rawson? Why, don't you remember? He was the leader of that rustling gang that almost wiped out the cattle industry in Paradise Valley three years ago. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, once Roy got after him, he didn't do much more rustling. Oh, here's Roy now. He certainly... Well, who's the girl riding on trigger with him, Pat? I don't know, but she sure is mighty pretty. 
pretty. Look at how dusty her clothes are. Hey, Roy doesn't know any better than to pick up hitchhikers well. If she's a hitchhiker. I wish me and Nellie Bell had been driving down the road. Boy. Oh, hi there, Dale, Pat. Hi, Roy. Good morning. Uh, this is Jane Farmer. Jane, these are my two best friends, Dale Evans and Pat Brady. Hello, how do? How do you do? Jane's horse reared and threw her, and, well, we just happened along. Happened along in the nick of time. Roy saved me from the biggest rattlesnake I've ever seen. Oh, Bullet really did it. Well, that's very interesting, I'm sure. Pat, the boys are rounding up the steers we're going to drive to the terminal. Uh, are you and Nellie Bell about ready to leave? Well... I can't let Pat leave until at least 11 o'clock. If he's going to be gone all day, he'll have to cook the ready dishes for lunch and supper. Well, I guess we don't have to start until about 11. I'd better go back to the ranch, though, and make sure the boys got the right critters. Did you come all the way into town just to turn around and go back? Sure, it was a nice morning for a ride. Miss Farmer... If you want me to take you down to the livery stable, I... Oh, no, I'd... thanks, no, Roy. It's right in this block, and I'll walk. I uh, think maybe I'll have a sandwich or something first. Will you join me? Roy, if you're so worried about your hands cutting out the wrong stock, I think you'd probably better be going back. Yeah, maybe I'd better. You get out there as soon as you can, though, Pat. I hope I see you again sometime, Miss Farmer. Oh, you will, Roy. You can be sure of that. And, uh, thanks. So long, Dale. Oh, uh, Dale... Why don't you close the cafe and make the cattle drive with Pat and the boys and me this afternoon? Thank you. But you know, a business girl can't just go gallivanting around the country. I'll see you tomorrow, then. Hmm. So that's Roy Rogers. Strange, he seems like a nice fellow. He certainly is a nice fellow. And if I were you... If I were you, I'd try the hamburgers. Hey, I wonder if I ought to open this package. <laughs> Well, I'll be darned. Pat Brady, a box full of fireworks. What in the world are you up to? Oh, I remember now. I ordered him for last Fourth of July, and it didn't come. And then it didn't come for Thanksgiving, and then it didn't come for Christmas, and I just, <laughs> I just plum forgot all about him. <laughs> of all the ridiculous things. Well, you just go drive the cattle now, if you like. First thing I know, you'll be lighting one of these sky rockets and wrecking the place. Well, if you're sure you don't need me anymore, Dale, I, I know Roy's anxious to get started. Wait a minute. There's that Jane Farmer creature again. Where? Right across the street. She seems to have rented another horse. And look who she's stopping to talk to. Marty Fraser. Dale, why don't you quit picking on Miss Farmer? So she's talking to a sort of a bum, so what? Marty Fraser's the most disreputable character in town. And if she knows him... Dale, you got no call to be jealous of Roy. He saved the girl from a rattlesnake and brought her into town, and that's probably the end of it. I doubt it very much. She told Roy she'd see him again. And look there. She's handing that Fraser fellow an envelope or something. And he's riding one way and she's riding the other. Forget it, Dale. I'm going to saddle Buttermilk and follow that farmer woman. I'm going to find out what she's up to. Well, have fun. I know me and Roy and Nellie Bell's going to. Well, all right then. Go about your fun and take your fireworks with you. <laughs> It's all set up, Mike. Rogers is making a cattle drive today, and I've picked a perfect spot to waylay him. Am I supposed to shoot him down right in front of his waddies? Of course not. I've sent him a note asking him to ride off and meet me alone as the cattle are going down the draw. I don't mind killing him, but I can't get caught. I'm wanted in too many places. No one will see you, and there's a perfect place to dispose of his body. Well, I hope you know what you're doing. You ought to. I guess your father taught you plenty about dodging the law. You leave my father out of this. I'm paying you to do a job, not for conversation. Hey, wait. Mike, what's the matter with you? I thought I heard something. If the law followed me here, The I... law doesn't know you're in town, and no one could find this cabin. Come back in here and close the door. Right. I guess I hired the right man. You're certainly trigger happy. I hate the law and anyone who's on the law's side. Now, when do I get the rest of my thousand dollars? You'll get your money when Roy Rogers is dead. Oh, it's lucky that door opens outward. If I only knew where. But I can't stay here. If I could just ride to the ranch in time to warn Roy. How about him? How about him? How about those grape nuts? Taste? How about the 
those great nuts. How about them? How about them? How about those great nuts flakes? They are so good, good for you too. They do mean an energy worse for you. So how about them? How about them? How about great nuts flakes? Yep. How about those great nuts flakes? Take an old hands advice, partners. Tomorrow, when you roll out of your bunk, corral a bowl full of that great energy-given cereal, Grape Nuts Flakes. Grape Nuts Flakes are called the great two-minute energy cereal because two minutes after you polish off a bowl full, their powerhouse whole wheat energy starts to go to work for you. That's the kind of quick energy you fellas and gals need. You'll go for Grape Nuts Flakes sugar-roasted flavor. It's delicious. So ask Mom to get you Grape Nuts Flakes, the two-minute energy cereal. Look for Roy's picture on the front of the package. Roy Rogers saves an attractive young woman from a huge poisonous rattlesnake. He leaves her in Mineral City and rides back to prepare for a cattle drive. But Dale does not trust the strange girl. She follows her and hears... You'll get your money when Roy Rogers is dead. Meanwhile, Roy and Pat are at the Double R Bar Ranch. Hey, Pat, why don't you take a horse? We want to get the cattle to the terminal before night. Oh, you go on ahead then. Me and Nella Bell will catch up with you. I'll have her running again in no time at all. You're anxious to get started on account of that note you got, ain't you? Well, sure, sort of. Uh, Dale's pretty jealous, Roy. Oh, that's silly, Pat. You can see Miss Farmer's a nice kid, and I was lucky enough to be passing by when she needed help. But she could never mean to me what Dale does. Sure, I know that, but who is she anyway? I don't know. She told me she had something to do in Paradise Valley, and then she'll be on her way again. Well, Pat, if you're still going to try to fix that Jeep, the boys now get started. The cattle are getting restless. Okay, Roy. I, I don't know just what's wrong with Nellie Bell this time, but I've got her going hundreds of times before. Her and me will probably be with you in, oh, 15, 20 minutes, because once she starts, there's no stopping this here, little beauty. There. Nellie Bell, I hope you'll forgive me. I don't know why I didn't think to turn on the ignition before. <laughs> well... Maybe Dale and Buttermilk decide to go with us after all. Whoa, whoa, Buttermilk. Pat, where's Roy? Oh, he and the boys started out with Herd about an hour ago. That note we saw Jane Farmer give to Fraser, it was meant for Roy. Yeah, I know it. And he got it. Oh, you mustn't worry about that girl, Dale. If you'd have heard what Roy just told me before Not you... Not worry got... about her. Pat, that woman's trying to kill Roy. She sent the note to lure him into a trap. Do you know if he's planning to meet her? Yeah, he figured he'd ride up the slope to Keyhole Bluff while the herd was going through the draw. The note said she had something to show him. What she's going to show him is a hired gunman whose job is to get Roy in his sights and then shoot. Pat, we've got to get to Keyhole Bluff before Roy does. Golly, the herd will be almost there by now. Hey, wait, I know a shortcut. It'll bring us out on that big hill just across the draw from the bluff, and we can get there in ten minutes. Come on, Nellie Bell! Hoo, hoo, whoa, Trigger. Uh, hi there, Miss Farmer. Hello, Roy. You got my note? Yes, I did. It's lucky we planned to drive through the draw down there. I can't stay long because Pat's not with us yet. And it's a pretty big herd for just two men and bullet to handle. Well, it was nice of you to come. How'd you get out here? I rode. My horse is on the other side of that jutting rock. Why don't you hop down and walk over there with me? Sure. Come along, Trigger. Oh, you know, this is such fascinating country, that, that rock standing out alone on this slope. And, and behind it, there's sort of a well. I dropped a stone in it, and I never heard it land. That's bottomless well. It probably leads to a deep underground river. Oh. And that strange red bluff behind it, a sheer mile-long cliff with just one opening in it. Well, that's what they call the keyhole. Beyond, it's just a small, rugged box canyon. And my horse is right around the rock here. Fine. Now, what did you want to show me? This man. Get those hands up before I blast it. He means it. Now, I'll take your guns. Miss Farmer, you sure had me fooled. I'd never have figured you for one of Black Mike's stick-up gang. This isn't a stick-up. And I'm not Jane Farmer. All right, who are you? I'm Jane Rawson. Ed Rawson's daughter. I guess I see what you're driving at. I sent your father to prison, but 
A rustler has prison coming. My father died in prison three weeks ago. Maybe he was a rustler, but I loved him. I'm sorry, Miss Rawson. Now, let's get rid of him and get out of here. Now, wait, Mike. Let those cattle get a little farther down the draw. Roger's men should spot us up here. They can't see us. But if they hear the shots... We... All right, give him a minute or so. But no longer. I'm anxious to do this little job. There's one thing you haven't thought of. My body will be found up here, and the law's bound to catch up with murder. They'll never find your body, because it'll be in the bottomless well. Keep your eyes on him, Mike. When I give you the word, shoot. <laughs> Nellie Bell's doing fine, Dale. She's rolling up this hill just like she was on level ground. Oh, I hope we're not too late. Hey, there's field glasses in the door compartment. When we get to the top, you can sweep the whole draw on the slope and the bluff beyond it in a matter of seconds. Good, Pat. Sure, I got Nellie Bell equipped for everything. Now, hey, there's our cattle going through the draw now. There are two riders and there's bullets. Pat, Roy's not there. All right, scan over across the draw, quick. Oh, I'm shaking so I can hardly focus these glasses. I see two horses... Oh, Pat, there's Roy and that woman, and a man with his guns trained on Roy. Let's see. It's 500 yards downhill to the herd, and, and about another 500 up the slope to where Roy is. Now, he's calling the men. They couldn't hear us above the cattle, and we can't drive through the herd. Well, if there's just some way to get that gun slick off guard for just a second, Roy would know what to do then. At least he'd have a fighting chance. I've got it, Dale. My fireworks. Your fireworks? Sure. Pile out and help me set them off. I've got skyrockets, screamers, rolling candles. We'll fire them off in front of the herd. Well, Pat, the herd will stampede. That's the idea. If we can just stampede them up the slope, that Randy and the gal are going to be thinking, first of all, on how to get out of there. And Roy and Trigger will take care of everything from then on. <laughs> Time for another Roy Rogers reminder. Always play fair. Yes, buckaroos, that's Roy's reminder for today. To be a good, upstanding citizen, you have to abide by the rules in everything you do, in your home, in school, or on the playground. It's a fact when you play fair, you can't go wrong. Be fair to yourself, too. Keep yourself healthy and strong. And talking about that, one of the best ways to do it is to eat plenty of good, nourishing food like grape nuts flakes, the cereal Roy likes best for building up strength and energy. Yes, kids, Roy eats Grape Nuts Flakes for energy. His picture's on every package. Roy likes those swell-tasting Grape Nuts Flakes because their whole wheat energy starts going to work for you just two minutes after you eat a big, multi-rich bowlful. That's energy you need for most everything you do during the day. And you like sugar-roasted Grape Nuts Flakes. They have a flavor that's multi-rich, makes them mighty good to eat. So if you want to be king of the cowboys in your corral, ask your mom to get you... Grape Nuts Flakes, the great two-minute energy cereal. Grape Nuts Flakes is one of the triple wrap post cereals. Guaranteed fresh or triple your money back. Let's get it over with. I'll plug him now. Wait till that herd gets just a little further, Mike. You aren't losing your nerve, are you, Miss Rawson? No, my father's life is going to cost you yours. Miss Rawson, if you don't give me the word, I'll shoot anyway. Oh, wait. What was that? I don't know, but it's all I need. Mike, hang on to your gun. Try it. Plug him, Miss Rawson. Shoot him with his own gun. Let go. Now the other. There. You took your eyes off me, Mike. That never pays. Don't try to pick up those guns, Roy. Stay where you are. I don't need guns. Him. Now, Miss Rawson... If you think you have a job to do, go ahead and do it yourself. All right, I will. Go ahead. You're the one that has the quarrel with me. Fight your own battles. I think you'd better pull those triggers, Miss Rawson. If you don't, all three of us are going to be trampled under those stampeding cattle. Stampeding? Oh, they're plunging right at us. Get out of here if you can, Miss Rawson, but I'm taking your horse. Mike! Mike, no! Take your guns, Roy. Stop him. He'd be trampled under the herd. I wouldn't do that to any man. Trigger! Here, fast boy, come here. I can't. I, I can't run. You don't have to. Get up here on trigger. What? Come on. All right, I'll have to toss you on him. You try to save my life? Why not? Go ahead, trigger. Follow that black horse. If we can make the keyhole, we'll be safe. Mike's gonna make it, but we can't. Trigger's faster than stampeding cattle. Even carrying dust. Hang on, Mr. Ross. Mike's made it. He's through the opening. We will, too, in a few seconds. He'll shoot us when we ride through. He's desperate. He can't do much shooting without guns. Go, Trigger. Go on, boy. We 
got here. Don't come any closer. We got here and Mike got here. And he hasn't much of any place to go. You want to shoot me now, Miss Rawson, or shall I take care of him first? <laughs> All right. Maybe that'll make you feel better. <laughs> now, Mike, off that horse. Rear up, you black devil. Lash out at him. Beat him off. You're not much of a horseman, Mike. I'll just pull you up there and then pull you off. Yeah. I guess one punch wasn't enough to put you down for keeps. But I'll do it this time. Shoot, Miss Rawson, shoot. I think she's changed her mind. There, we'll tie you up this time. <laughs> well, take it easy, miss, please. Roy, Roy, are you all right? We cut in behind the stampede, Roy. We saw you ride through the keyhole. Boy, you just made it. Well, Black Mike's out of action for a while, but the girl and I are okay. I saw her send you that note, Roy, and then I found out what she was up to. Miss Farmer, I wish we were both men because I'd give you the worst thrashing you now, ever had. Take it easy, had. Dale. She isn't Miss Farmer. She's Jane Rawson. Jane oh, Rawson? Hey, Pat, how about our cattle? It was lucky for me they stampeded, but we've got to help the men round them up again. Oh, they'll be all right, Roy. They they charged right along the side of the bluff, and they were starting to slow down the circle as Dale and I came in here. All right, let's go. We'll get them started and headed on towards Terminal as soon as we can. <laughs> Roy, what about this girl and the man? We'll tie the man up, throw him over that horse, and lead him back down the slope. We'll meet you in the draw when we've taken care of the cattle. Miss Rawson... Help Dale. Keep Mike covered. You gonna trust me to do that? Sure. Take your mind off of your troubles. Come along, Trigger. Let's go, Pat. Roy, sometimes I gotta tell you about that stampede. I got a package in the mail this morning. Well, Miss Rawson, are you gonna help me tie this gun slick? Uh, yes, Miss Evans. Your scheme didn't work, did it? No, it didn't. I want you to tell me something. Why did you want to kill Roy after he saved your life this morning? He sent my father to prison. Dad died there. I know. Look, did you know your father was a rustler before Roy caught him? Oh, no. Your father wasn't young, Miss Rawson. He couldn't have lived forever, inside prison or out. And he owed society a debt. It just wouldn't have been right for him not to pay it. But, but when your whole life gets turned upside down... It... People can start thinking awfully wrong, can't they? Sometimes they can. I've ruined everything now. There's a wonderful boy back home. I just don't know what happened to me. There are a lot of wonderful people in this world. I think you ran across one today. I certainly did. I've never known a man like Roy Rogers before. Whatever he decides, well, I'll take my medicine. Well, Roy will want to talk it over with you and the sheriff, Miss Rawson. Black Mike will go to prison because he's wanted for a string of crimes as long as this rope. I'll wind up in prison, too, I know. Maybe. You planned a terrible thing. But fortunately for you, it didn't quite happen. But you know there are things like suspended sentences and probations. Oh, but I... There, he's tied up. I guess we'll have to lift Black Mike up on the horse. He's still pretty groggy. Help me, will you, Jane? <laughs> That's all for now, folks. This is Roy Rogers saying to all of you, from all of us, goodbye, good luck, and may the good Lord take a liking to you. See you next week. The Roy Rogers Show was brought to you tonight by Post Grape Nuts Flakes, the great two-minute energy cereal. Grape Nuts Flakes is the cereal Roy likes best for strength and energy. Look for the picture of Roy and Trigger on the front of the package. The Roy Rogers Show can be heard again next week at this same time with Pat Brady, Dale Evans... And the king of the cowboys himself, Roy Rogers. An Art Rush production written and directed by Fran Van Hardisfeld with music by Milton Charles. Remember what Roy Rogers says, Post Sugar Crisp is the cereal treat that's fun to eat. Roy's right, fellas and gals, as a cereal it's dandy, with milk or cream. For snacks it's so handy, or you can eat it like candy right out of the box. Post Sugar Crisp is excitingly new, deliciously different. Nourishing puff tweet candy coated with honey and sugar. Ask mom to get post sugar crisp in the big red, white, and blue box with the three bears on the front tomorrow. Featured in today's cast were Frank Hemingway, Alvina Temple, and Tom Holland. This is Art Ballinger speaking for Post Great Nuts Flakes. Stay tuned for the latest news brought to you by Log Cabin Syrup.
the bakers of Weber's Bread present your all-star Western theater. Drifting along. From Hollywood comes your all-star Western theater, starring America's great Western singers, Boy Willing and the Riders of the Purple Sage. Our guest today is one of Hollywood's bright new stars, Miss Jean Rogers, with a story of the West written especially for her. My name is Cottonseed Clark, and here are the Riders of the Purple Sage. There's an old prairie schooner wending its way the Santa Fe Trail, with its captain and crew pushing on, going through, over the Santa Fe Trail, anchored away at each break of day, old Captain Kidd never did it that way, there's an old prairie schooner wending its way, over the Santa Fe Trail, pioneering 49ers sailed away in mighty liners. Over the sagebrush sea Sailed away to far off land To the rolling burning sands Out on the lone prairie Over the Santa Fe Trail Over the Santa Fe Trail Anchors away at each break of day Captain Kidd never did it that way. There's an old prairie schooner winding its way over the Santa Fe Trail. We hear a lot about the romantic cowboys of the Old West, but little is said about the cowgirls who live in the great cattle ranges. Yes, sir, the women had a lot to do with the winning of the Old West. While the men were installing law and order in the great frontiers, their women folk were making homes out of rough shacks and ranch buildings. Those women knew the value of good food for their men folks, just as do the women of today. That's why Weber's bread is so popular, because Weber's bread is good food, good bread. When a modern housewife buys a loaf of Weber's bread, she knows she can depend on its goodness and quality. She knows that every single member of her entire family will enjoy the longer-lasting freshness and flavor of Weber's bread. Buy a loaf of Weber's bread tomorrow. You'll like it. The likes and dislikes of music lovers may differ, but the Western fan goes to the head of the class for enthusiasm. This next offering by the Riders of the Purple Sage is a song that continues to win the enthusiastic applause of everyone even after two years of outstanding popularity. We know you will be pleased with their rendition of Oklahoma Hill. Way down yonder in the Indian nation I rode my pony on a reservation in the Oklahoma Hills where I was born. Way down yonder in the Indian nation the cowboy's life and my occupation in the Oklahoma Hills where I was born. Many months have come and gone since I wandered from my home in the Oklahoma hills where I was born. But a page of life has turned and a lesson I have learned in the Oklahoma hills I still belong. Way down yonder in the Indian nation I rode my pony on a reservation in the Oklahoma hills where I was born. Way down yonder in the Indian nation the cowboy's life is my occupation in the Oklahoma hills where I was born. Now as I sit here today, many miles I am away From the place I rode my pony through the draw Where the oak and black jack trees kiss the playful prairie breeze In the Oklahoma hills where I was born Way down yonder in the Indian nation I rode my pony on a reservation In the Oklahoma hills where I was born Way down yonder in the Indian nation The cowboy's life is my occupation In the Oklahoma hills where I was born
Your all-star Western Theater has a special treat in store for its listeners today as we welcome a personal appearance from the screen's fine actress and grand new star, Miss Jean Rogers. Although not of the Western screen, she likes the West and the people in it. She's our kind of folks. And here she is as Jane East in a story of the West entitled, Miss East Goes West. Ladies and gentlemen, sweet and lovely Miss Jean Rogers. At the turn of the century, before fast automobiles, streamlined trains and airplanes reduced the size of our continent from a neighborly point of view, people were quick to form opinions of others for the state or section of the country from which they came. In each instance where such opinions were formed, the populace of the person's own locale had an extremely high rating. Jane East anxiously wondered just how she would be accepted as her train slowly churned its way across the nation from her Boston home to a newly inherited world known as the Bar J.E. Ranch near the small cattle town of Star City, Texas. Excuse me, ma'am. Is this seat taken? No, it's quite all right. Oh, thank you, ma'am. You going far? Quite a distance. I'm going to Texas. Well, now, that's mighty nice. I'm going there, too. I'm a rancher down there. I suppose that's what you'd say I am. Well, that's about the last thing I figured you for. I'm really not. You see, my grandfather left the place to me more than a year ago. Where is it located? Near Star City. Well, I know right where it is. That's a prosperous cattle country. It hasn't proven so for me. The ranch has been losing money the past year, so I'm going out to investigate. Well, who runs the spread for you? A cousin of mine. He's been a rancher all of his life. Well, I reckon I've heard everything now. An Easterner are going out west to operate a ranch. What's your cousins and all the hands going to think about the idea? I don't know. That's what I'm wondering. What they're going to think about the idea. What's the idea, boss, of calling all of us together like this? I got some news for you, man. Is everybody here? Yeah. Well, that new hand Hartman isn't around and must have gone into Star City. Oh, it isn't important to him anyhow. You ain't going to tell us some more of our cattle are missing? Well, from that as far as I'm concerned. You boys are going to have a new boss. Oh, a new what boss? are you talking about? Now, as most of you know, when old Grandpa East died, he left the bar J.E. layout to my cousin Jane from Boston. She got our last annual report showing losses for the year. She decided to come out and run things herself. She's due here on the Star City local tomorrow noon. Well, what are you oh, talking about? Man. I'll declare. Well, look, Bob, now... It's all right, but she's a woman and she's an Easterner. Yeah. yeah, you can't even understand how they talk. Yeah, they always say cotton, shawn. Yeah, and like women that, don't know nothing. I quit. Yeah, yeah me too, that I goes know. for me, too. I ain't taking orders from nothing with a dress on, especially from Boston. No, no, fellas, take it easy. Let's well, hope it's not as bad as it sounds. She better not be coming around my kitchen shack and telling me how to cook. I'll tell her off, I will. I will. Yeah. Might make things a little inconvenient for her if we decide. She might decide to go back home and let me run things if I can get this spread straightened out of the hole. Eh? In other words, we give the old girl a full-grown dose of ranch. That's, the idea. That's what I call a right pert idea. Yes, After sir. all, I've worked hard to make a go of this place, haven't I, boys? Yes, sir. With all the cattle thieving that's been going on, there ain't nobody could do any better, could there? Right. Well, what does this cousin of yours look like, boss? I've never seen her. I don't know anything about her. Ah, uh, more than likely some old nosy bitty in a hoop skirt. Well, she better steer clear of my kitchen. Women ain't got no business on a ranch unless they're married to the boss, and then they're a dang nuisance. Did I hear somebody saying he's getting married? No, Hartman. I was just going over some business with my regular hand. Well, uh, sorry, boss. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, on second thought, I've got a chore for you tomorrow. Sure. What is it? My cousin, the Miss Jane East from Boston, will arrive in Star City at noon. Take Baldy and meet the train. Now, just a doggone minute there, boss. Leave Baldy out of this. I don't want no part of that old maid cousin of yours. She won't bite Baldy. <laughs> <laughs> and Hartman, you better take the new buckboard. Okay, boss. Baldy will leave about 11. Good night, uh, fellas. Good, good night, night, sir. Good night. Boss, you don't seem to like this new hand much. I don't like to get too friendly with a new man until I know who they are and what they are. Well, he seems like an all right guy to me. Yeah? Yeah. We'll see how he works out. <laughs> Well, Baldy, the local ought to be coming around the band most any minute now. Oh, you can't tell about them trains. Sometimes they're on time, the next time they're late. I don't care if this one never shows up. Oh, come on, Baldy. Maybe Miss Jane won't be as bad as you think. If she wears a skirt, it ain't good. And I ought to know. I've been married four times. <laughs> I know what you mean. But here's hoping everything will work out all right between the two of you. 
Well, now, that's right nice of you to sympathize with me like that. I've been wanting to ask you, Baldy. Why is it the boss don't seem to like me? Oh, Barton ain't much on strangers. A- after he gets to know you better, I think everything will be all right. Well, uh, I can't see what being a stranger has to do with it, as long as I do my work. Well, uh, there's been so much rustling going on the past year that he don't put much trust into nobody. Mm-hmm. Hi, Baldy. Meet the train? Hi, Scotty. Yeah, meet the darn fool old woman from Boston. <laughs> Well, laugh, you. Here she comes, Bolly. I was afraid of that. I'll tell you, Bill. I think I'll just wait in the buggy. You meet her by yourself. Oh, no, you don't. I'm not too keen on women folks myself. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. I'm going to learn to like you. I wonder what the old gal looks like. Oh, she's probably got three chins and two stomachs. Got what? Three chins and two stomachs. Oh, I see. Well, we'll soon know if you'll be getting off the train most any minute now. Gosh, you know, these trains just scare me to death. Do you see her yet, Bill? Well, I don't see anybody getting off but old man Jenkins and that pretty young woman there. Oh, 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 what's old man Jenkins are doing with her? Well, I don't believe he's with her. They just got off together. Say, that, that pretty gal is heading this way. Oh, I uh, beg your pardon, but uh, could you gentlemen direct me to the bar, J.E. Ryan? Yes, ma'am. It's about five miles west of here on the... What did you say? I want to know where the bar, J.E. Ranch is. Well, you you couldn't be Miss, uh, Miss Jane East, could you? I couldn't, I am. Yahoo! I'll bust my britches. Is something wrong? There sure is. I mean, uh, well, you see, Miss Jane, we're from the bar, J.E., and, and we came to meet you. My name is Bill Hartman. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Hartman. And my, my name is Loudermilk. Most folks just call me Baldy. Well, how do you do, Baldy? Just fine, thank you, ma'am. How do you do? The, the buckboard is over here, Miss Jane. We'll take you right out. Thank you. I'll take your bags, Miss Jane. I don't want you to worry about nothing now. Hot ziggity dog go. This sure ain't what we expected. You see, Miss Jane, I'm new at the ranch, so I can't rightly say how everything is. Oh, I was just asking to make conversation. After all, you boys haven't said very much since we left the railroad station. Well, I reckon it's because we didn't expect anybody, uh, that is, anybody like you. Is that so? Just what did you expect? Well, uh, someone with, uh, someone with, uh... With uh, three chins and two stumps. Yeah, three chins and two stumps. Yeah, I mean, uh... <laughs> well, I, I hope I didn't disappoint you. Oh, you sure didn't, uh... Of course, Baldy here just naturally don't like women. That is a lie. I like all women except them I've been married to. There ain't nobody that appreciates a good, pretty woman more than I do. And if you ask me, the rest of the boys are going to really be surprised when we get you home. I'm sure we'll all get along splendidly, Baldy. Oh, I'm sure we will, Miss Jane. And by the way, if, if you've got any good recipes, uh, I'd be mighty glad to cook something up for you. Hot diggity dog, will I churn up a mess of it for you. I reckon we can look for Baldy to really put on the dog with his cooking now. Well, I ain't one to brag, but you ain't going to see no bones under the skins of them cow hands I've been to cooking for. <laughs> <laughs> hey, boss, here comes Bill and Baldy with her now. All right, boys, be on your good manners. All right, let's go. <laughs> Come on in here. You going to kiss her, boss? You know she's your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you mavericks. Let up now. No funny stuff. Uh, hey, she don't look so bad from here. Hey, boss, you reckon they got the wrong person by mistake? Look at that. She's as pretty as a spotted guinea hen. Well, from the looks of her, my kin folks ain't too bad. You're oh, not a kidding. Oh, here they are. Oh. Hey, boy, did you well, boss, that here she is. Oh. Cousin Jane, this is mighty nice seeing you. Uh, Hello, Bob. Here, I'll help you now, Miss Jane. I'll be proud of you. Yeah. 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 Boys, boys, take it easy. Hello, boys. Now that I've met you, Bob, I know all my relatives. Oh, Bill, put the team up. All right, boss. And, Baldy, you better get some food ready for Miss Jane. Yes, sir, boss. I've got a special meatloaf I'm going to have you try, Miss Jane. It's the best thing you've ever tasted. I'll have dinner in about an hour, boy. <laughs> Well, he was right about the food. The soup's the best he ever made. It's delicious. He's awfully nice, too. Here he comes with that meatloaf. Well, Baldy, it looks like I hit the nail on the head when I said we're going to put on the dog with your cooking. Well, I'm afraid this is going to taste more like I cooked up the dog. Something went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he's just modest, Jane. Hey, out there, help yourself. Thank you. Baldy's all right, and I think he's a good cook, too. Oh, now, you don't have to say that, Miss Jane. Well, I mean it. Say, this meatloaf isn't half bad. Hey, it tastes all right to me. Jim, where have you been? You're generally the first one at the table. Been looking for spots. You know, that fool dog's been missing more than an hour now. Oh! Well, 
Well, Jane, I suppose you'd like an accounting of the ranch activities? Yes, Bob. You know that if we continue at a loss as we have done in the past, then something is going to have to be done about it. Perhaps you have the answer. But operating at a profit is mighty hard when cattle thieves hit a herd as hard as they've hit ours. But it's been going on for so long. Isn't there some way to put a stop to it? Yeah, it's easier said than done. Hasn't anything been done to combat the rustlers? We've done everything we can. After all, I put my men against those killers. They wouldn't stand a chance. Besides, it happens that I value the lives of those boys more than I value your cattle. I'll agree to that, but it seems to me that something can be done about it. If you brought any ideas along from Boston, I'd like to hear them, Jane. I'm afraid you're being sarcastic. No, no, it isn't that. Look, Jane, when a dozen rustlers start towards your herd bent on killing everybody that tries to interfere, there's only one thing to do. Run for your life. Believe me, that's what my men have instructions to do. They're my friends. But, Bob, it just doesn't make sense. Can't you hire gunmen to help fight them? And do away with the men who's been with us so long? No, not me. You want to make such a move, you'll have to take charge yourself. I'm afraid you've been reading too many Western stories, no doubt. When was our cattle raided last? About a week ago. We got 42 head of our best stock. In dollars and cents, that's a lot of money. Who was tending herd at the time? Why, uh, I was riding herd myself. I always do whatever I ask my men to do. Well, Bob, that's noble of you, but I'm going to take some action. Huh? What do you intend doing? Call all the boys together. First of all, we're going to have a little meeting. <laughs> Now, boys, boys, I've called you together to tell you that I'm going to hire another crew of men to tend herds. Wait a minute. Every one of you will continue to get your wages. No one is going to be discharged. Jane, we can't afford that. It's cheaper than losing our cattle. But what's wrong with us doing the job, Miss Jane? If any of you boys care to volunteer, you'll be accepted. But, Jane, you can't ask these boys to fight against such odds. I'm not asking them. You can count me in on that, Miss Jane. I like the idea. How long have you been here at the ranch, Bill? Oh, about six weeks. Now, how about the rest of you? You can count me in, Miss Jane. I think we should have done this a long time ago. Yeah, me too. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, so I do too. Well, Jane, I, I tell you, this is a mistake. The boys are making their own choice, Bob. Jim, I'd like you and Bill to hire about six more men to help you. I want those cattle guarded day and night. What's wrong with me hiring them in, Jane? After all, I'm running the place for you. You said yourself, Bob, that you didn't want to take any part of asking the men to take such a responsibility. So I'm taking the responsibility of asking them myself. Well, I hope you know what you're doing. Miss Jane, I, I think you're on the right track. Me too. But for an Easterner who never saw a ranch before, where'd you get your ideas? For the entire trip aboard the train from Boston, I sat next to a long, tall rancher from Texas. And believe me, when I arrived in Star City, I was a college graduate in ranching. <laughs> Why, hello, Bill. Howdy, Miss Jane. What brings you here at this hour of the night? I'd like to talk with you for a few minutes. Sure. Come on in. Thank you. Sit down. What's on your mind? Miss Jane, uh, you've been here almost six weeks now. And since we put your plan into operation, not one attempt has been made at stealing your cattle. I've thought of that. You know, I wonder if the cattle thieves have been warned that our herd is being well guarded. That's what I've been thinking. Then uh, what do you have in mind? I have a plan. I'll go over and talk with all of the men. Will you send for me, Jane? Yes, Bob. I wanted to talk to you. Oh, well, what's on your mind? The boys have been on the job constantly for many weeks now, and we've had no disturbance from rustlers. Yeah, it looks as like if they've let up on us for a spell. I was thinking, since a large part of our stock is in the pens ready for shipment, suppose we have a couple of men guard the herd in the north section and let the other boys go to town. They need a little rest and recreation. Jane, yeah, that's a right good idea. I'm sure it'll be safe. I'll tell the boys. I've already told them. Bob and Jim volunteered to stay on the job. Shouldn't you have told me before you took action? I didn't think it was necessary. You weren't here, and the boys were anxious to get into town early. Well, if you ask me, things in town are going to be mighty hot tonight. I may ride in and see if they don't get into any trouble. Splendid. Yeah, then I'll leave right away, Jane. I want to stop by the Circle C and have a talk with John Casey about our next shipment. Then I'll join the boys in town. <laughs> You men have your orders, so I'd suggest that you ride in behind those rocks there and just wait. But, Bill, what makes you think this herd's going to be hip tonight? Just a fool notion, but a good one. The boss had to go into town on business, so Miss Jane put me in charge. It all sounds kind of crazy to me, hiding behind rocks when we're supposed to be in town having a good time. 
It may be, but he won't hurt to try. Now, it's coming dark, and you men may have a long wait. So move on back there where you won't be seen. The way these cattle are bunched up in this notch, it'll be a cinch to trap anyone that makes a play for them. Jim and me will stay out in the open here. Okay, Bill. I hope it works. Come on, boys. Let's get going. Well, it's going on 11 o'clock and nothing's happened yet, Bill. Yeah. We might be barking up the wrong tree. You ride over and see how the boys are doing. All right. I'll be right back. Jim, wait. Here comes someone. Yeah, I see him. Back behind this bush. Quick. All right. All right. Start reaching. I'll do nothing of the kind. Uh, Miss Jane, uh, wh- what are you doing here? Well, I hadn't heard from you in several hours, Bill, and I was getting worried about you. Uh, wasn't you worried about me, too, Miss Jane? <laughs> well, yes, I, I I, mean that I was worried about all of you. Oh. Miss Jane, uh, you better ride back to the ranch. If something does happen, this is no place for you. I'll be all right. Where are the boys hiding? Behind those rocks over there. If rustlers do show up, they'll come right past them and we'll have them trapped in this notch. Hey, Bill, look. Beyond that herd, there by the edge of the thicket. Well, company has come. That's them. Miss Jane, move back in the thicket there. You're in danger out here. I'll do no such thing. I said get behind it and I mean it. Now well, get you can't going. Tell me. Come on, get. Of all the nerves. Now don't make a move, Jim. They'll get as close to us as possible before they make their play. Well, they've already passed the rocks. Good. That puts them between us and the other men. Uh, if they know they're trapped, they'll give in. Shall I give the boys a signal now? Wait just a minute. Now, fire your gun. Okay, come on. Come on, we've got him while we want him. Yeah, let's go. Come on, I'm right with you. Come on. All right, reach, all of you. Fire up, we ain't Get him up. Now, pull off those bandanas. Come on, every one of you. Come on, pull them off. Pull them off. You two, partner, off with it. We want to see what you look like, too. All right, come on, off with it. It's the boss, Barton. Well, hey. what do you know? What... Well, well, boss, looks like this is your bad night. All right, Hartman, I give up. We had to find you out the hard way, Bob. You mean you suspected this, Jane? For quite a while now. When your grandfather left the bar J.A. to Miss Jane instead of you, you figured you'd steal what you didn't inherit. I might have known you had a hand in this, Hartman. I haven't trusted you since the day I hired you. You're a fine one to speak of trust. All right, boys. Take him into town and lock him up until morning. Okay, boys. Tell the sheriff I'll be by and take him to headquarters. Good. And what do you mean by headquarters? This. Well, bust my buttons, Bill. You're a ranger. That's right. I've been working toward this rustling band for a long time. When I hired out as a hand on the bar, J.E., I hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> Jane, I hope you have a lot of luck with your ranch now. I'd feel a lot better if I had you as a foreman. There's nothing I'd like better except, uh... Except being a ranger? Well, that wasn't what I was thinking. But we'll let that do for the time being. I'm going to miss you. Do you really mean it? More than anything. In that case, I've got to send a telegram to headquarters. What do you mean? I think, uh... I think I'd rather be your, uh, foreman. Thank you, Miss Jean Rogers, for your appearance on the All-Star Western Theater. Friends and neighbors, our guest star and the writers of the Purple Sage will return in a moment. Way out west where men were men and women were pretty handy with shooting irons, too, is one way of adding a new twist to an old saying. If anyone doesn't believe that statement, they'd better look up the record of the famous Annie Oakley, for one. Young women of the West knew how to handle horses and guns and could run a cattle ranch as well as the next. They stood behind their men, folks, just as do the modern women of today. Yes, today, mothers and wives and sweethearts make sure that hungry appetites are satisfied by using Weber's bread for every meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, or in-between snacks. You, too, will find that Weber's firm, even texture and delicious flavor will satisfy your men, folks' appetite. So buy a loaf of Weber's bread tomorrow. Now, friends and neighbors, here is Foy Willing with our guest star, Miss Jean Rogers. Miss Rogers, we want you to know that we're all mighty happy that you took the time to visit with us today. It's a real pleasure, Foy, and I hope you and the boys will invite me again sometime real soon. And that will be something for us to look forward to. Now it's time for you to fulfill your promise to me. 
Well, if I can get Jimmy Dean and Al Sloy to stop looking at you and enter the microphone, we'll do it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've asked the boys to sing a favorite new song of yours and mine. Although it isn't classed as a Western song, it has the same simple sincerity that makes Western music so very popular this day and time. I'm sure you'll enjoy the Riders of the Purple Sage singing, To Each His Own. A rose must remain with the sun and the rain, or its lovely promise won't come true. Is old, and my own is you. What good is a song if the words don't belong? And a dream must be a dream for two. No good alone to each is old, and If a flame is to grow, there must be a goal. To open each door, there's a key. I need you, I know. I can't let you go. Your touch means too much to me. For lips must insist on two more to be kissed. Or they'll never know what love can do. To each his own, I found my own. One and only you. Hollywood, you've heard your all-star Western theater, a V.M. Bear production starring Foy Willing and the Riders of the Purple Sage. Our guest star for today has been that popular star of the screen, Miss Jean Rogers. My name is Cottonseed Clark. Miss Rogers has been currently starred in the Paramount production Hot Cargo with William Gargan and Philip Reed and Republic's Gay Blades. The Riders of the Purple Sage may be seen in Republic's all-color Western, Out California Way. program came to you from the studios of KNX Columbia Square. Around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal.
Hey. Over here. One of the boys said you wanted to see me. Yeah. It better be important, mister. I don't make a habit of coming running with some saddle punk whistles. Maybe you hadn't ought to make a habit of calling people saddle punks. <laughs> no offense, just an expression. Sure. I came up from the Pecos country. Been here in Dodge about a week. Maybe you've seen me around. I've seen you. I've been talking to people. Oh? Everybody tells me you were a big shot back in Abilene. Had all the games sewed up, three or four saloons paying off, a couple of hotels and so on. Then the boom busted and you come here, and you got nowhere. Know why? You're talking, you tell me why. Dillon. A fellow named Matt Dillon, a U.S. Marshal. You tried to scare him and he wouldn't scare. Tried to buy him and wouldn't buy. Tried breaking him. Wouldn't break. So? Be worth $5,000 to you if I kill him? Might. All right, get it in gold. Keep it handy. My heart? Yeah, you're hired. <laughs> Chester, I know you've been sick and you still got a cold, but is there anything else wrong? What do you mean, Mr. Dillon? Well, you haven't said three words in the last 20 minutes. That's not like you. Well, Mr. Dillon, did you ever get a funny feeling somebody was keeping an eye on you? Well, yeah, but... Uh... Well, I got one right now. <laughs> Chester, I think you got a touch of the heebie-jeebies. Maybe... But I tell you, I know there's Well, as somebody... far as I can see, there's nobody in the whole place even paying any attention to us. Somebody is. I had the same feeling the day the Butler brothers come back from Santa Fe. Yeah? I didn't even know they was in town, but I knew somebody was getting ready to call us. And about six that evening, they made their play, remember? Yeah, I remember. I was one of the pallbearers the next day. Well, it's the same thing now. There's going to be trouble, Mr. Dillon. You can bet on it. <laughs> I think you got the wind up over nothing, Chester. Why, the town's never been quieter. Jail's been empty for two weeks. Only new faces around is that bunch of trail drivers that came up from the Pecos. They're all strangers. None of them got any reason to hold a grudge. Oh, again. there you be. What? I've been looking all over for you, Marshal. Oh, hiya, Billy. I waited over to the jail for nigh on to an hour. I got to talk to you, Mr. Dillon. Uh, I I'm sorry, Billy, but... Every time I give you money, you, you buy yourself a bottle and then oh, stay blind drunk it, for two it, days. It, it ain't money this time, Mr. Dillon. I got something to tell you. Oh? What? Something I hear. These couple fellers talking over to the liver stable. They didn't see me. I was back at the water trough. <clears throat> sort of, well, resting, you might say. Yeah, I know. Well, you know how it is, Mr. Dillon. The man gets dry in this prairie country, and he just... What were they came... talking about, Billy? <laughs> about you. One of them offered to kill you for $5,000 in gold, and the other and took him up on it. Uh, there, what did I tell you? Who were they, Billy? Janon? No, sir. It was dark, and I didn't recognize their voices. They was already there when I woke up, and they left right after that. Well, maybe they... Maybe it was just some kind of a joke. Oh, it didn't sound that way to me. No, sir, it's no joke, Mr. Dillon. I told you I felt it. There's somebody in this room right now, somebody who's been hired to kill you. Yeah, but who? I don't know. Figure who'd want to do such a thing, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I can figure a dozen or two, Chester. Well, if Chester, if they look, was... as far as Dodge City is concerned, I'm the law. There are plenty of men here who'd think they'd do better without any law. 
Guess it's nothing personal. Well, personal or not, it's got me jumping sideways up my own shadow. Ah, here we are. Come on. Well, good morning, Marshal. Haven't seen you since the robbery last month. Attempted robbery, Mr. Greeley. Yeah, so it was, thanks to you. Well, Mr. Dillon, the bank's at your service. What can I do for you? Give me some information, if you will. Well, if it isn't confidential... It is, but I want it anyway. Well, I hardly know what to say. Perhaps you'd better step into my office. This way, gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah, after you, Mr. Greeley. Now, just what was it you wanted to know? I want to know whether one of your customers has drawn $5,000 in gold from the bank in the last few days. Any particular person in mind? No, that's what I want to find out. Well, I hope this won't go any farther, Marshal. So somebody did, huh? Who was it, Mr. Greeley? I certainly wish to make it clear that I don't approve of this man, but after all, he is a good customer. And it's not my place. Yeah, yeah, I know. Who was it? Lawson Hale. Lawson Hale? Yeah, he took the gold out just this morning, as a matter of fact. Said he was working on a cattle deal of some sort. Yeah, figures all right. Hale's tried to move in on this town ever since he came here. Every time he's tried, I've stopped him. I do hope you'll regard this as confidential. Yeah, you? sure, sure. Well, Chester, we know who one of them is now. Yeah, but who's the other, Mr. Dillon? The one who's actually going to do it? Some punk who wants $5,000 real bad and doesn't care how much he has to do to get it? That sure doesn't narrow it down any. Yeah, I know. Sure quiet tonight, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Not many people out. No, not many. The moon is throwing quite a bit of light. Yeah, I guess it is. Kind of makes a target out of a man. Yeah, kind of. If somebody was out to shoot somebody, this would sure be a good night for somebody to do it. I suppose so. Mr. Dillon. Hmm? Do you mind if I make a comment? <laughs> well, I thought that's what you were doing, Chester. Let, let's go on back to the jail and stay off the streets. This way you're just asking for it. Chester, if it's going to come, it's going to come. I'd rather meet it halfway than to sit and wait for it. Asking for it, asking for it, that's what you're doing. It's been two days now. It gets on your nerves. When you go out to bring a man in, you know you may have trouble and you're ready for it. But, but this way, and not knowing who or when or why or... Yes, sir, well, I understand, I... Mr. Dillon. It, it, it kindly bothers a man. Yeah. Let's walk down the Texas Trail. <laughs> Good to see you, Matt. You've been avoiding us the last couple of days. <laughs> Busy, Kitty. Something bothering you, Matt? Bothering me? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever gave you an idea like that? Mr. Dillon? What is it, Chester? Lawson Hale just come in. He's down the bar there. Oh, yeah. Maybe you ought to have a talk with him. Well, that's one way. That's the one I haven't tried yet. Excuse us, will you please, Kitty? Well, sure, Matt. Well, whatever it is, be careful. Yeah. Aveline was wide open. Yeah. I had it right in the bottom of my hand. Is that so? The minute a trail driver hit town, the boys would grab their pay and they'd head yeah, straight. Yeah, well, well, well. Something I can do for you? Yeah, I want to talk to you, Mr. Hale. Well, I don't see anything stopping you. Well, we'll move down the bar a ways, if you don't mind. It's kind of private. Sorry, Marshal. I'm fine right here. I said we'll move down the bar. <laughs> if it's that important. Pardon me, boys. The Marshal's all head up about it. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, 
Far enough? Yeah, this is far enough. Lawson, I understand you've hired yourself a gunman. Sent him out to get me. Offered him $5,000 in gold. I don't know what you're talking about, Dylan. Wouldn't care to tell me his name. No, I don't think so. You see, I don't know anything about it. What's he waiting for? He's had two days now and he hasn't made a move. Like I said, Dylan... Why don't you I... do the job, Hale? You're wearing a gun. Maybe save yourself some money. I've got no quarrel with you. You mean you're yellow? Scared to call your own play? I said I've you're got You're a no... weaseling, no-good coward, Hale. I'll let it ride for the time being. Yeah, I thought you would. Come on, Chester. Yes, sir. Let's go get some fresh air. Well, I guess he's just not the kind to take chances, Mr. Dillon. And not when he's got a hired killer out prowling somewhere. Chester, I'm going to run him out of Dodge if it's the last thing I ever do. Dodge can stand it. If I only knew who he'd hired, then I could force the play myself. This blasted business of having to leave it up to the other man. Waiting, waiting. In the... Over there by the stable. Yeah, I saw the flash. Maybe you got it, Mr. Dillon. I don't know. Let's move in and find out. Yes, sir. Watch yourself, Chester. You may be playing possum. Yes, sir. The flash was right here by the corner. Yeah. Well, that's that. Looks like you got away, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's gone. Took one shot and then ran for cover. He'll be back. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, every Sunday afternoon, Robert Trout with the World News brings you up to the minute on CBS Radio. A special feature on this program every Sunday is a flying visit from one of our noted overseas news correspondents. Remember, tomorrow, for well-rounded views of the news at home and everywhere, don't miss Robert Trout with the news of the world on most of these same CBS radio stations. And now for the second act of Gunsmoke. My cold sure no better tonight, Mr. Dillon. My, that fire sure feels good. Yeah. Yes, sir, the old jail seems kind of cozy when a man's ailing like I am. Anyway, it's sure a lot better than prowling those streets waiting for somebody to put a bullet in the back of his neck. Just Will you stop squeaking the chair? Well, sorry, Mr. Dillon. Yell at me like that, puny as I'm feeling. Two more days gone by and he hasn't made another move. Yes, sir. That cottonwood sure burns up fast. I guess I better shake down the stove, throw another chunk of wood. Wait a minute. Huh? Wait a minute. There might be a way at that, Chester. Loss and hail. That's the only fact we're sure of. Loss and hail. It'd be kind of hard to... Prove anything, Mr. Dillon. Who said anything about proving it? I got an idea. Come on. Which 
one will we try first, Mr. Dillon? At the Texas Trail, I guess. He'll either be there or at the Longhorn. All right, Mr. Dillon. What you gonna do? I'm gonna arrest him, since he won't fight. We saw him back down the other night. Yes, but you got no evidence. M- Mr. Dillon, you can't make it stick. I don't intend to, Chester. Well, then I don't see what What I saying. can do is scare him. And if I figure him right, I think he's gonna scare easy. Mm. Maybe so, but all the ah, same... Ah, look. Look, there he is, Chester. Just came out of the Longhorn. A couple of fellas with him, Mr. Dillon. You, you don't suppose one of them could be... No, nah. no, they're hanging around for the free drinks. There's not an ounce of nerve in the three dozen of them. Come on, let's take him. Yes. Hale? Yeah? Hold it, just right where you are. <laughs> what seems to be the trouble now, Marshal? No trouble. Unless you want to make some. You're under arrest. What for? I'll think of something later. Stick out your hands. Whoa. You're taking me in without even making a charge? I'll remind you there's witnesses here. Yeah, so I notice. When they're not hanging around you, they're around somebody else. What have you done, Hale? Hired them, too? I asked you what the charge was, Marshal. Vagrancy. Vagrancy? As far as I know, you've never had any visible means of support as long as you've been in Dodge City. I'll match any dollar of yours with a hundred better ones. Well, that's fine. That'll help pass the time. Now, stick out your hands. Oh, look here, Marshal. Shut up. Think you... All right, Chester, put the cuffs on him. Yes, sir. All right, hold still, man. What? Dylan, up. I'll... I'll break you for this. It's been tried before. All right, boys, break it up. The party's over. You've had your last free drink out of this pump. All right, you, let's go to jail. Keep walking, Hale. It's the last cell on the left. I'll break you, Dylan. So help me. Well, you've been trying it for a year. I'm still around. But you won't be after this. I'll take this up. With Hold up. Wait till Chester gets the door unlocked. Haven't used this cell for so long. I've almost forgot which keys are. There we are. Vacancy. I'm living in the best room in the commercial house. Inside, Hale. Now go on, move. No. Now stick your hands up. You won't need those cuffs in here. All right. Make yourself at home. Shut the door, Chester. Yes, sir. Dylan, you've got nothing to hold me on. I'll be out of here by tomorrow noon. Oh, I doubt that. In fact, there's a pretty good chance you'll never get out of that cell. Not alive, at least. What are you talking about? According to the law, I've got a right. The law, huh? You've broken it every chance you've got. Tried to break the men who serve it, like you've tried to do with me, for instance. But when your own neck gets caught, you start hiding behind the law. Nevertheless, the law... All right, fine. Right now, the law out here is kind of sketchy. Some things it covers, some things it doesn't. Well, that's where I come in. Now, this little affair between you and me is one of the things the law doesn't quite cover. So I'm going to run it my way. That kind of talk won't help you any, Dylan. You hired a man to kill me, offered him $5,000 to get me out of the way. You can't prove that. He's made one try and he's missed. He's still around Dodge. Somewhere waiting and he's going to try again. But I don't know who he is. So all the odds are with him. That is your problem, Dylan, not mine. I don't know anything about that. You know what will happen, though, if he does get me. The first thing Chester's going to do is come straight back here to the jail and pump a couple of bullets through these bars here. Huh? Your boy may kill me, Hale, but you're not going to live to profit by it. Oh, he wouldn't do it. Shoot down a helpless... Oh, neither one of you would do it. Chester and I have been friends for a long time. Why don't you ask him whether he'd do it or not? No question about it, Mr. Dillon. Of course I'd do it. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Well, you hired somebody to shoot Mr. Dillon in the back. I don't see where you got any kick coming. Well, there's your answer, Mr. Hale. 
That's why I arrested you. Come on, Chester. Let's go look the town over. Well, no, no, it's, it's tonight that he's going... Who's going to do what? I don't know, Marshal. I don't know anything about it. Oh, that's too bad. If I knew his name, I'd have a lot better chance, you know. So would you. Well, we'll see you later, Hale. Or anyway, Chester will. No, Dylan, you can't do it. You, no, go, don't go out. He'll get you short. Dylan, no, wait. I, I'll tell you his name. All right. He's uh, a trail driver. He came up from the Pecos last week. I doubt if you know him. His name is Ed Granger. Ed Granger? Yeah, I've seen him around the bars. Dark-haired, surly-looking, scar across his cheek. That's him. Of course, I'll deny all of this in court, you understand? Yeah, sure, I understand. Come on, Chester, let's go get him. Look, he's here all right, Mr. Dillon. Over there by the pine. Yeah, looks like he's by himself. What you gonna do? Rest him? Well, there's no evidence, Chester. The only way I see is to make it personal. Let's go. Yes, sir. Now, I want you to stay out of it, Chester. Just cover me, that's all. Whatever you say, Mr. Dillon. Your name, Ed Granger? Might be. What about it? You know who I am, don't you? Judging by the star, I reckon you're a U.S. Marshal. You ought to do better than that. After all, I'm worth $5,000 to you. Yes, sir. Who says so? Lawson Hale. What? Your memory's getting better, huh? I don't know what you're talking about, Marshal. Sure you do. That deal you made with Hale. He told me all about it after I threw him in jail and persuaded him a little bit. I told you, I don't know anything... You're about... wearing a gun there, Granger. Why don't you draw it and go for $5,000? Take a chance. This fellow you're talking about's in jail. I reckon he wouldn't have anybody working for him now, would he? You tell me. I got no reason to draw on you, Marshal. Not unless my back's turned, huh? I think you're as yellow as Hale is. This won't do you any good. I ain't drawing. You tried to kill me night before last, Granger. Can you prove that? If I could, you'd either be in jail or you'd be dead. Well, since you can't prove it, what's the argument? Just that I don't like the idea of somebody trying to shoot me in the back. If you're any man at all, we'll settle this here and now. Now, leave me alone, Marshal. I haven't done anything... <laughs> Now, you still figure you got no reason to draw on me? No reason. I ain't drawing. You got ten minutes to get out of town. And when you're out, stay out. Don't come back now or ever, you understand? Yes, sir. You can start right now. Must be nearly midnight, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, about that, I guess, Chester. My, this is sure one day I'm glad is over. <laughs> yeah, so am I. At least I can breathe a little easier now. Mm -hmm. I think I'll get this fire built up a little bit, Mr. Dillon. No, leave, leave it, Chester. Let's go take care of our prisoner first. Huh? Hey, we still haven't got any evidence. What are we going to do about him? Same as with Granger. Turn him loose and run him out of town. We should have done it months ago. You got the keys? 
Yes, sir. Right here, Mom. Mr. Dillon? Huh? What are you looking at? Granger must have stopped by here on his way out of town. He he must have got Hale over to the window for a talk and then grabbed him and cut his throat right there. Yeah. Figured Hale had sold him out, I guess. Got a bulletin on the wire, Chester. Wanted for murder, Ed Granger. All right, sir, Mr. Dillon. I guess Hale got pretty much what he bargained for. He hired himself a killer... In order to kill him. He got it. much choice left, mister. You can throw your gun away and they'll hang you. Or you can keep it and try to use it on me. Either way, you're going to die. Have gun. Will travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel. Headquarters of a man called Paladin. Mr. Paladin? Mm. Uh, hey, boy, bring you brandy. Mm. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, set it down. Yes, sir. Well, do you want me to read it to you? Oh, I beg your pardon. I should think so. Reading over a guest's shoulder is hardly the proper behavior for an oriental gentleman. You go? Go where? Where uh, newspapers say. Uh, blood feud rages in New Mexico. 38 men already die. Job for you, Mr. Paladin? Maybe so, hey boy. Let's we'll see. Violence flared again in Ren Seabree feud when Juan Carlos Morita killed James Seabree in a gunfight. Morita, a notorious killer, had hired his gun to the Ren faction. Mr. Paladin make money. One side high Morita's gone, other side high Miss Paladin's gone. Uh, hey, boy, you've sold me. Guess you better send a wire. Yes, sir, Miss Paladin. Right now. If dandruff dulls your hair, leaves your scalp itchy, please listen. You can get rid of annoying dandruff so fast today, no one should suffer any longer. With Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo, unsightly dandruff's gone in three minutes. It's the quickest, easiest of all leading shampoos. Besides that, using Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep embarrassing dandruff away. Simply apply in the unique Fitch manner. Before you wet hair, rub in one minute. This way, Fitch Shampoo penetrates right down to the scalp. Next, add water. Lather one minute to wash every trace of dandruff out of your hair. Then rinse one minute. All that loosened dandruff goes down the drain. In three minutes with Fitch, one rubbing, one lathering, one rinsing, dandruff's gone. And while removing dandruff, Fitch can also brighten hair up to 35%. To get rid of dandruff problems forever, brighten hair too, use Fitch regularly. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today, only 59 cents. <laughs> It was late afternoon when I rode into the New Mexico town, but the summer sun was still merciless, reflecting off the adobe buildings. The dirt street seemed almost deserted. 
The town was motionless, except for something that swung slowly from a jerry-built scaffold in the middle of the street. It was a hangman's noose, and beneath it lay the body of a dead man. I said, get him up. I never argue with a shotgun. That's better. This him, Mr. Seabury? Where will I get a look at him? No, he's not Marita. Let him put his hands down. You, John Seabury? That's right. How long has that body been lying there? We hung him this morning. Who is it? Marita's brother. And one Marita is supposed to come for him. Is that it? That's it, mister. Now, who are you? Paladin. You're late. Let's go inside. I don't want the job. You heard of Marita's reputation, mister? It's scary. It doesn't scare me. I just don't want this job. I've paid you $500 in advance. You'll give the money back, mister. Gladly. Here. You're mighty squeamish for a man with a gun for hire. Marita has killed nine human beings. To hunt an animal or kill her, you do whatever you have to. So you leave the brother's body unburied until Marita comes. No thanks, Mr. Seabree. I understand that Marita is a cold-blooded killer. I know he killed your son in a gunfight that was no contest. I came here to take him for you. But I bury the dead, Mr. Seabree. Good day, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like a room. My horse is outside. All right, I'll take him to the livery. You uh, staying long, mister? Uh, just the night. Can I get a bath? Well, water's real scarce here, mister. You get a pitcher full and you can do anything you want with it. <laughs> it's real warm. I know. Uh, you the, uh, gunfighter? I'm the man Seabree brought in. Well, Marita killed nine men, some say more. He needs dying. Who are you? Well, my name's Haskell, John Haskell. You know Marita? He was born here. Beyond that, did you know him? Well, he, he was a friend of mine. Uh, used to be. Now you want him dead. I told you, mister. He needs dying. The town was still quiet the next morning as I walked across the street to get my horse. One of Seabree's hands was dozing in a chair near the stable door, a shotgun in his lap. As I came out of the sunlight and walked toward the stall, I had a feeling that someone was behind me in the shadows. And I was right. Mister, is this your fight? No, it isn't my fight. Are you Morita? I am Juan Morita, and I will advise you to stay inside. He moved out of the door like a panther. The man in the chair was dead before he could raise his shotgun. Morita caught Seabree's other man as he came lurching onto the street. And then came Mr. Seabree himself. Only this time it was different. Morita's shot only wounded them. I'll get you next time, Morita. I'll get you. There will be no next time for you, John Seabury. Morita. I thought you said this was not your fight. You don't kill a man that way. Stay out of this. You place. don't kill him when he's lying on the ground, when he can't reach his gun. <laughs> I tried to get to him, but I was too late and I was too slow. Before I could draw, Morita swung his gun butt down on my head. Say, right now, you may have something worth $1,000 to you under the hood of your car and may not even know it. Something worth a 1000 silver dollars. A regular filter check is important to today's cars. So important that Fram Corporation is offering $60,000 in cash to get you to check your filters now. Last year, in preparation for Fram's silver anniversary, 10,000 secretly numbered Fram filter cartridges 
were distributed all over the United States and installed during regular servicing. These filters are worth varying amounts from $1 to $1,000. You may have one in your own car and not even know it. A Fram filter worth $1,000 silver dollars. Check your oil filter and air filter now. If there's a specially numbered Fram filter in your car, you'll win up to $1,000 silver dollars and your dealer will win the same amount. Get in on Fram's big silver treasure hunt. Check your filters now. The trail I followed after Juan Morita was long, hot, and dry. The desert knows how to keep its secrets, and I had been riding for three weeks when I finally came to another small adobe town and went in to see the sheriff. Something I can do for you, mister? That depends. I'm looking for Juan Morita. Oh, that's so. You know him? Yes, I know him. I sight how long you been after him, mister? About three weeks. Do you know where he is? I know where he is. What did he do, mister? Pay you to protect him or are you just afraid? How long has it been since you read a paper, mister? Go on, pick it up. Might learn something. Amnesty. What amnesty? Read it for yourself. Three years of violence ended today when a general amnesty was declared in the bloody Wren Seabree feud in New Mexico. Is this true? Yeah, it's true. Go well, on, read the rest of it. The amnesty was called by Major General Thomas Hardy. The involved principals have laid down their arms and taken oaths to keep the peace. General Hardy said anyone breaking the amnesty would be summarily court-martialed and executed. Among those taking the oath was Juan Carlos... Morita. And you don't break the amnesty. It'd start the whole thing up again. Where is he? He's on his way home. To Seabreeze Town? That's right. Now, you better listen, mister. They mean it about this amnesty. You kill him, you hang. It had to stop somewhere. Let it lie. It's done. Not quite. Almost, but not quite. Mister, I know Morita. I respect him. He says he wants to hang up his gun. I believe him. Now, give him his chance. He'll have a chance. The small campfire was nearly out, but there were still embers. The long hunt was coming to an end. Juan Morita had been there. He couldn't be far away. In fact, at the moment, he was closer than I wanted him to be. Your gun belt. <laughs> Let it drop. Be quick. Now turn around so I can see your face. Ah, the man who was there with John Seabrook. I was there. That day when you shot a wounded man in cold blood. John Seabrook put a rope around my brother's neck. My brother was 18 years old. He did not even shave yet. And John Seabrook let him lie dead in the street. How many men did your brother kill? Your 18-year-old brother. What do you sell his life for, Marita? I do not want to kill you. How many men, Marita? I do not want to kill again. I do not even know you. I have no hate for you. How, how much are Sibri's people paying you? How much am I worth? No charge. I want you for myself. But why? I am nothing to you. You should have made the first shot count. If you'd killed Sibri with the first shot, I wouldn't have given you a second thought. You had better stop thinking about me, mister. I am going now. If you follow me, I will kill your horse. Do not make me do that. You'll have to kill me, too. I could do that, mister. Yes, I guess you could. His gun was pointed right at my belly. He could have killed me, but he didn't. He stood there, and he started to tremble. And then, very slowly, his gun hand dropped to his side. No. Oh. No, I will not kill you. I will not kill again. I put my life in your hands. Here, I give you my gun. Mister, I give you $200, all I got. You take me home alive. Don't let anyone lay a gun on me until I get there. A man should die among his people. I will not wear a gun again. Who's gonna win the thorough 
thoroughbred Kentucky Cubs thoroughbred Who's gonna win that horse and make it pay? Lots of money, well, Kentucky Club Pipe Tobacco has to find a winner So the horse is here, the time is near Get your entry blank today Yes, enter the annual Derby Day contest Sponsored by Kentucky Club's nine brands of pipe tobaccos First prize, a thoroughbred bay coat Son of famous oil capital Who won over $580,000 Jockey Ted Atkinson helps select this prize coat. You name him and he's yours. He could win a fortune for you. Get Kentucky Club Derby Day contest entry blanks free at tobacco counters now. Hey, who's going to win the thoroughbred Kentucky Club's thoroughbred? Who's going to win that horse and make it pay? Fun the money, well, Kentucky Club. Pipe tobacco has to find the winner. So the horse is here, the time is near. Get your entry blank today. <laughs> long ride home for Marita. We had time to get to know each other in the silences and in the times when we talked. Let's rest the horses a minute. All right. Oh, oh boy. Paladin? Yeah? You think it is possible they will let me come back? You think they can let themselves forget? I don't know, Marita. Some won't. Some may try, I don't know, but if it were me, I'd ride west. I wouldn't try to go back. No. No, my people say a man is like a tree. You tear out his roots, he dies. No man wants to die. I have killed 12 men, Paladin. I remember the faces of each of them. I do not forget. You think I have a right to live? You have a right to try a man speaks of death, but he is not sincere. I want to live. I want to get married. You think I'm crazy? No, Morita. A little optimistic, maybe, but not crazy. Marie, she's a woman with a tender spirit. I would give my eyes to know that I could grow old together with her. You will see her, Paladin. You will tell me if she's not a woman to behold. I'm sure she is. I will not live a week. I will not wear a gun and I will not live a week. I was an altar boy. And now I have killed 12 men. I cannot forget. And if I cannot, Paladin, can the others? Then why go back? To try? Let's go. Morita was making a good try, and it wasn't easy. There was sullenness and suspicion through the town the day we got back. The hangman's rig still stood in the middle of the street, and there was talk that it was waiting for Marita. But he kept his word. He didn't put on a gun. And on the night of the fiesta, it looked like he might make it. You see, Paladin? You see, my Maria? I told you she is a woman to behold. You were right, one. She's lovely. The senor is very kind. And we will marry, and we will have children, and we will live together until we are old. Is that not so, Maria? Oh, Juan. It is so. <laughs> I drink too much. I talk too much. This is for you, Paladin. You dance with my Maria. I will be back in a little bit. It will be my pleasure. Maria? Would you forgive me, Mr. Paladin, if I asked you to come aside with me for a moment? I would like a chance to talk with you. Always at the service of a pretty woman, Maria. Francis. That Juan, tonight he is drunk. Tonight he remembers how much we used to love each other. Do you think he will remember tomorrow when he's tired or angry or feels he must kill someone? I don't speak for him, Maria. Do you love him? A man like that, if you're a woman, he can stir you. I do not know if I love him anymore, Mr. Paladin. But I do not want to marry him. And tell him so. He has killed 12 men, senor. Do you know how simple it would be for him to kill another? Who? Another. No. No more, Maria. The killing is finished. I believe him. I'm going to marry someone else, Mr. Paladin. He is not a gunfighter. I'm afraid for him. Tell Juan. He won't strap on a gun. He won't kill this man. And if he tries? If he tries... I won't let him. What is this you will not let someone do, Paladin? I won't let you put on a gun, Morita. I get my word. Why should I break it? I don't think you will. But, Mari, she thinks I will. Is that it? Why, Mari? 
Why? One. It is said, Paladin, that only a fool stands between lovers. Why, Maria? I cannot marry you, Juan. But I love you. It is too late. Too much has changed. You have changed. Another. There is another. While I was away. Who is he, Maria? I love him, Juan. I believe you. Tell me his name. Do not kill his him. His name. You know my name, Juan. I know your name, John Haskell. I called you friend. Do you have a gun, friend? I own one. In the street. Tonight. Morita. Do not make me come after you, Haskell. Die big, friend. Maybe she will cry for you. Morita, you gave me your word. Maria, she gave me her word too, Mr. Paladin. And so it was not over after all. There was to be another shooting in another dusty street. And it could only come out one way. Man doesn't learn much about gunfighting working behind a hotel desk. But Haskell wouldn't hide. He came outside the hotel, wearing his gun belt awkwardly. Morita's shot caught him in the shoulder. Then it was up to me. After all, I had also given my word. Follow him. Do not stand in front of him. You're not going to shoot him again, Morita. Do not make me kill you. You're not good enough to fight me. We'll see. I said it. It seems a long time ago. I do not wish to kill you. You have a choice, Morita. You can throw away a gun, and they'll hang you for breaking the amnesty. Or you can fight me. I will not hang He lay there in the street, in the shadow of the hangman's rig. Juan Morita had tried, but he couldn't live without his gun. At least he didn't hang. Drink, Mr. Paladin. Mm. Hey, boy, bring a brandy. Mm. Oh. Oh, thanks, sir. You sit down. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Paladin. Mm. You want hey, boy, to read paper with you? Find job for you like the last time? No, hey, boy. Not like last time. Oh, by, uh, Mr. Paladin, big hero. Stop feud, kill big killer. No. You're not a hero if you kill a man who wanted you to do it. What Mr. Paladin mean? Never mind. Just get me another drink. Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed by Norman McDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Julian Fink and adapted for radio by Marion Clark. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Lillian Bayef, Clark Gordon, Lawrence Dobkin, and Barney Phillips. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel.
will be your new home. And now for the adventures of Lightning Jim. It was midwinter, and the icy winds from the north were sweeping across the plains as two riders pressed on through the drifting snow. Whoa. What are you stopping for, Ned? Listen, Scar. Are you sure this is you sure this is the right trail? Yeah. There's the trapper's trading post up ahead. We'll stop in there long enough to warm up a mic. Blast that wind. Say, do you, do you think them law badges is still following us? Don't reckon they is. Not with this storm blowing up. Hey, come on. we got to move before we freeze up. Get up there. Jiminy lightning, that wind is plenty cold. Yeah, buddy. Look, there's fresh tracks in the snow. Yo, yo, I see them. See, but if that starts to snow again, it'll cover up this tree. Huh? Yeah, I know. Say, buddy, the Indians told us there's a trading post up this way. Hey, you think uh, maybe we catch up with them at the trading post? Maybe. Come on. We failed them just was this far. Can't afford to lose them now. Yo, that's so. Well, I hope to get a nice warm stove at the post. Come on, Thunder, old boy. Yes, Lightning Jim and Whitey were on the trail of two outlaws on the frozen trails of the Western Plains. Fearlessly and relentlessly, the marshal and his deputy tracked down and brought to justice the desperados and criminals of the old frontier. The adventures of Lightning Jim bring back to us the courage and daring of the men who brought law and order to the West. On the sloping bank of Moccasin Creek stood an old trapper's cabin. Annie. What? I'm going in the trading post. Well, you better get some more tea. We're nearly plumb out. Yes, yeah. yeah. Hey, you got some nice pelts this time, Fanny. Ought to get a good price for them. Uh, you won't get good money for them as long as you have to do business with that old skin flint Pop Drew. Well, Pop runs the trading post, and I got to do business with him. Ain't nobody else buying pelts around here. Of course they ain't. Nobody else would live in this godforsaken country. All it's fit for is redskins and bandits and outlaws. Oh, now, hold on, Fanny. There ain't no use talking like that. We've been over this a hundred times or more. Well, I'll keep saying it a thousand times. Nobody to talk to. Nobody to see. All of being afraid the law might find us. It's a living death. I hate it. Oh, you got to take me Annie. out of here. I can't Annie, stand Annie, it. Annie, please, please, please don't take on so. I know how hard it's been for you. And I'm aiming to get you out of here. Oh, Steve, you don't mean that. You know we can't go nowhere. Yes, we can, Fanny. Where? Where can we go without running into the law? Penny, I've made up my mind that as soon as the snow clears, it's it's back to Fort Anderson. Fort Anderson? Yep. Steve, you gone crazy? No, Fanny, I've, I've just come to my senses. Fort Anderson is your home, and that's where you belong. But, Steve, if you go back to Fort Anderson, they'll hang you sure. No, no. No, they won't. Because I ain't going with you. You ain't? Steve Slocum, what are you talking Annie, about? You know I didn't kill Mort Maxson. Of course you didn't. But everybody knew you had it in for Mort. And when he was shot down, was you the blame? Sure, sure, I know. 
I had to clear out, but I had no right to bring you with me. You're zapped, so. You're my husband, ain't you? Yeah, sure, Well, sure, you don't thing. think I'd stand by and see him hang you for something you didn't do? Yes, but that ain't the point. Oh, yes, it is. We run away from Fort Anderson and come up here, and I ain't going back to Fort Anderson without you. Tranny, you just got through saying you hated it and couldn't stand it no more. Ah, never mind what I said. That infernal wind outside that got on my nerves, that's all. Ah, get along to the post with your pill. And you you better think it over, Fanny. I've done all the thinking right now. I'm sticking with you to the end. Fanny, you're all right. Oh, no, no, never mind. Maybe we can go someplace else. Out west, uh, to California. Hey, why didn't we think of that before? Yes, maybe we can do that. You know, Fanny, I got my trap set to catch animals. Somehow I got the feeling that someday I'll be trapping the skunk that killed Mort and got us into all this trouble. Well, I'll be getting on down to the trading post. Some pills for you. Got some pills for me? Oh, sure, sure. Well, come on, come on over here by the stoop and throw out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's blowing up hard, Pop, so I'll, I'll have to be getting back soon. Yes. Well, any strangers come through here lately, Pop? No, nope, ain't been nobody around. Oh, gosh, kind of lonesome, too. Ain't been nobody through here for a week. Yes, yes, it was, oh, last Monday when the troopers came by. Uh, troopers? Yes, they, uh, they was going up to Fort Edward. Oh, oh. And uh, nobody else, eh? No, nope, no, man. Uh, expecting somebody? No, no. Well, of course, it ain't none of my Say, business. Say, who but... up that reward sign? Well, well, one of the boys left it here about a month ago. Who's it for? Two bandits. Mm, and both of them killers. Oh. Uh, the, 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 the one on the right there. Take a look at them. Yeah. Boy, he is a tough-looking customer. Uh, the one named Scar. Yeah. This other one ain't got, ain't no angel for looks. <laughs> Here's the Oklahoma kid. Uh, he's the Oklahoma kid. I'm Buffalo Bill. You mean he ain't the Oklahoma kid? Yeah. Well, uh, leastwise, I, I don't think so, Pop. Steve, you know the Oklahoma kid? No. No. Say, uh, here's a list of grub I want popping. Yeah. And take a look at them pelts, will you? Oh, sure, sure. I'll... I'll... Well, looks like we got busy. Uh, yeah. uh, howdy, Speakers. Uh, howdy. You the boss of this outfit? Yes, yeah, sir, sure am. Uh, Pop Drew's my name. Uh, hey, you uh, mind if we use your stove to warm up a bit? Sure, sure. Make yourself at home, boys. Come on, Steve. Let's go outside. I'll, uh, I'll look at them skins you got. Come on. All right. All right. Come on, Matt. Get up close to the stove. Did you see that Jasper that just went out? Yeah, what about him? Well, that's Steve Slocum. He used to live down at Fort Anderson. Hey, 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 Nant. Look at this reward sign. Oh, what sign? Right here on the wall. Read it. $1,000 reward for information leading to the capture of the Oklahoma kid and Scar. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, who do you suppose that could be? <laughs> <laughs> so they got a reward sign for us even up here, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Looks like the law badges have been here. Yeah, well, here's one sign that ain't going to stay up. Yeah, floating the fire. Yeah. Ain't no use taking no chances. Well, even with them pictures, nobody'd know us with these beards we growed. Yeah. Come inside, Steve. Yeah, here they come back. Gosh, almighty, that wind's kind of chill out there. Yeah. You getting thawed out, boys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be with you as soon as take care of Steve. Uh, Steve, <clears throat> over here. Got my money over here in this little box now. I'll get right out for you now. Let's see here. <clears throat> 20, 30, uh, 40, and 2. 42, that right, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. It's all right. It's a good deal, I think. Well, <clears throat> give my best to your wife, Steve. Yeah, I... <clears throat> Funny fella, Steve. He never has much to say. Hey, where does he live? Down on Moxon Creek. He lives in a trapper's cabin with his wife. Uh-huh. Where'd he come from? Oh, I don't know. I. That's one thing you never ask a man in this country, partner. Yeah. 
How long's he been up here? Oh, about a year, I guess. Yes, here this month. He, uh, he's, uh, a little peculiar, but, well, he's gotten on his face. You can always tell a man by his face, I said. Yeah? Sure. Now, <clears throat> you take the pictures of them two bandits there on the wall, I... Say, what the... Hey, what's that, the trouble, mister? Huh? Well, uh, well, 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 there was a reward sign on the wall. Reward sign? Sure. sure. Who for? Well, well, two outlaws? The, the Oklahoma kid and, and, and a fella called... Well, it called a scar. What are you looking at? Uh, nothing, nothing. Right now, that's nothing yeah, at all. That's funny. I didn't see no sign. No, I didn't see any sign either. Yeah, maybe I put it here on the shelf. Hey, Stop that gun, mister. I got your cover. Now, don't shoot me. Uh, get his gun, uh, partner. Give it up. Uh, uh, now, look out. Now you turn around and get oh. your hands in the air, uh, mister. All right, but just Get the money in that cash box, partner. Uh, get away from that box there. No. Uh, now we'll take care of this hombre. Oh, Grab man. that rope over there by the window and we'll tie him up. Yeah, now, wait a minute. You don't need to tie me. I won't try to call you. Yeah, well, we're aiming to see that you don't. Oh, no Two riders coming down the mountain trail. Uh, what? Uh, to see them through the window. Hell, all right. Get moving. We're clearing out. <laughs> inside the trading post. Sure, that's a good idea, like. And I could stand some heat, I tell you that. Yeah, look, there's nobody here. Oh, you're right. Put up your hands. Hey, look out, Jim. Don't you move now, I'll drill you. All right, mister. Put him up, Whitey. Oh, sure. No. No, I thought you was the other two hombres. You mean the two riders we saw heading down the river trail? Yes, Durham. Who are you, Jasper? I'm Jim Whipple, United States Marshal. Lightning, Jim? That's right, mister. This is my deputy, Whitey Lawson. Oh, dear, but they can't shake your hands with my hands up in the air, you know. <laughs> yeah, take him down, boys. All right. You know, <clears throat> my name's Pop Drew, and I yeah, just had a run-in with two outlaws. They robbed me and tied me up. And I just got loose as you come up. Any idea who they are? I'm darn certain who they are. It's the Oklahoma kid and a fella called the Scar. I see it, MC. I guess we are looking for him. Yeah. How do you know there was the Oklahoma kid and the Scar? And I had a reward sign with the pictures. They got heavy beards now, but I'm sure it was them. One was tall, and he kind of walked with a limp. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And the other had a scar uh, on his right cheek, right near his eye, right about there. Yo, see, that's him, all Come right. Come on, buddy. We got no time to lose. Hey, Scar. What? My, my horse has gone lame. He can't make it in the snow. Holy smoke. You'll have to ride on my horse. Put up your hands, both of you. Huh? Who's that? He come out from back in the boulder. Get down off of them horses. I got you covered. Uh, sure, mister. Say that. It's that hombre we seen at the trading post. Yeah. If you get a chance, shoot. Yeah, what do you want, mister? Oh, you got him. Yeah, that flesh the wind blunted him. Get his gun. Yeah. And there's his two horses over yonder. Good. Good. We can use them. Come on. Let's get. Oh, oh, Thunder. Hey, Whitey. The wind's blowing drifts over the trail. Oh. See that thing? Look up there by those trees. Yeah. Looks like a man lying on the snow. Come on. Yep, we'll wait Yep, we'll take it easy now. Take it easy. Get it, boy. Get it now. Oh, thunder boo. Yo, yo, I can hardly stand up in this wind. Look here, buddy. You believe me? That is the man. See, I wonder if he's dead. No, but he will be. You don't get him out of this wind and cold. Oh, see, I wonder who he is. Oh, no. Wait. See, I can't believe it. What's the matter, Lightning? This, this Jasper's Steve Slocum. 
Slunken. Ja. Jumpen gimmen i resten i fjellet. De vant i Fort Anderson for det mørder av Mort Maxen. Ja. Will Lightning Jim and Whitey take Steve back to Fort Anderson? And what about the two outlaws Jim and Whitey were trailing? The surprising climax of this thrilling story will come in part two, which follows immediately. And now for part two of the thrilling story of Lightning Jim and the Trapper's Trap. Lightning Jim Whipple, United States Marshal, and his deputy Whitey Lawson were trailing two outlaws, the Oklahoma Kid and his partner known as the Scar. Their trail took them into the wild Indian country to the north. On the snow-covered trail, they find the body of Steve Slocum, a trapper who had lived in Fort Anderson. Steve had been accused of murdering a man and fled north to escape the law. After finding Steve's body... Lightning Jim and Whitey locate a cave and take shelter out of the cold and wind. Well, there you are, Whitey. I got his shoulder all bandaged up. You, Lightning, as a doctor, you make a swell more, sir. Never mind trying to be funny. Poke up that fire, will you? All right. See, that was lucky we found this cave and this dry wood, though. Yeah. Oh, good. He's coming, too. You look, he's opening up his eyes. Oh, hello, Steve. Who? Who are you? Look at me, Steve. Can you see me? Yes, I... I can... I can Jim. Yeah, that's right. I didn't kill Mort. You gotta believe me, Lightning. Take it easy, Steve. We got lots of time to talk. Yeah, but you... You can't take me back to Fort Anderson. They'll... They'll hang me. They think I done it. Never mind what they think. Please. Please, Lightning, I... I can't go back... Let me die. Tell, tell Fanny she can go home now. You ain't gonna die, Steve. That bullet went through your shoulder and it's all fixed up. Yo, and just as soon as you feel a little better, old man, eh, we can take you home. Who's, who's that? That's Whitey Larson, the deputy. You remember him? Yeah, sure. Tell me, who shot you, Steve? There, there was two of them. Yeah. I saw them come in the trading post. <laughs> Howdy, ma'am. Me and 
Me and my partner got lost in, in the storm. Well, come inside, quick. Here, bring him in here and put him on the bed. Yeah, yeah. I was expecting Steve. Steve? Yeah, he's my husband. Hey, put your friend down on the bed. Yeah. Uh, uh. Careful. There, there, that's fine. I'll heat up some water and fix some tea. Well, uh, he'll be all right as soon as he gets thawed out, ma'am. Steve ought to be here pretty soon. Steve, your story about more killing sounds reasonable. It's gospel truth, Lightning. I, I swear to it on a stack of Bibles. Steve, you know me well enough to know that I'll do everything I can to help you. Sure, I I know you will, Lightning. But if we can't find the evidence up here, well, I got to take you back to Fort Anderson to stand trial. And it'll be a fair trial, I guarantee you that. All right, Lightning. Good. Now, if you're strong enough, I reckon we better head for your cabin, Steve. Sure. It ain't far from here. Here, Lightning. Yeah, what is it? The storm is letting open the wind. It's dying down a little All bit. All right. Let's keep going. Well, how are you feeling now, Scar? Well, all right, I guess. Uh, this fire sure feels good. Yeah. Say, that. where's the old lady? She went out back. Hey, listen. Huh? She's been waiting for her old man to come home. Yeah? Where'd he go? To the trading post. But I got a hunch he ain't coming back. What do you mean? Uh, she said his name was Steve. Well? Now that was the name of the Jasper you drilled on the trail. Same fellow... We saw on the trading post. You sure? Yeah. Uh, here she comes now. Yeah, seems like the wind's dying down, ma'am. Yeah, it is. Would you like something uh, to eat now? Well, now we don't want to put you to no bother, ma'am. Well, I can eat. <laughs> I ain't bashful, ma'am. Put up your hands, huh? both of oh. you. I got a loaded gun and I know how to use well, it. Well, now hold on, ma'am. What's yeah. the idea? Yeah. Keep your hands in the air or I'll let you have it. Turn around and face the wall. Come on. You may not think much of women handling shooting irons, but I reckon I know a few of the tricks. I'll take your gun. Uh, listen. Keep your hands up and turn around. Well, now, be reasonable, ma'am. Reasonable? Maybe you can explain how you come to have Steve's horses. Steve's horses? You heard me. Them horses outside are Steve's. Where did you get them? Hey. Hey. Somebody's coming. Grab her, Scar. Let go, man. Oh, you're Stop. breaking this. Uh, don't move her. I'll kill you. I'll see who's coming. Well, who is it? Three riders. Well, get over by the wall so you'll be behind the door when it opens. And pick up the gun. Sure. I got him. All right. I'll let him come. Where are you? Well, put up your hands, all of you. And be quick about it. You'll be in He ain't dead, Ned. Shut up. Well, looks like we got our party all together. Yeah, Nat, you got the drop on us now. But the law will get you sooner or later. Uh, you're good at making speeches, Lightning Jim. But when I get through with you, well, you'll be wishing you was back in Fort Anderson. Get the gun, Scott. Sure. Give me that. All right. Come on. All right. right. And who'd have thought I'd have run into you, Steve Slocum? <laughs> and the marshal. You almost caught yourself a murder if you hadn't have got caught yourself. Marshal, the man killed a fellow named... Mort Max. That's a lie. You was the one that's killed Morton, you know it. Yeah, you'd have a hard time proving that, Steve. The law said you done it. That's why you come up here. You killed Mort Max. <laughs> the marshal says the law is going to catch up with me sooner or later. Well, maybe so. But I got a way of fixing law badgers. What are you aiming to do with them, Nat? Kill them all. The marshal and his deputy come up here to get Steve. They had a gunfight. Nobody lived to tell what really happened. <laughs> oh, how's that for a story, Lightning? <laughs> that won't help you none, Nat. You're wanted for robbery, rustling, horse thieving, and murder. Killing us won't stop the law from staying on your trail. Maybe not, but I'll have the satisfaction of drilling the famous Lightning Jim. And since I ain't got nothing to lose, I might just as well have some fun. 
Where's your cash, Steve? My cash? Yeah. I kind of figure you got some cash hidden around here. Now, where is it? Come on, speak up or I'll start building and I'll take your wife first. No, no, wait, wait. If, if I tell you where the cash is, will you promise not to kill her? I ain't promising nothing. I'll think it over. It's in a box under that trap door in the floor. All right. Keep him covered, Scar. I'll get it. Sure. Keep your hands up, Lightning Jim. I don't see no box, Steve. Reach down under the floor. Well, I don't feel nothing. Oh! Oh, my arm! What's the matter, Ned? What's the... Oh! Reach for the sky. Are you? Don't move, you. Scar. Good work, and uh, I think that was the quickest gun grabbing I ever seen. Oh, let me get out of here. Oh, my arm! You won't get out of there, Ned. Now I've got you right where I want you. Steve, what's holding him? Take a look. When that went after the cash box, he stuck his arm in a bear trap. A bear trap? You have been in me. Don't get me out of this trap. It's killing me. No, not until you confess that you was the one that killed Mort Maxon. No, no, blast you. Mort Maxon hired you to steal government horses. You had a fight with Mort and killed him. Then you told me Mort wanted to see me, and when I went over to his house, he was dead. Folks know that I didn't like Mort, and I was blamed for it. Yes, Nat, you killed him. Oh. Now, are you confessing that, oh. or do you want to die in that bear trap? Oh, yes, yes. I killed him. You see, Lightning, when that and the scar came in the trading post, I recognized them, even with their beards. And when they drilled me on the trail and took my horses, well, seems like they kind of got lost in the storm and the horses led them to my cabin. Yeah, the horses were going home. And thanks to you, Lightning and Whitey, me and Steve are going back home, too. Back to Fort Anderson again. <laughs> Funny how these things work out, Steve. Whitey and me was trailing Matt in the scar. Running into you was kind of accidental. Accidental? Yeah. I'd say it was providential. When I set that trap to guard my cash box, I didn't figure a bear trap would help me catch two bandits and set me straight with the law. You oh, and say that's the first time I ever heard of catching three poor cats in a bear trap. <laughs> <laughs>